Hello everyone, we're back for part two of Death and Honor. This time we'll be focusing on Xander's adventures and then bringing the story to a conclusion. Thanks so much for joining me once again. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And without further ado, let's get started. Part two. Chapter 19. Xander came screaming to consciousness. Flames seared the right side of his face. He jerked his head away and slammed into the opposite side of the crawl space. Xander groaned, breathed in a lungful of air, and hacked it back out. Through the smoke and flames, he saw the opening. He needed to get out before he baked like the tarts he so enjoyed stealing. Coughing, lungs burning, Xander crawled forward, his whole body shouting as the flames roasted him. With a final heave, Xander slid out of the crawl space into the open. He lay on his back, breathing relishing the fresh air. A crash brought him to his senses. The roof of the house had collapsed. Fresh pain hit him. The world spun and went dark. Then everything shook and rattled. Xander found hard wooden planks under his fingers. With every bounce, fresh pain flared. The right side of his face hurt the worst. Xander groaned and opened his eyes. A pair of liquid brown eyes looked back at him. In the dim light, a girl with dusky skin and long black hair bent over him. She smiled and her teeth sparkled in the meager light. Xander winced when they bounced again, his face protesting the rough treatment. When he reached up to touch his face, the girl held his wrist. She shook her head. Is it hurting again? Xander tried to speak but found he had no voice. A second attempt to gasp out something met with no better success. He pointed to his throat. Thirsty? Xander nodded. The girl helped him sit up, the process sending fresh spasms of pain through his aching body. She reached behind her, brought forward a wooden cup and held it to his lips. The lukewarm water tasted better than any juice he'd ever drank. Xander coughed and sputtered. She took the cup away. Thank you. He managed a hoarse rasp. Xander swallowed and tried again. My voice... It sounded no better this time. She brought out a cloth and pressed it to the right side of his face. The pain flared, then faded. I'm afraid your voice may never fully recover. Your throat was damaged by all the smoke you breathed in. Where are we? In a wagon headed south. Look around and you will see you're in a cage. You're a slave now, like me and the others. Slave? He didn't understand. How did this happen? My family, my brother and mother and father, are they slaves as well? We found you lying on the ground near a burned out building. There was no one else. Master Hess saw you still lived and thought you may be of value. He ordered me to take care of you. That was two days ago. No. Mother, father, Gabriel, they might all be dead. They couldn't be. Tears rolled down his cheeks. His family wouldn't have let him be taken if they'd survived whatever happened to their home. He was alone. Xander's body shook as he cried. The girl's hand stroked his back. Soon exhaustion overcame him and he slept. When he woke, it was dark. So dark his hand wasn't visible six inches in front of his face. Hello? His voice sounded better, though still just a scratchy whisper. You're awake, good. The girl pressed a bowl into his hands. I saved some food. Thank you. Now that she mentioned food, he found he was hungry. Ravenous, more like. Don't eat too fast or you'll get sick. Xander almost cried again. That's what his mother would have said. Xander scowled and forced the pain away. He wouldn't accomplish anything if he cried like a baby whenever anything reminded him of his family. And he would accomplish something. First he'd escape the slaver, then he'd find whoever killed his family and make them suffer before killing them. Xander didn't have a spoon, so he dipped two fingers into the bowl and found some sort of warm mush. He put a small dollop in his mouth. Unsweetened oatmeal. Not the tastiest meal, but hungry as he was, it tasted pretty good. When he'd eaten everything he could get, Xander licked his fingers clean. Thank you. You're welcome. You should sleep now. It will help you heal more than anything. 
Wait, please. What's your name? Sophia. Sophia. Xander tried the name out and found he liked it. That's pretty. I'm Xander. Why are you taking care of me? My mother was an herbalist before she died and my uncle sold me to Master Hess. I learned a lot about healing from her. Master Hess orders me to take care of his slaves, keep them healthy. There's no market for dead slaves after all. I suppose not. What was he thinking? Of course the only reason she was looking after him was because someone told her to. They were complete strangers. I would have looked after you anyway. I can't stand to see someone in pain. Sleep now. Other than your face, you seem in fair shape. Master Hess will probably put you in with the others tomorrow. You will need all your strength. Okay. Good night. Xander rolled over on his left side, but found sleep slow in coming. The clang of metal on metal jolted Xander awake. Up, damn you, roared a harsh, deep voice. Xander sat up and looked around in the bright morning light. Before he managed to do anything, a huge hand closed over his ankle and jerked him out of the cage. He landed on the ground with a dull thud. Clenching his teeth against the pain, Xander looked up at the mountain of flesh towering over him. The man had a thick beard and beady black eyes sunk so deep into his fat face, Xander could just make them out. On his head sat a round hat made of cloth wrapped around and around. On your feet. The fat man kicked Xander in the ribs when he didn't jump up at once. Xander grunted and clambered to his feet. Four other kids, three boys and a girl, stood beside the wagons in a clearing surrounded by trees. Sophia stood apart, perhaps five strides away. Xander started to go to her, but the little girl grabbed his pant leg and shook her head. He looked down at her and she shied away. Xander grazed his fingers across the scarred side of his face and hissed. He'd get that reaction a lot from now on, so he'd best get used to it. My name is Donovan Hess, the fat man said. You mongrels will call me master. You lot are slaves and I own you. Those that have been with me for a few weeks have heard this speech, but for the benefit of new arrivals, I will give it again. The rules are simple. What I say, you do. Any hesitation will be punished. Hess shot Xander a pointed glare. Anyone that tries to run away will be beaten along with another slave. Keep that in mind should you notice anyone trying to escape. Obedience will be rewarded with regular food and exercise. You have one hour before we move on. Hess turned his back and went to sit on the second wagon bench beside a pale man with heavy brows and a dull look in his eyes. On the ground near the wagon sat a pair of tan mastiffs wearing spiked leather collars. The other children started running around the clearing playing tag but Xander went over to talk to Sophia. Up close in the light, he saw her bronze skin was flawless and smooth as porcelain. They were the same height, but he figured she was a few years older. Sophia hugged herself and seemed to shrink down, like she wanted to hide. With her wide, bright eyes, the effect was one of absolute terror. Why do you stay apart from us? Sophia sighed, and his heart broke. Xander had never seen anyone so thoroughly miserable. Unlike the rest of you, I won't be sold at the southern slave market. I am Master Hess's personal slave. He has owned me for four years. Why don't you run away? You must have had chances. Sophia turned over her arms to show him scores of thin, white scars. I tried to run away several times, but he caught me with those awful dogs. As punishment, he cut me. Fury filled Xander. How could anyone treat such a sweet, beautiful girl so badly? You should go play. He doesn't like it if I spend too much time with the other slaves. I don't care if he likes it or not. Please. The plaintive note in her voice tore at Xander's heart. It won't be you he punishes, but me. We can talk more later. Please. Xander couldn't have said anything if he wanted. He was so angry. 
He walked away over to where the other kids were running around. The little girl had blonde pigtails and bright blue eyes. She ran up to him. Wanna play? What's the game? Tag. We don't have toys or balls, so this is all we can do. After being trapped in that cage, it's nice to run around. It does feel good to stretch my legs. Okay, who's it? The girl grinned. Me. Tag, you're it. She smacked him on the leg and took off. Sneaky little thing. Xander ran after her, and the other kids scattered around the clearing. He chased them for a few minutes before his legs went weak and he started coughing. He hadn't recovered as much as he thought. The kids kept a wary eye on him, suspecting a trick. Xander wished it was a trick. He dropped to one knee, gasping for air. His lungs hadn't healed yet. The little girl approached him. Are you okay? Still weak, I guess. I'll have to sit the rest of the game out. He touched her on the shoulder. Tack, you're it. Xander sat in the grass and tried with all his might to draw a full breath. Sophia ran over and pressed her ear to his chest. She listened for a few seconds, then sprinted to Hess. Xander didn't hear what she said, but he handed her a satchel and she ran back to him. She mixed a fine yellow powder with a little water in a wooden cup. Drink this. Xander took the cup and gulped the bitter slurry down. In moments, his lungs cleared and his breath came easier. Thanks, he got to his feet. What was that stuff? Powdered yellow root. It's a powerful healing agent, but it works better on internal injuries than external ones. I'm sorry I couldn't do more for your face. You saved my life. I've got no complaints. They stood together watching the other kids play. Only a few minutes had passed when Hess shouted, That's enough for today. Back in your cages. The kids stopped playing at once and trudged back to the wagons. Hess shoved Xander into the same cage as before, along with a stocky boy about his age and the little girl that tricked him at tag. He didn't like being separated from Sophia, but saw no way to avoid it. The door slammed shut, and the wagons rattled down the road. With nothing better to do, Xander turned to the little girl. So what's your name? The girl shied away. Xander didn't know if she feared him or the situation. It's okay. I won't hurt you. I'm Xander. She looked up at him and he smiled. The right side of his face didn't move. I'm Mary. Does that hurt? He nodded. How did you get caught? Mary relaxed and leaned against him. My mama sent me out to find a lamb that wandered into the woods near our farm. I got turned around and came out on the road a few miles from my house. I was walking back when that bad man's wagon showed up and he grabbed me and threw me in here. I'm sorry. How long ago was that? About two weeks. Xander turned to the boy. How about you? None of your business, Scarface. Don't mind him, Mary said. He's always in a bad mood. He's been here longer than any of us except Sophia. What about you? Xander told her about the bandits and the fire. When I woke up, I was in a cage, and Sophia was taking care of me. Since a slaver rescued me instead of my family, I must assume they didn't survive. When I discover who did it, I will find them and make them regret the day they were born. The boy snorted. Fat chance of that where we're going. With a face like yours, you'll end up as a gladiator and die in the arena. You seem to know a lot about what's to happen to us. Xander said. Sometimes at night I hear the fat sack of shit talking to the moron. I don't know why. All the moron ever says is yes, sir. What other fates might wait for us? Xander asked. Best not to think about it, Mary said. The boy rolled over on his back and threw his arm over his eyes. Girl's right. Some of the stuff I heard would make you sick. Xander sat up against the bars and tried to follow their advice. The wagon rattled along at the same slow, steady pace. When it stopped, Xander didn't know how much time had passed, but the sun hadn't set, so not more than a few hours. The tarp covering the cage flipped up and the dim-witted man stood beside the cage, bowls of greasy soup on a tray in front of him. He passed out a bowl to each of them along with blunt wooden spoons. 
He leered at Mary when he handed her a bowl, and she shied away. Xander accepted his bowl. Some pieces of gray meat floated on the surface. The boy slurped his down like a starving wolf. Xander took a spoonful and gagged. No wonder the boy was eating it so fast. There was no other way to get it down. He swallowed five quick spoonfuls, then paused to be sure they'd stay down. When he was confident he wouldn't throw up, he ate a few more bites. Xander had the bowl about half empty when the boy said, I'm still hungry. Give me what you have left. No. Nasty as it is, I think I'll finish it. Wrong, Scarface. You give it here or I'll pound you until you wished you had. Xander blinked, taken aback by the resemblance between this bully and Morgren. Both expected to be obeyed the instant they spoke, though for different reasons. Anger blossomed in Xander's chest. After everything he'd been through, now he had to put up with this idiot boy trying to take what passed for a meal from him. It was too much. He set his bowl down and slid it away. If you want it, come and get it. The boy lunged and tackled Xander, driving him against the bars. You're going to regret that. He punched Xander in the ribs. Xander grunted and drove his elbow into the bigger boy's back to little effect. He'd lost too much strength. The boy squeezed his stomach so he couldn't draw a breath. I'm so sorry, father. Xander groped around until he felt forehead. Then he jammed his thumb into his opponent's eye up to the first knuckle. The boy fell back, screaming, a hand over his ruined eye. Xander gathered himself, grabbed a hold of the bars, and kicked out with both feet, catching the bigger boy in the chest. He slammed back into the bars and slumped down to the floor, unmoving. Xander slid to the floor and gasped for breath, his ribs aching. The cage door screeched open and the ugly face of Hess appeared. What the hell's going on in here? Hess looked at the unconscious boy. Out, both of you. Xander and Mary crawled out double quick. Hess glared at them. Well, what happened? He tried to steal my food. Xander looked Hess square in the eye. I didn't care to give it to him. Hess laughed with what appeared to be a genuine mirth. So I see. Still, I can't have my slaves damaging each other. You'll have to be punished. The insanity of the situation struck Xander. Punish me? My home was burned by bandits and my family murdered. What do you think you can do to me worse than that? Xander slumped down by the wagon wheel. Why don't you kill me and put me out of my misery? Xander closed his eyes and waited for the fatal blow to fall. When nothing happened for half a minute, he opened his eyes in time to see Hess drag the semi-conscious boy out of the cage and put him in a cage with Sophia. He came back with a small, dark-skinned boy. Back in the cage. Hess grabbed Xander's arm when he passed. You won't get off so easy, boy. You're going to stay nice and healthy. I've got the perfect buyer in mind for you. When she finishes with you, you'll wish you died along with your family. He shoved Xander toward the cage and he clambered in beside Mary. The door slammed behind him. The new boy looked at him with wide, frightened eyes. So what's your name? Xander asked. Jackson, please don't hurt me. The boy trembled as he watched Xander. Xander smiled. I'm not going to hurt you. Jackson frowned and looked away. I saw the other boy when they loaded him in. You hurt him. He tried to take what was mine. You're not going to try to take what's mine, are you, Jackson? Jackson shook his head. Good, then we'll get along fine. Jackson relaxed, and for the next few days, they settled into a tedious routine, the monotony broken by meals and the once-a-day play break. During one break, four days after his fight with his former cellmate, Xander sat on the ground, catching his breath after a race with the other kids. He'd come in third, but the best part was he hadn't fallen to the ground gasping for air when he finished. Sophia came over, bearing the ubiquitous cup of bitter yellow medicine. I think I'm getting better. He took the cup from her and downed it in one go. Sophia sat beside him. 
Since the fight, she hadn't said ten words to him. She accepted the cup back. I thought Master Hess would kill you for what you said the other day. Xander lay down on the grass and looked up at the clouds drifting by. I was pretty sure he wouldn't. I've been watching, and what he wants more than our pain is our fear. I showed him I wasn't afraid of anything he could do. If he'd hurt me, he would have thought he was doing what I wanted, rather than me doing what he wanted. To him, it would have been like losing to a slave. I didn't think he'd accept that outcome. It was such a terrible risk. There was a note of genuine concern in her voice that made him smile. Some of what I said was the simple truth. The only thing that keeps me going is the hope that I can one day find whoever murdered my family and kill them in the most painful fashion I can think of. Such a dark thought, Sophia whispered. It's all I have. The next two weeks passed with little to distinguish them until the evening of his twentieth day as a prisoner, the day after his birthday. The wagon stopped before full dark, and after a minute an unfamiliar voice said, what do you give for her, Hess? A moment of silence passed, then Hess said, Thirty, take it or leave it. Deal, the new voice said without an instant's hesitation. Keep a close watch on this one, she's slippery. I haven't lost one yet. Come on and help me load her. A moment later, the tarp pulled back and Hess's ugly face appeared. Get back, you three. Xander and his cellmate slid back from the door, Hess opened it, and with the help of someone Xander couldn't see, threw a half-conscious girl into the cage with them. The door slammed shut, the lock snapped closed, and the tarp dragged back into place. Outside, coins clinked and laughter echoed through the dark. The girl groaned and Xander inched closer to see where she'd been hurt. She'd landed face down, so he nudged her over on her back. A huge bruise covered the right side of her face, the blow, no doubt, also knocked her cold. Besides that, she looked okay. She had medium-length, sand-colored hair, a short, upturned nose, and a small chin. Her thin build suggested no one had been overfeeding her. Her eyes fluttered open, revealing glassy, slate-gray eyes. Good evening, Xander said. She groaned and sat up. Where am I? In a cage that is now a bit more crowded than it was a minute ago. You have joined the ranks of the slave caste. Slave? Yeah, whoever brought you here got 30 gold coins for your life. I'm Xander. The boy behind me is Jackson, and the girl is Mary. Do you have a name? Of course I have a name. The girl shot him a scathing glare. I'm Kaylin. So this is what he meant when he said I'd wish I was dead before he finished with me. The man seemed eager to get rid of you. He didn't even negotiate. What did you do to make him so angry? I broke into his house and helped myself to a few choice items. How was I supposed to know he was one of the biggest black market smugglers in the city? I've been living in a cell for the past week eating nothing but bread and water. This morning, some goon comes in, bashes me on the head, and the next thing I know, I'm here. And I thought the slop we had to eat was bad. Jackson laughed, and Xander threw him a grin. It was good to hear the boy laugh. He'd been withdrawn more than usual the last few days. The wagons started down the road again. Some light remained, and Hess didn't seem inclined to waste it. When do we stop? When it's completely dark. They'll feed us, then it's back on the road at first light. Same routine every day? Xander nodded. Except for today, when we picked you up. Where are we headed? Some slave market in the south. Which city or how far south, I have no idea. Kaylin leaned back and put her arm over her eyes. My head's going to burst. If I fall asleep, save me some food. Sure. The cage was pitch black when Kaylin stirred. She shifted around in the dark. Sander reached out and found her arm. She flinched away. Relax. I just wanted to find your hand so I can give you your supper. It's gotten cold, though. I don't care. At this point, my stomach is so empty anything will be an improvement. Kaylin's hand touched his knee. He grasped her wrist and set the bowl in her hand. 
It's full, so be careful. She slurped at the soup and after a few seconds said, Why did you save this for me? You could have eaten it yourself and I'd have been out of luck. I said I would. In the time I've been a slave, I've learned the only ones we can count on are each other. Besides, two bowls of that garbage would probably kill me. She laughed and he smiled in the dark. Listen. She leaned over beside him and he felt her breath on his cheek. In a voice barely a whisper, she said, In about four hours, I'm going to break out of here. Why don't you come with me? You can't. Xander spoke just as quiet. Hassel expected. The man that sold you warned him you're slippery. I'm not waiting around to be sold. When the moon sets, I'm out of here. Come with me or stay, I don't care. But I'm going. Kaylin pulled away, but he reached out to stop her. Sander tried to put as much urgency as possible into his voice. It's not only you that will suffer when you fail. Hess will choose another child to be punished along with you. There are also dogs. Big ones. Do you want to remain a slave? Kaylin asked. You can't accomplish anything without taking a few risks. I know that, Xander said. I've thought of little besides escape since I woke up in this cage. But I'll only get one chance. When the time's right, I'll act, and not before. And I'm telling you, the time is not right. I appreciate your concern, but I'm going and that's it. Good luck, then. If you should manage to escape, I beg you to tell someone about Hess. I understand the penalty for slave trading is quite severe and he deserves whatever he gets. You have my word. Galen leaned back and resumed her meal. Xander lay awake long into the night, straining to hear any sign that Kaylin might be trying to make her escape. Part of him wanted to shout an alarm in the hope that the rest of the kids might be spared any punishment when she got caught. And unless she had a way of dealing with those mastiffs, he knew she would get caught. But he couldn't do it. Not if he wanted to look at himself in the mirror again without getting sick. Kalin deserved a chance, slim as it seemed. He had no idea what time it was when he felt the wagon shift a fraction. A moment later, the faint sound of metal on metal came, and he knew she'd started picking the lock. The lock clicked, and the door squeaked. Her feet hit the ground, and she ran into the night. Go, go, go. A few seconds later, the mastiffs barked and snarled. Kalin's luck had run out. Xander shook his head at the futility of her effort. Now Hess would be doubly on guard when his turn came to try. Loud clanging woke Xander from a fitful sleep. Everyone out! Xander's body obeyed Hess's command before his brain came fully awake. He slid out the still open cage door and lined up beside Jackson and Mary. The boy Xander, half-blinded, stood beside Jackson, and another boy from the second cage Xander didn't know stood beside him. Sophia remained a little ways apart. All their eyes focused on Kaylin, who lay on the ground, hands and feet bound with heavy cord. The dog's fangs had torn her clothes, and she had several bloody gashes on her arms. Hess stepped in front of the slaves, scowling, arms crossed. This slave he turned around and kicked Kalen in the ribs, tried to escape last night. As you can see, she failed. Now one of you will share her punishment. The slaver strutted up and down the line of kids, making a show of deciding who to punish. Enjoying the fear in his young prisoners, Hess stopped in front of the boy Xander didn't know. Last night, she left the cage door unlocked but none of you who shared her cell tried to escape. For that bit of wisdom, he grabbed the boy from the other cell and flung him down on the grass beside Kalen. You'll be spared. Hess rolled Kalen over on her stomach with his foot, then repeated the procedure with the boy. His helper brought a ten-foot bullwhip and handed it to him. He brought the whip up, then cracked it down on their backs. For the next five minutes, Xander watched with clenched teeth as Hess flayed first the cloth, and then the skin off their backs. When he finished, sweat was pouring off him, and both Kalin and the boy bore bloody lines from their shoulders to their waists. 
Sophia caught Hess's eye, and he nodded. She hurried over with her satchel. Xander hesitated, then went to help. When Hess said nothing, he knelt beside her. The boy whimpered, but his cuts looked shallow. Kaylin had fallen unconscious, and she was bleeding from the cuts on her back and from the gashes the dogs gave her. Sophia mixed a paste of herbs and water and spread it on the boy's back. His whimpering stopped at once. What was she thinking? Sophia whispered. I tried to warn her, Xander said just as quiet. She wouldn't listen. I'm tempted to let her suffer for what she did to John. Blame the slaver, not her. Those dog bites could get infected. I can't look after her and the two boys. I know basic first aid. Xander wanted to do something to ease her burden, since it was in part his fault all three got hurt. Tell me what to do and I'll look after her. Sophia mixed a cup of paste with different herbs and handed it to him. You need to apply this to the bites three times a day. I can fix you more during mealtime and exercise breaks. Load those two up, Hess said. It's time to move. Sophia helped John to his feet and led him back to the cage they shared. Xander handed the cup of paste to Mary, lifted Kaylin and carried her back to their cage. He was glad she didn't weigh much as the short walk to the wagon felt like a mile. He slid her in as gently as he could, then climbed in beside her. Xander took the cup from Mary, then offered her a hand up. Once Jackson had joined them, Hess slammed the door in his face and pulled the tarp back in place. Soon they started moving. Xander cleaned Kaylin's wounds the best he could, then smeared Sophia's paste over them. At once, the redness receded. He couldn't do anything else, so Xander held her head in his lap and leaned back to rest. The heat grew oppressive under the tarp, so Xander knew it had to be close to noon. Kaylin groaned and moved around. Her eyes opened and Xander smiled down at her. Hello. How bad does it hurt? Bad, she said between groans. I warned you he expected you to try something last night. You were right. Feel better now? No, I hoped you'd make it. You made no friends last night, I can tell you. Especially that boy you got whipped this morning. That might have been any of us. They won't try to get back at me, will they? She sounded nervous. No, if anyone tried anything, they'd get a beating for their trouble. The worst you have to worry about is no one talking to you. You don't seem to care. I reserve my hatred for our captor. Xander brushed a strand of hair out of her face. Besides, you're the first person I've seen show any spirit. When I make my break, it'd be nice to have one person with the nerve to help. Once I'm back on my feet, say the word. I'm with you all the way. Good. Xander spent the next month looking after Kaylin, who regained her strength in slow, steady increments. Early each morning, she gave him lessons on how to pick the lock on their cage. He found he had a knack for it, and after two weeks, could lock and unlock it at will. He also found he could breathe without trouble and no longer needed Sophia's nasty herbal drinks. His voice, however, still amounted to little more than a whisper. If he strained, he could make a little more noise, but nothing close to normal. One day during an exercise break, Xander spotted Sophia sitting by herself watching the other kids play. Xander finished helping Kaylin make a few rounds of the clearing where they'd stopped. She was getting stronger all the time and hardly needed his help anymore. When she'd had enough, he went to talk to Sophia. Want some company? She gestured to the grass beside her and he sat. How are your patients doing? Gregor will be permanently blind in one eye. John is fine, his wounds were shallow. How's yours? Xander grinned. Kaylin should be good as new in a couple weeks. Sophia bit her lip. What? How can you look after her like she did nothing wrong? It might have been you that got whipped because of her. As it was, an innocent boy suffered because of her actions. Aren't you angry at all? I'm angry, furious, but not with Kaylin. She didn't swing that whip or lock any of us in cages. 
I find fault with her timing, not her actions. If she'd waited a few weeks or a month, she'd have caught him off guard. One of the lessons my father used to teach is that it's hard for a guard to stay alert all the time when nothing ever happens. After a month of monotony, even the most alert guard gets bored. Once he gets bored, he'll be slow to react when something happens. That might have been all the edge she needed. Sophia looked at him, a little frown creasing her forehead. You have an odd way about you. You sit here and show me kindness and respect. You tend the girl's wounds and help her with whatever she needs. All that says one thing about you, and yet I saw what you did to Gregor. How can that be? Xander sighed and stretched out on the grass. How could it be? He wasn't sure he knew the answer. Maybe if I told you about my family. Father was a knight. For as long as I can remember, he taught my brother Gabriel and I about honor and what it meant to be a knight. Perhaps that explains the kindness and respect. As to the other... I've always been small for my age, and the only thing fighting fair does for people like me is get us beaten up. I have to rely on speed, which is useless in a cage, or fighting dirty. My style drove father crazy. I think he'd have rather seen me lose the right way than win my way. Is it so terrible to do things the right way? Not at all. I've thought a lot about what father taught us, I've had a lot of spare time. Look at it this way. Say there are two knights. One fights honorably and dies in battle rather than compromise his beliefs. The other fights to win and survives with his honor tarnished. Who's the hero? The dead man? Or the one that's still alive to protect his people when the next threat appears? You've given this a lot of thought, she said. Sander nodded. Perhaps too much. Honor will do me no good as a slave. I will do what it takes to survive. Whoever killed my family will wish I never crawled out of that fire. Sophia shrank back from him. He smiled to take the darkness from his words. I didn't mean to scare you. How long until we get where we're going? Three more weeks, she said. Maybe a little more depending on the roads. Three more weeks. Xander felt strong enough to make a run for it, but he had no idea where they were, and Kalen was still too weak. He'd have to wait a little longer. Chapter 20 I've got a plan, Xander whispered in Kalen's ear. It was late afternoon, and they were snuggled together in the back of the wagon. He'd gotten the idea for them to play at being a couple so they could whisper and no one would think twice about it. If Sophia was right, they had two weeks before they got to the slave market. When Hess brings dinner tonight, I'll have a coughing fit. When everyone's looking at me, I need you to steal a bottle from Sophia's satchel. It'll be marked with three Zs and contain a gray powder. No problem. What are we going to do with it? Nothing right now. When we get dinner, save the biggest piece of meat from your soup. A few minutes before sunset, the wagons rattled to a stop. A little while later, Hess threw the tarp back. Hess's helper got a fire started and put the soup pot on it. Half an hour later, he filled the bowls, and Sophia brought them to the back of the cage. Hess unlocked it. Xander moved toward the door to collect his bowl. When he reached the edge of the wagon, he started coughing and fell out onto the ground. He rolled around hacking like he couldn't breathe. Kaylin jumped out. You have to do something. She sounded every bit the worried girlfriend. Hess shoved her aside and Sophia ran for her satchel. She set it down, collected the yellow powder and started mixing. Out of the corner of his eye, Xander saw Kaylin ease over to the satchel. Xander took the cup and swallowed the contents, nodded and stopped coughing. When Sophia swung around, Kaylin was back on the ground where she'd started. They collected their food and got back in the cage. Later that night, when everyone was asleep, Sander whispered, You got it? Galen placed a small bottle in his hand. Easy. What now? Did you save your meat? She put something wet in his hand beside the pouch. 
Good. Now we start the dog's training. Hess kept the mastiffs tied to the rear axle of the first wagon. When Xander stuck his arm out of the cage, they growled. He tossed his piece of meat to the leftmost mastiff who snatched it out of the air. Galen's went to the one on the right. Neither growled anymore. One more day, you little bastards. They'd stopped for the night outside a small two-story traveler's inn. Tomorrow we reach Arbada, the glorious city of my birth, and I finally get rid of you. Hess laughed, dragged Sophia out of her cage and led her by the arm toward the inn. For the last two weeks, their pace had picked up and Hess hadn't bothered covering the cages. When Xander asked Sophia about it on one of their now rare rest stops, she said they'd entered a country that allowed slavery. Xander grimaced as he watched Hess lead Sophia away. Tonight, they would make their move, and he didn't want to leave her behind. Without Hess to oversee him, the dimwit handed out dried meat without cooking. Xander leaned against the back wall and motioned Kaylin to join him. She snuggled up under his arm. We're going tonight. You ready? I've been ready for the last ten days. When do we move? After midnight, that idiot won't wake up unless we yell in his ear. Once the dogs are out, we are home free. They lay together, the picture of a happy couple. Kalen dozed on his shoulder, but Xander's eyes stayed open, alert for anything that might change their plans. He hoped Sophia was okay. Xander couldn't stand the thought of leaving her with Hess. A few hours later, a lantern came bobbing through the dark toward the wagons. In the meager light, Hess's red, sweaty face gleamed. As the slaver got closer, he saw Sophia beside him. Hess had her by the hair. Hess hung his lantern on a nail at the rear of the wagon, unlocked the cage, and threw Sophia inside. Her face was a solid bruise, and blood leaked from the corner of her mouth and nose. Xander helped her away from the door before Hess slammed it shut and locked it. Hess stalked back to the inn without a word. Xander took a scrap of cloth and wiped the blood off Sophia's face. Are you okay? She whimpered. Xander brushed the hair out of her eyes. Come on, talk to me. What happened? Sophia started sobbing and between breaths said, Master Hess, he tried, but he couldn't, said it was my fault. He hit me, dragged me back. Xander got the gist and held her as she cried. It wasn't enough to just get away after this. When she fell silent, he said, you are okay now. Her whole body shook. He said he'd sell me to a whorehouse. She sniffled again. Don't worry. No, getting away wasn't enough at all. What room is he in? Seven. On the second floor. Why? No reason. You just rest. After her crying spell, Sophia fell into an exhausted sleep. A little past midnight, Hess's assistant was snoring in his seat on the second wagon. Xander took the dried meat and chewed it a little so the sleep powder would stick. When he'd dosed two pieces with a thick coating, he went to the back of the cage. The mastiffs perked up when he stuck his hand out of the cage, eager for their evening treat. He tossed each of them a piece, which they snapped out of the air. Kalen joined him and they watched as the dogs fell over on their sides, sound asleep. They shared a grin and eased over to the cage door. Sander gestured, be my guest. Kalen picked the lock in seconds and they climbed down. The dogs never flinched. He reached back and helped Mary down, then Jackson. Sophia came awake at all the movement and Xander motioned her to climb down. Let the others out, Sander said. If I'm not back in half an hour, start toward the city. I'll catch up. Wait. Kalen grabbed his arm. Where are you going? Sander pulled free. To say goodbye to our generous host. He ran toward the end, not giving her a chance to argue. He walked with slow, silent steps toward the door. Xander had spent a good deal of time hunting and sneaking around back home, so stealthy movement came natural to him. About three quarters of the way to the inn, he stopped and wondered what he'd do if someone locked the door. Kalen had the pick. Xander shook his head and kept going. He'd have to hope for the best. 
Xander ignored the front door and went around the back of the building. As he'd hoped, the inn had a back door, and when he tried the latch, it opened. A banked fire provided enough light that he could make out where the kitchen workstations rested. Xander stood in the doorway and held his breath. The inn was corpse quiet. No one had noticed his entrance. A quick, quiet search of the kitchen yielded a six-inch serrated knife and a thin-bladed paring knife. If Hess had locked his door, Xander hoped he could force it with the thin blade. Carrying a weapon in each hand, Xander eased the kitchen door open. The empty common room held nothing of interest save a set of stairs leading up to the second floor. Xander mounted the steps, keeping close to the edge to avoid squeaks. At the top, straight across from him, was a door with the number three glued to it. A hall branched ten feet to the right and forty feet to the left. A lantern at either end provided dim illumination. Sander turned left and eased his way down the hall until he stood before room seven. He tried the door, but as he feared, Hess had barred it. Sander slipped the thin blade of the paring knife between the casing and the door and worked it up until he hit the bar. He kept pushing until the resistance vanished and a dull thump sounded. He tensed, ready to run. A slow count to thirty later, Xander eased the door open. Hess's snores echoed through the room. In the dim light of the moon, the half-naked slaver sprawled on the bed like a mountain of flesh. Xander gagged at the stench of sweat and spilled ale. He snuck closer, one cautious foot at a time. The closer he got, the more Xander trembled. Here lay the man that made him a slave, that hurt innocent children for fun, that hurt Sophia. Standing over the quivering mound of flesh, Xander found stabbing him in his sleep insufficient. He wanted Hess to experience fear for a change. Xander raised the serrated blade in his right hand, then poked Hess in the shoulder with the paring knife deep enough to draw blood. Hess's eyes popped open. When he saw the knife in Xander's hand, his eyes widened. Xander smiled and slammed six inches of sharp steel into Hess's bulging right eye. The slaver convulsed twice, then went still. Knees weak, Xander made a quick search of the room. He found Hess's coin pouch, light but better than nothing. He peeked out into the hall. Someone staggered by half asleep and he shut the door. After a slow five count, he peeked out again in time to see whoever walked by open the door to room four and step inside. Xander left Hess's room, shut the door behind him, and retraced his steps back to the kitchen. He opened the kitchen door a crack, but everything looked the same as he left it. The cook wouldn't start the morning bread for another couple hours. Xander found an old grain sack and searched the kitchen for anything useful. He collected half a loaf of day-old bread, some dried sausages, and four apples. Not much, but it would have to do. Beside the sink pump, he found two skins and filled them with water. Last, he grabbed a heavy steel cleaver and a second serrated knife. With the grain sack over one shoulder and the skins over the other, he ducked outside and jogged back toward the wagons. In the dim moonlight, he spotted the other kids gathered a ways up the road, away from the still-sleeping guard. Where have you been? Kalen asked as soon as he joined them. I told you I had to say goodbye. I stole food from the kitchen in case it's further to the city than Hess made out. We should get back in the cages. The sight of Sophia's face had swollen while he was gone. She still clutched her satchel of healing supplies. Master Hess will be upset if he finds us out. Don't worry, Xander put a comforting hand on her shoulder. Hess won't be upset. Nothing will ever upset him again. We need to put some distance between us and the inn before morning. If we go with you, we'll get caught and be punished like when she escaped, John said. The rest of the kids seemed inclined to agree with him. Anyone that wants to come with us is welcome. If you prefer to stay here, suit yourselves. Xander took Sophia by the hand and started down the road, Kaelin beside him. He glanced back and saw the other kids standing around outside the inn. He shook his head. If they didn't move, they'd all get recaptured. He'd given them a chance at freedom. Now he needed to look after himself and his friends. They traveled at a steady walk until the sun colored the horizon. We should get off the road, Xander said. 
Kaylin nodded and they turned toward the scrub growing alongside the road. How far do you think we should go? Until we find a good place to hole up for the day, I'm beat. Ten minutes of walking and they found a thick stand of palm shrubs. Xander pushed his way through and found a clearing in the center. Tight, but he thought they'd all fit. They sat in a circle and Xander handed out food. The girls had an apple apiece and he ate some meat and bread. They ate in silence for a few minutes. Then Sophia said, Master Hess will be angry. Shouldn't we go back? If we say we're sorry, he might not be too mean. I told you Hess won't get mad. He's dead. I stabbed him in the eye and left him rotting back in his room. You are free. We are all free. You killed him? Sophia's eyes got wide. You killed the man that provided you with food and shelter for the last three months. If not for him, you'd have died. Better to die than live as that pig slave. After the way he treated you, I thought you'd be the first to dance on his grave. Oh, no. Master Hess only punishes me when I do something bad. He took care of me after I became a slave. Who will take care of me now? Don't you feel bad about killing him? God's above, was she serious? The only thing I regret was that I didn't have the time to give him the death he deserved. Sander shook his head. Why don't you get some sleep? We'll keep watch. Sophia finished her apple, tossed the core away and curled up on her side. When her breathing became deep and regular, Kaylin said, When you said you wished you'd given him the death he deserved, did you mean... She let the sentence trail off, but he knew what she was asking. Not in the mood to mince words, he said. I would have liked to roast him over hot coals for a few hours, then feed his still screaming body to a pack of starving dogs. Galen swallowed. Oh. Xander grinned. Is that what you were asking? Yeah, that's what I was asking. Damn, remind me never to become your enemy. He raised an eyebrow. Were you thinking of becoming my enemy? Of course not. You took care of me when I was hurt. None of the others gave a damn. No one ever did anything like that for me before. No one? What about your mother? Kaylin's laugh sounded more bitter than amused. My mother was a two-silver-a-night whore that worked the Kingsport docks. The only thing she ever did for me was allow me to be born. And the only reason she did that was she couldn't afford the potion that would have gotten rid of me. I'm sorry. Xander sighed, then smiled. Forget about it. My family's gone. Sophia's is gone. And you never had one. We'll take care of each other now. Be a new family. I always wanted an older sister. And now I have two. The look she gave was both curious and hopeful. You want a thief and the daughter of a whore for a sister? Sure. You can't control who your mother was. I've known noblemen whose children I couldn't stand despite their high birth. The truth is we're alone in a strange country. If we don't keep an eye out for each other, no one will. Besides, he offered a lopsided smile. I like you. Kaylin's lip trembled. She lunged forward and wrapped her arms around him. She cried against his chest and he hugged her. When the crying stopped, he asked, What was that about? I've been alone for so long. Xander gave her another squeeze. You're not alone anymore. You're with me. And if anyone doesn't like it, they answer to me. She laughed and wiped away her tears. Seeing she was better, Xander said, We should try to rest. Kaylin curled up on her side and Xander lay down beside her, his back to hers. He kept the cleaver out and ready. If anybody showed up, they wouldn't take them without a fight. Xander slept poorly, his eyes popping open at the slightest sound. At dusk, he gave up and pulled an apple out of the grain sack and set to eating. He'd finished half the apple when Sophia sat up and stretched. Morning, Xander said. Or should I say evening? Hungry? She accepted a slice of bread and a piece of meat without comment and ate. After the silence had reached an uncomfortable length, Xander asked, Are you all right? Sophia looked at him, and tears streaked her face. I'm all alone again. 
First mother died, then Master Hess died, and I'm alone again. You're not alone. I'm here. Kaylin's here. We'll protect each other. You'll see. Sophia stopped crying and Xander shook Kaylin awake. When they'd all eaten their fill and drank from the skins, they pushed through the shrubs and walked back to the road. We should stay on the edge so we can hide if anyone comes along, Xander said. They walked along parallel to the road for most of the night. They reached the edge of the scrub forest a little before moonset. The road continued down into a broad, flat plain, stretching as far as they could see in all directions. About a mile away, a multitude of lights glittered. The city of Arbata at last. I doubt they'll let us in before sunup, Galen said as if reading Xander's mind. We'd better go a ways back in the scrub and wait. Xander led the others a short distance from the forest edge, and in a small clearing, they sat and shared the last of the food and water. They got damn lucky they didn't have another day's travel. Without food or water, the three of them would have been in sad shape when they arrived. Why do you suppose they didn't come after us? Kaylin asked. Maybe they did, but missed us. Sophia sounded disappointed they hadn't gotten caught. We would have heard something if they'd come after us. Hunters beating the brush, the dogs, something. Xander shook his head. I bet they rounded up the others and decided three ragged slaves weren't worth the trouble, especially since one of us is willing to kill for our freedom. Would you have killed more people if they'd found us? Sophia trembled, this time with anger. How many people have to die so you can be free? Xander looked her in the eye. As many as it takes. Sophia didn't appear to like that answer and stalked off by herself. What's her problem? Galen asked. Xander shrugged. What are we going to do when we get to the city? I'm a decent fighter, but I doubt anyone will want to hire a teenager as a bodyguard. I'm a damn good thief. I expect I can make a living in this or any city. We should team up. If things go sideways on a job, it never hurts to have some muscle to back you up. Suits me. He'd already killed a man, so cracking a few heads didn't seem like a big deal. I need a proper sword. I can't scare anyone with a kitchen knife. A club might be better. I've noticed the guards look harder for a murderer than a thief. Sander nodded, willing to concede to her greater experience. The two of them settled under a pair of towering palm trees to wait for morning. The sun brightened the horizon after a couple hours. Sophia returned, looking calmer. Shall we head out? Xander asked. Kaylin gave them a critical look. We'd better wait for another group to come along and go in with them. Three kids coming to the gate alone, combined with your unique look, Xander, will draw way too much attention. Xander couldn't argue. Maybe he could find a leather worker to make him a half mask. That would draw attention, but nowhere near as much as his scars. They got lucky when, half an hour later, two carts loaded with fruits and vegetables, each pulled by a bay draft horse, trundled down the road past them. On the bench of each cart sat a filthy farmer in a worn tunic. Once they creaked past, Xander and the girls followed along behind. If the farmers noticed or cared, they gave no sign. When they reached the city gates, a pair of massive double doors that loomed twenty feet above their heads and looked about two feet thick, a quartet of bored guards dressed in baggy pants and open vests stopped them. One came toward the farmers while the rest leaned on their spears and yawned. Sanders suspected the last attack on the city happened a while ago. The guard held out his hand and the first farmer dropped a silver coin into it. The other guards moved aside and the cart proceeded through the gates. While the second farmer paid his toll, Xander dug a silver coin out of Hess's pouch. When they took their place before the guard, he babbled something in a language Xander didn't recognize. He looked at the girls, and they shook their heads. Taking pity on them, the guard switched to the trade tongue and said, A silver coin each, outlanders. What? Xander knew a ripoff when he heard it. You charged the farmers one coin, and they had a cart and horse. Surely a single coin is enough for the three of us on foot? The guards chuckled. The farmers came here to trade. We did them no favors. They will also be taxed on every sale they make. This visit will cost them far more than the silver coin we collected. 
Xander dug two more coins out of the almost empty pouch and handed them over. Thank you kindly, sir. The guards parted and the three companions entered the city. When they moved out of earshot, Xander said, Thieves, three silver coins to enter their stupid city. They should all be flogged. Kalen laughed. Remember, we're thieves too. At least we're not government-sponsored thieves. Let's find an inn. I need a bath in the worst way. A bath sounds fantastic. It was the first thing Sophia had said since she returned from her walk. Which one should we choose? Xander asked. There must be dozens in a city this size. Let's find a shabby-looking one, Galen said. Not only will it be one we can afford, but they won't ask questions. Lead on. Xander and Sophia followed Kaylin through the city in search of a promising place to settle. Xander was no expert on architecture, but walking around the strange city, it became clear the people in this part of the world had a different idea about how to build a city than the people back home. The first and most obvious difference being height. Xander had yet to see a building less than three stories tall. It made a certain sense. With a walled city, eventually the only direction to expand was up. The other odd thing was the occasional onion-domed tower jutting up above all the other buildings. Given their height, they had to be lookout towers. This looks promising. Galen stopped in front of a dirty, slightly leaning four-story building with a sign sporting a beer stein. As long as it doesn't collapse while we're inside, it should be fine, Xander said. When Master Hess brought me to the city, we stayed at his home, Sophia said. It was a nice three-story building, and I had my own room. If it's any consolation, no one here will rape you or whip you if you misbehave, Xander said. Sophia flinched, and Xander put his arm around her shoulders. It'll be okay. They went in and found the common room empty, save for a snoring old man seated behind a desk a staircase leading to the second floor behind him. As they approached, the old man roused himself from his stupor. Can I help you? We need a room and a bath. Galen took the lead and Xander was happy to let her. We've got four singles on the third floor and one suite on the fourth. A single is three coppers a night and the suite is a silver per night and includes a tub and small kitchen. If you want it long term, it's two golds per month. We'll take the suite. Sander plunked down four silver coins. The innkeeper swept them up and fished out a key from the desk drawer. Number three on the fourth floor. Second floor is the dining room if you get hungry. Xander accepted the key and they went upstairs. The dining room held three parties and two score tables. The third floor was nothing more than a hall with a dozen doors lining it. And the fourth floor was the same idea, but there were only three doors, each with a large number painted on it. Xander went straight to number three and unlocked it. Inside, the suite was unremarkable. It had a small common room with a bed, couch, two wooden chairs that looked horribly uncomfortable, and a cracked table. The kitchen had a small stove beside, which sat a half-full coal hod and a sink with a water pump. Xander hated to think how much effort it would take to pump water up four stories. The final room held a small tub and a bucket. The lack of a water pump implied you had to lug the water from the kitchen sink. On the plus side, the drain plug would make emptying it a cinch. I want to go first. Without waiting for an answer, Sophia grabbed the bucket and headed for the kitchen. Xander nodded. Let me give you a hand. Galen followed them to the kitchen and muttered, How come she gets to go first? Because we need to make plans. We've got enough coin to buy some food and little else. We've got four days to find a way to make some money or we'll be living on the streets. Xander pumped and in short order, clear water poured out the spigot. The bucket filled in a hurry, and after three trips, Sophia closed the door to the washroom and commenced splashing. How bad a shape are we in? Galen asked. Xander poured the remaining coins on the table. They made a not-so-grand total of three silver and seven copper coins. He slid two silvers to the side. That, along with the kitchen knives, should buy a poor blunt sword which should serve as well as a club. The rest might feed us for a couple days if we're not too hungry. I see why you didn't want to pay the guards. Guess we can't be too fussy about our first job. I'll walk through the market tomorrow and get a sense of it. 
I'll get some groceries as well. You see about getting that sword. When will we make our move? Though he hated to admit it, the idea of being a thief excited him. Usually, I'd want to spend a week getting to know the market, but given our money situation, we'll have to move things forward. We'll go day after tomorrow at the busiest time in the market. When is that? Xander asked. Galen scowled. I don't know. That's one of the things I need to figure out. Chapter 21 The Exciting Life of a Thief Ha! Huh. Xander snorted from behind the stinking pile of garbage heaped in the alley Kalen stuck him in. It was crouched about a hundred yards from the market, far enough to be inconspicuous, but near enough to help if she ran into trouble. On the ground beside him rested a crude sword with an edge so dull it barely cut the air. Yesterday, while Kalen scouted the market, Xander had gone to find a swordsmith with merchandise of such poor quality he could afford it. It took five stops, but he found one. After half an hour of arguing, the merchant referred to it as haggling. He traded the cleaver and knife along with the two silver coins for the poor excuse for a sword sitting beside him. Forged of iron rather than steel, it had several spots of rust already. The hilt had worn so much he'd had to tear strips off his pant legs to fix it. The only thing it had going for it was near flawless balance, and that made up for its multitude of problems. Two hours of cooling his heels in the alley had Xander so bored he almost hoped Kalen ran into trouble so he could take out his frustration on someone's head. He leaned back against the wall and sighed. No sense worrying about it. If everything went smooth, they'd have money to last a while, and if not, he'd get some exercise. Xander patted his sword. Xander? Sounded like she was in trouble. He grabbed his sword and hopped to his feet. Kaylin raced around the corner, two men close behind. She smiled when she spotted him. Xander stepped in front of her, sword raised. I guess it didn't go smoothly. Less smooth than I'd hoped, Kaylin gasped for breath. Xander nodded but didn't comment. He faced her pursuers. One was skinny and a little taller than Xander, and the other must have weighed 250. The fact that he kept up with Kaylin impressed Xander. Stand aside the fat one said. We got business with the girl. The girl is my friend, and if you have business with her, then you have business with me. Get lost, kid, or you'll end up a lot uglier than you are now. That's just rude. Xander planted his feet and leveled his sword at them. They laughed when they saw his rusty sword. You think you can scare us with that rusty hunk of iron? The fat man laughed louder. Kill these two, Squeak, so we can go. The skinny man drew a foot-long curved knife and started toward them. Xander stepped forward to meet him so Kalen wouldn't get in his way. Xander drew a breath and let it out. Are you sure you want to do this? Squeak laughed, a high, shrill giggle, and Xander shook his head. He held his sword at middle guard and waited for his opponent to make the first move. The skinny man fainted, then pulled back. Xander didn't react. The man's weight hadn't shifted forward, so he knew there was no danger. See that squeak, the fat man shouted. Boy scared stiff, now get on with it. Squeak lunged for real this time. Xander dodged left and the skinny tough stumbled past. His sword crashed down on Squeak's shoulder, snapping his collarbone and sending his knife clattering to the alley. Xander kicked the dagger to Kalen, who scooped it up. Turning to the fat man, Xander said, Your turn. Despite his dark complexion, the fat man paled. You're lucky you're not in the mood to fight today, Scarhead. But you should know you've made a powerful enemy today. The Thieves' Guild doesn't take kindly to strangers working our city. Squeak staggered past Xander to join his friend. We'll be seeing you again soon, the fat man said as he and his friend retreated up the alley. Kaylin hugged him from behind, wrapping her arms around his neck. You were wonderful. Thanks. Xander disengaged himself from her. Did you get something worth all this trouble? She held up two fat purses and shook them. The jingle of coins brought a smile to his face. Let's get back to the inn and see. When they arrived, the scent of sizzling meat greeted them. Sophia stood at the sink and smiled when they entered. How'd it go? Not sure yet, Xander said. What's cooking? The last of the ham. I'll toast some bread and we can have lunch. Sophia took out a half loaf of bread and the bent knife they'd found in one of the kitchen drawers and sliced. Xander and Kaylin sat at the kitchen table. 
She set the two pouches on the table along with the knife they'd taken off the skinny thug. Kaylin opened the pouches while Xander examined the knife. It had a fine edge and was forged of excellent steel. Either the thief had plenty of money or he stole it from someone that did. The clink of coins drew his attention back to the table. Kaylin dumped the contents of the pouches and a quick count revealed two gold coins, a dozen silver, and twenty copper. Not a king's ransom, but enough to tide them over for a few weeks. The gold would pay for their room for a month. How do you think we did? Xander asked. I'd say pretty well. The gold is an excellent surprise. Most people don't carry coins that valuable in a belt pouch. Now we can get you your mask. Kaylin held up her hand when he objected. No excuses. You earned it today. We'll get something in black leather, something that will intimidate people. If you want to intimidate people, my face will do that without a mask. She smiled and patted his scarred cheek. Sophia brought three plates of food and Xander fell to eating with a vengeance. About halfway through the meal, he looked up and noticed Sophia watching him as he ate, ignoring her own food. Is it good? She asked when she noticed him looking at her. Very good, thank you. Aren't you going to have some? Sophia beamed and picked at her own meal. Out of the corner of his eye, he noticed she continued to watch him as he ate. She constantly looked to him for approval. Perhaps now that Hess was dead, she needed someone else's approval. Xander hoped she'd get over it. He had trouble watching everything he said for fear of damaging her fragile ego. If we want supper, we need to go out for supplies, Galen said. I'll go, Sophia said. Good. Xander, you go with her. She can help you pick out a mask. Xander started to sigh, but caught himself. The last thing he wanted was to go out again after the fight this afternoon. Still, he couldn't let Sophia go out alone. Someone might grab her. If any of Hess's associates recognized her, they might claim her as a runaway slave. If he went, the only way someone would take her was over his dead body. Xander finished his meal, then stretched out on the bed to rest. He held the thief's dagger and grazed his finger along the edge, keen as he thought. It had good heft, but the balance was all wrong for throwing. It would make a fine backup weapon, and as long as he had to see a leather worker about a mask, he'd ask about a sheath for the knife. Ready? Sophia had finished washing the dishes and cleaning up. Sander hauled himself to his feet and found a scrap of cloth to wrap the knife in. He collected the money. Let's go. They went downstairs and Xander slapped two gold coins down on the innkeeper's desk. He scraped them into a desk drawer. Don't forget, you've got to be out in 30 days unless you have more coin. 32 days. I've still got two left on the silver I paid you. 30. Xander unwrapped his dagger and cleaned a fingernail. He glared at the innkeeper. 32. 32 sounds right, the innkeeper whispered. Sander smiled and rewrapped the dagger. I thought it might. Good afternoon. They left the inn but hadn't gone more than a few steps when Sophia said, You threatened that man. Sander glanced at her, surprised at the note of disapproval in her voice. Yeah, so? So you can't go around threatening people. He was trying to cheat us. If I let him get away with it, he'd keep trying every time we paid the rent or bought a meal. We're not rolling in wealth here. We can't let people get away with trying to rob us. After today, I guarantee at least one merchant won't try it again. It doesn't seem right, Sophia said. It isn't. Corruption and greed are everywhere. My father fought it all his life. Since I grew up around the fight, I find I have little patience when I come across it. They wove their way through the city to a smaller market favored by local merchants rather than the primary market he and Kalen worked earlier. It didn't take long to find a leather worker's stall. Three sides of the stall held boots, belts, and other odds and ends. The merchant noticed Xander looking over his wares. Well, I bet you're looking for a half mask. That's right, Xander swallowed his annoyance. He set the knife on the counter and unwrapped it. I also need a sheath for this. The merchant hefted the knife and looked it over with a practiced eye. I might have something that'll fit unless you're looking for something custom. Close is good enough. The merchant rummaged through his stock, trying several sheaths until he found one in black leather that fit the knife like it had been made for it. 
He handed the sheathed knife back to Xander, who drew the blade and sheathed it several times. It fit perfect. How much? If you buy it with the mask, I'll let you have both for four silver. Deal. The merchant took out a string with a bunch of knots tied in it and came around to the front of the booth. Hold still while I get some measurements. Xander stood still while the merchant measured around his head and along the length of his jaw. When he finished, he asked, How do you want this done? Plain black leather, same as the sheath. With a phoenix centered over the scar, Sophia said. Xander looked at her and raised an eyebrow. Remember how we found you? Xander remembered crawling out of that burning house and smoke and fire and pain. Now here he stood, raised from the ashes. I remember, he looked to the merchant. Add the phoenix. He put three silver coins on the counter. You'll get the rest when it's ready. Bad enough, sir. Xander took his knife in its new sheath, and they went to get the food. Again, Xander hid in a stinking alley close to the marketplace. After last time, he hated to go out again. But they didn't have a coin to their name, so if they wanted to eat, they had no choice. At least Xander had gotten used to his new mask. For the first few days, it felt wrong and itched to high heaven. But now he hardly noticed. As an added bonus, fewer people stared at him when he walked past. Xander smiled. He had to admit he liked the looks he got now. Fear and respect rather than disgust. He also quite liked how the phoenix emblem on the side turned out. Sophia had been delighted when she saw it. He shook his head. What was he doing here? Whoever had killed his family was walking around somewhere hundreds of miles away, and he was crouched in a stinking alley waiting for a thief. Traveling took money, and they were just managing to survive. He'd have to be patient. His situation couldn't get any worse. Xander! He jumped to his feet as Kalen rounded the corner. Two men with curved swords sheathed at their sides followed a moment behind. Xander got between them, sword ready. The sight of an armed opponent brought them up short. Kalen ducked behind him, huffing and puffing. A second later, the fat man from before joined the first two at the end of the alley. Sander looked back at Kalen. How come you never come back with dancing girls chasing you? Tell you what, we get out of this alive, and next time I'll run through a brothel on my way back. Think you could get me a couple girls to go? I hate to interrupt this witty banter, the fat man said but there isn't going to be a next time. These two are our best enforcers. You're not getting out of this alley alive. Do we have to do this? Sander drew his knife and held it in his off hand. Can't we join the guild? You two? Don't make me laugh. Neither of you is fit to join the guild. Yeah, but I beat that other guy and he's a member. Doesn't that count for anything? No, the fat man gestured toward them. Kill them and let's go. Xander grimaced as the enforcers advanced down the alley. His gaze darted around, looking for anything that might give him an edge. He found nothing but two piles of garbage and a lot of stink. The enforcers separated so he couldn't face them at the same time. If he let one get behind him, he was in big trouble. Xander racked his brain trying to remember what his father said about fighting two men at once. Avoid it if at all possible. That was out. If you couldn't avoid it, attack. He'd have to get lucky and take one out fast. He saw no way around it. He'd have to kill at least one of them. Stealing himself, Xander charged the man on his left. The attack caught the enforcer off guard, but he got his sword up in time to block Xander's attack. Kalin screamed, and he dropped flat on his back, the second enforcer's sword whistling over his head. Xander stabbed up with his knife, driving several inches into the second man's inner thigh. He twisted the blade and ripped it free. Arterial spray jetted out. Good, he'd hit the target. Xander scrambled to his feet, ready to face the other man. Rather than attack, the enforcer knelt beside his injured comrade. He looked up at Xander. You killed my partner. Xander tightened his grip on his rusty sword. Better him than me. Why don't you two take a walk? No one else has to get hurt today. Wrong. The enforcer got up from beside his dead partner and advanced toward Xander. You need to get hurt. 
Are you that much better than him? The two of you couldn't take me together. Do you think you can do it alone? He was lucky, the fat man shouted. You can take him. He might be right, Xander said. But you notice he's not running up here to take me on. Why do you suppose that is? The enforcer looked back at the fat man and Xander didn't hesitate. He took two long strides and swung. His blunt sword cracked into the enforcer's head and he fell to the ground. Unconscious or dead, Xander didn't care. He turned to the fat man at the end of the alley. Ready to go? Yes, the fat man spun on his heel and fled. Xander sighed. This is getting tiresome. He retrieved his dagger where he'd dropped it beside the dead man. Are you okay? Kalen asked. Xander's back ached from landing hard on the ground and he rubbed it. I'll live. Let's go before he returns with more friends. Kaylin rifled through the enforcer's pockets and helped herself to the contents. They left the alley and headed back toward home. I can't believe how you handled those two. You said you'd learned how to fight, but that was amazing. I didn't exactly play fair. I stabbed the first one low and hit the other from behind. Not the noblest victory. You did what you had to. I bet your father would be proud. Xander snorted a laugh. She had no idea what father had been like. At times like this, I'm glad he burned up in the fire. If he knew what I've done to survive, he'd have dug himself out of his grave and come after me himself. She laughed and Xander looked over at her. She saw the look on his face and fell silent. You're serious? Xander nodded. He would have rather starved than steal. He smiled. I've always taken a more practical view. That view often got me in trouble as a kid. Now it's going to save my life. Kalen grinned and they picked up their pace. When they entered the inn, the keeper didn't even look up. At the top of the first flight of steps, Xander glanced in the dining room and stopped. He grabbed Kalen's arm. Look. In the middle of the dining room, Sophia was serving drinks and chatting with customers. She spotted them and waved, a bright smile on her face. Xander smiled and waved back. He hadn't seen her this happy since... He had never seen her this happy, come to think of it. They waited in the doorway until she got free. Sophia came over to join them. How'd you do? All right, Xander said. How long have you been helping here? This is my first day. She chewed her lip. You don't mind, do you? Not at all. I'm curious how it happened. After you left this morning, I felt lonely. So I came down to the dining room and overheard Mr. Al Kalim, he's the owner, telling the head waiter one of the serving girls didn't show up today. I offered to help. I don't know what came over me. Was I wrong? No, no, it's fine. Xander patted her shoulder. How much is he paying you? Kalen asked. We didn't talk about a certain amount. He said he'd give me a fair wage. Xander remembered the innkeeper's effort to cheat them earlier and made a note to have another chat with Mr. El Kalim if the wage wasn't fair enough. I need to get off my feet. See you when you get done. They left Sophia to her work and climbed the final two flights of stairs. When they had the door closed and locked behind them, Kaylin dumped the contents of the three pouches she'd grabbed on the table along with a few coins and a ring taken off the enforcers. They had done better but not good enough in Xander's mind to justify the risk. He said as much to Kalen. If we keep going to the market, the Thieves' Guild will eventually send enough thugs to get the job done. You're right. She consolidated the loot into a single pouch. The problem is I don't know anybody in this city. If I were home, we could burgle a house and fence the goods. Here I don't know any fences, much less which work directly for the Thieves' Guild, or even if there are any that don't. We either have to join the guild or get out of this city and try our luck somewhere else. I don't see how we can join the guild. That fat thief made it clear we weren't welcome. I say we go back to the market tomorrow. I pick every pocket I can. We come back here and grab Sophia and get lost. I like it. They'd never expect us to try anything so soon. For what he hoped would be the last time, Xander waited in a stinking alley for Kaylin to return. 
Last night, when she came upstairs, Xander explained to Sophia they had to leave the city and try their luck elsewhere. The disappointment on her face had broken his heart, but it was too dangerous to stay. After lunch, he and Kaylin had left the inn and headed toward the marketplace. They made a quick walk around and Kaylin pronounced all clear. Xander went to his hiding place and left Kaylin to her work. That was an hour ago, and he was so worried he hadn't stopped pacing. Hey, Xander spun around, sword raised. Kaylin walked down the alley, calm as could be. No angry men with weapons chased her, so he decided their plan to move fast had worked out. Hey, yourself. You didn't run into any trouble? No, didn't see any sign of them. Guess we caught them by surprise. Yeah, let's get out of here while the getting's good. They walked down the alley but hadn't gone more than a couple steps when two men appeared and blocked their path. Swords hung at their belts, but they didn't draw them. I knew this was going too well. Come on. Xander grabbed Kaylin's hand and they turned toward the other end of the alley. Two more men blocked this end. Damn them to hell. I guess we fight. The enforcers blocking their way stepped to one side, and a fifth man accompanied by the fat thief stepped into the alley. Xander stiffened at the sight of him. The fifth man was different than the others. Just short of six feet tall, in his mid-thirties, he had short black hair and a lean build. He carried himself with the unconscious grace of a natural swordsman. If Xander had to fight him, he was dead. Are these the ones? The new man asked the fat thief. The fat man nodded. Yes, my lord, they're the ones. The new man drew his sword and faced Xander and Kaelin. You two will regret not joining the guild when you had the chance. Xander frowned. The thing is, we were never given a chance to join. In fact, we offered to join yesterday, but the fellow behind you said we weren't thieves' guild material. The swordsman lowered his blade a fraction. Hakim, is this true? No, they're lying. Kill them. He looked at Xander, who stared back. It's clear one of you is lying. Let's all go back to the guild hall and Hakim will take a truth potion. Whoever is lying will be executed. What say you, stranger? Does this strike you as a fair arrangement? Since Xander hadn't lied and he didn't want to get killed, he thought it sounded like an excellent arrangement and said so. Hakim, does this sound fair to you? Hakim's dark skin got darker. That sounds fair, my lord, but it won't be necessary. They're telling the truth. I suspected as much. The leader sheathed his sword. Why is it you ignored guild rules and tried to kill these two without even giving them a chance to join? They're kids. I figured they'd be of little use to us. When they bested that lunatic you call a friend, that gave you some indication they were skilled. What's even worse, they offered to join and you failed to accept and you attacked them again. What about him? Hakim pointed at Xander. He killed one of our enforcers and hurt two others. Aren't you going to do something about that? That's on you, the leader said. What did you think would happen? Did you think he'd stand there and let your men cut him and the young lady down? You'll answer for your foolishness later. Now get out of my sight. Hakim left in sullen silence. After he'd gone, the leader said, I apologize for Hakim. He's a poor representative of our guild. Where are my manners? I'm Craven, sub-commander of the Thieves' Guild. He bowed like a courtier. Xander called upon years of etiquette training and bowed as his mother had taught him. Xander Kane, my lord, at your service. Kaelin managed an awkward curtsy. Kaelin, Honor to meet you, sir. Craven smiled. Excellent. Now that we're all acquainted, let's head over to the guild hall and you two can meet the day boss and see if he has any assignments for you. He made a dismissive gesture and the enforcers guarding the alley slipped away. Xander and Kaylin followed Craven out of the alley and turned north. After they'd walked a couple blocks, Xander said, I'm not much of a thief. My skills lie more in the realm of combat. That's no problem. Craven glanced at him and grinned. We have an opening for a new enforcer. Xander laughed, pleased Craven didn't hold a grudge. Loaded wagons came and went from warehouses in the bustling merchants' district. The curses and grunts of laborers filled the air as they wrestled heavy crates. Craven led them to a large, well-maintained warehouse with a sign over the door that read, 
Olin's Import and Export. Inside, crates of all shapes and sizes filled every shelf. There was an office to the left as you entered, but Craven ignored it and continued to the rear of the building. About ten feet from the back wall, someone had piled crates almost to the ceiling. They followed Craven behind the crates, and he bent down and lifted a hatch built into the floor. The boards fit so well, Xander hadn't even noticed a seam. The stairway led down into the darkness. Craven took a glowstone from a vest pocket and rubbed it until the light grew bright enough to show the way. The guild hall is underground? Xander asked. This is the back door. There are half a dozen passages like this scattered around the city. Watch your heads as the ceiling is quite low. Craven indicated they should go first, then closed the trap door behind them. Craven took the lead at the bottom of the stairs. He led them down a rough-hewn tunnel. The older man had to walk bent over, but Xander and Kaylin only bowed their heads. Xander counted 321 steps before they reached another set of stairs going up out of the tunnel. Wait here, Craven went up the steps, and a few seconds later a muffled conversation drifted down to them. Come on up. Xander went first, just in case. The stairs led to a small, square room with a pair of guards armed with crossbows. If anyone tried to break in, the two guards would have little trouble holding the narrow entryway. Neither guard looked threatening, so Xander reached down and helped Kalen out of the tunnel. Craven shut the trap door behind them. Follow me. He led them through the room's only door and down a short hall. The outline of several murder holes gleamed in the dim light. I'd hate to fight my way in here, Xander said. Craven stopped in front of the door at the end of the hall. You've noticed the murder holes. Good, I hoped you would. No one has ever tried to force their way through these tunnels, but the guildmaster thought it wise to be prepared. A sound philosophy. I look forward to meeting him, Xander said. You won't meet the master, at least not right away. He seldom visits the hall. The day boss and the night boss run things along with me and another lieutenant. Xander nodded and glanced at Kaylin, who looked bored. She must have known all this stuff from her old guild. Craven opened the door and they stepped through into what looked like a lobby of an inn. A heavyset bald man without a shirt sat behind a counter with a ledger on it. Craven cleared his throat and the man looked up. Ah, oh, Craven, back already. He looked past Craven at Xander and Kaylin. What have we here? Sir, I'm afraid Hakim, as usual, provided us with bad information. Craven summarized what happened in the alley. When he finished, the man behind the desk, the day boss, Sander assumed, given Craven's deferential behavior, groaned. Remind me again why we let that fool do any thinking. His brain is clearly defective. Why did the night boss insist we give him a third chance to screw up? I believe Hakim and the night boss are cousins, sir. Oh, well, if that's the case, have the idiot assigned to night duty. At least I won't have to deal with him. As for you two... He waved Xander and Kalen closer. We don't have many rules, but they are rigorously enforced. Pay attention, as I don't want to repeat myself. First, you can't harm another guild member. Second, you can't conduct any business without guild approval, and upon completion you will surrender all proceeds from which you will receive your cut. Third, the day boss paused his bored recital to look closer at Xander. Did you really best three of my enforcers? Yes, sir. Remarkable. You hardly look up to the task. Where was I? Rule three, Kalen said. Right. Rule three. All members are equal save the master, bosses, and lieutenants. They are to be obeyed at all times. Day shift members report at mid-morning and night shift members report at midnight. Since I'm three men down, you'll both be assigned to the day shift. Questions? They shook their heads. All right. Do you have rooms in the city or will you be staying at the hall? We have a room in the city, Xander said. Fine, you can get a meal in the dining hall after you hand over whatever you nicked this morning. Kaylin grudgingly handed over the three purses she cut that morning. The day boss counted it, then handed her back a single purse. Not a bad haul. What else can you do? I can pick locks and sneak around. Most anything a burglar might need to do I can manage, Kaylin said. The day boss nodded and turned to Xander. What about you? I can pick a simple lock, but mostly I fight. The boss waved a hand at his lack of traditional skills. 
Never fear, my boy, we always have need of men with your skills. In fact, as you've already defeated several of the enforcers, I considered the most skilled. I think your talents are more needed than I first thought. Xander bowed at the compliment. I hope I can be of service. I'm sure you can. There's a job for you right now if you're ready. I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Xander's stomach did a somersault. Now he had a chance to prove himself. He couldn't blow it. Good, the boss eyed him. Let me see that weapon. Sander handed over his blunt, rusty sword. The day boss looked at the cheap iron and clucked his tongue. This won't do at all. A blunt sword isn't much of a threat. He ducked into a door behind the counter and emerged a minute later with a curved, single-edged sword that seemed popular in the city. He drew the weapon and handed it to Xander. Xander accepted the sword and made a couple slow cuts. He shook his head. The blade weighed too much for the counterweight. A full swing would overbalance him. If he were six inches taller and 50 pounds heavier, it would be perfect. But as he stood, it would get him killed in a fight. The day boss must have seen the dislike on his face. Is the sword not to your liking? I assure you it's made of the finest steel. Sander couldn't argue that. The blade was one of the finest he'd ever seen. The sword is well made, but the balance is too far forward, and it's too heavy for someone my size. If you have something lighter with the balance more toward the hilt, I would be grateful. The day boss snorted. Anything else? Well, sir, since you asked, I prefer a straight blade. And if I can't find a blade to your specifications? In that case, I'd like my old sword back. What? You'd rather have that rusty hunk of iron than the fine blade you hold? While I don't wish to offend you, sir, all this fine weapon will do is get me killed. Better a poor blade that suits me than a fine one that doesn't. The day boss took the sword and returned to the back room, muttering all the while. Xander noticed Craven watching him, and that sometime during his discussion, Kalen had snuck off. I meant no offense. Craven smiled. I didn't think you did. In fact, you were well-spoken, and I couldn't find fault with a single word. My swordmaster used to say, a great sword doesn't make a great swordsman, but the wrong sword will make a dead swordsman. I suspect your master was a wise man. The day boss emerged carrying a slim, straight sword in a black sheath clipped to a matching baldric. I knew I had one back there. Give this a try. Xander accepted the weapon and found the balance excellent. He held it up and looked down at the edge, sharp and smooth, not a nick in sight. This will suit me perfectly. Thank you. The boss shook his head. That weapon belonged to a female member that died a year ago. He said female with such contempt, Xander knew he'd slipped a notch in the boss's esteem. Now the job. It's simple. A merchant failed to make his protection payments for the last three months. I want you to collect it. Yes, sir. Is there a reason the merchant hasn't paid? There is. He hired a guard. The guard sent two of my enforcers flying out of the shop last time we tried to collect. Xander nodded. Is there any limit on how I can deal with the merchant and guard? I don't care what you do with the guard, but I want the merchant left intact. You can't collect gold from a corpse, after all. Got it, Xander said. Could you spare someone to show me the way? Sure, that's a good idea. You being new, he won't know you're a member. Craven, fetch Nico, will you? Any idea where he is? Craven asked. It's not much past noon. I expect he's still in bed. Craven nodded and left by one of the side doors that led deeper into the building. How come he sleeps so late? Xander asked. Because he's lazy. The boss made no effort to hide his disgust. Then he chuckled. The kid's a genius with locks, so he's worth keeping around. Don't worry. Nico knows this city inside and out. You'll be in good hands. Craven returned with a sandy-haired boy about twelve in tow. Nico looked like he had time enough to throw on a wrinkled set of clothes. His hair stuck out in ten directions, and his bright blue eyes latched onto Xander. You're new, Nico said in a cheerful, piping voice. You're right, Xander said. What's wrong with your voice? Why are you wearing a mask? 
Before Xander could answer, the day boss interrupted. Nico, I want you to take Xander to Morin's to collect his back payments. Morin, I know that name. Is that the stink merchant? Yeah, Xander here is our newest enforcer and he's going to collect. Nico looked at Xander, back at the day boss, and laughed. When he got himself under control, he said, You're not serious. Do I look like I'm laughing, boy? No, sir. Nico clammed up. Wise of him, Xander thought. Get going. Yes, sir. Xander followed his young guide out the front door, which, to his surprise, led to a deserted alley. When the door closed, it looked like another section of wall. Whoever built the guild's secret doors knew their business. Boy, he was in a bad mood, Nico said. I think he doesn't get enough sleep. Why did you laugh when he said I would collect the money owed to the guild? Oh, sorry about that. He sent two guys over to collect a couple days ago and they couldn't handle the merchant's new guard. You're about half their size and going alone. It seems you're being sent to fail. Perhaps, Xander said. He followed Nico through the city, listening with half an ear as the boy chattered nonstop about this or that happening. He talked faster than a pack of chambermaids on lunch break. When Xander could take it no longer, he said, What is it about this guard that the other enforcers couldn't handle? Nico grinned. I don't want to spoil the surprise. Don't worry, we're almost there and you can see for yourself. Xander sighed, resigned to an unpleasant surprise. They walked another block and a half before Nico stopped in front of a well-built three-story stone building. A strong, almost eye-watering smell emerged from the door. The stink merchant was, of course, a perfume dealer. Nico smiled and gestured toward the door. After you! Xander loosened his new sword in its scabbard and stepped through the door. Nico followed him, and the door clanged shut. The shop was small. A bar ran along the far wall, dozens of bottles lining its length. Behind the bar stood a middle-aged man with gray hair and a well-trimmed beard. He wore a pale silk robe and a gold ring glittered on his right pinky. In the far corner glowered a huge man dressed in a loincloth and boots. Thick muscles rippled over his body, but he carried no weapon. Xander walked to the bar, hand on the hilt of his sword. You're Morin? That's right, the old man said. Can I help you? You can pay me what you owe the guild before my sinuses catch fire. The thieves' guild sent you to collect. They must be hard up for muscle. Why don't you get out of here before Crusher over there has to hurt you? Sander cared for neither the merchant's tone nor attitude. Why don't you pay me before I have to get bloodstains all over this nice hardwood floor? The giant looked at the merchant, who nodded. Crusher started toward Xander. He hopped back from the counter so he'd have room to maneuver, drew his sword, and watched Crusher advance, cracking his knuckles and chuckling. Xander shook his head at the crude attempt at intimidation. The man didn't even have a sword. Are you sure you want to do this? Crusher smiled, revealing a mouthful of crooked teeth. He lunged toward Xander, arms extended, Xander crouched under his grasp, then thrust up under Crusher's ribcage and through his heart. Xander withdrew his blade and danced back as the giant collapsed, dead before he hit the floor. Morin gaped, mouth open and eyes bulging at his dead bodyguard. About the payment, Xander said. Morin closed his mouth and looked at Xander as though seeing him for the first time. Fear replaced contempt in the merchant's eyes, and the change suited Xander a great deal. How much was it? Morin asked. Xander frowned. You know, the day boss didn't say. Tell you what, you give me what you think you owe. If I have to walk back here, I will be in a bad mood. No, no, never. Morin raced into a room behind the counter and returned in seconds with a heavy pouch. Xander hefted the pouch and nodded. He leaned into Morin so their faces were inches apart. If I have to come here again, it'll be you lying on the floor. Morin nodded, tears streaming down his face, staining his beard. Xander cleaned his sword on the shoulders of the merchant's fine robe, leaving bloodstains behind as a reminder of his visit. 
He sheathed his sword and joined a wide-eyed Nico by the door. Let's go. The boy nodded and led the way back to the guild hall. They walked in silence for five minutes. He wouldn't have thought the boy capable of not speaking for such a stretch. After another block, Nico said, I've never seen anything like that. Like what? Xander looked down at his diminutive guide. Like how you handled that guy. I mean, he thrashed two guys twice your size and threw them out on their asses before they could get their swords drawn. You come along and handle him like he was me and not a giant. Sanders shrugged. He had no weapon, no armor. I don't care how much meat he has. A good sword will cut him up the same as a smaller man. Nico grinned. I can't wait to see the look on the day boss's face when we get back. Sanders smiled back. Neither can I. Chapter 22 The day boss looked up when Xander and Nico walked into the entry room. That was fast. It's a short walk. Xander plunked the pouch of coins on the counter. Here you go. The day boss looked at Xander, then the pouch, then back at Xander. You got it? Xander nodded. No sweat. He patted his new sword where it hung at his hip. It's an excellent sword. Did you kill the guard? Craven had slipped into the room without Xander noticing. Yes. The day boss finished counting the coins. There's more here than he owed. The thing is, I didn't know how much he owed. So I told the merchant if he was short, I'd have to come back and I'd be in a bad mood. After he watched me kill his bodyguard, he decided to err on the side of caution. Craven laughed. You'll do great at this job. Indeed. The day boss counted out five gold coins and slid them over to Xander. A reward for a job well done. Xander pocketed the coins. Thank you, sir. Do you need me for anything else right now? I've got a friend waiting. I imagine she's getting worried. The day boss looked at Craven, who shook his head. Nothing right now. Take an hour and see your friend. When you get back, there's someone I want you to meet, Craven said. Xander nodded and left by the front door. He returned to the inn at a jog. Sophia had to be frantic by now. Xander went in and ran up the steps. He opened the door to their room and found Sophia pacing. She smiled and ran over and hugged him. After a moment, Xander stepped back. Sorry it took so long. I have good news. We don't have to leave. That's wonderful. The relief in her voice made him smile. What happened? We cleared up the misunderstanding with the guild. Kaylin and I are members now, so we shouldn't have any more problems. We'll need to go to the guild hall most days and some nights, but we won't have to worry about enforcers chasing us anymore. You must be relieved. You said it. Will it be all right if I continue working in the dining room? If you enjoy it, I can't see any harm, Xander said. Since Kaylin and I will both be gone most days, it would probably be good for you to get out. Speaking of the dining room, have you eaten yet? She shook her head. Let's get something. My treat. Sophia took his arm and they went downstairs. They sat at a table in the corner of the near-empty room. Xander ordered steak, spiced potatoes, and bread. They split a bottle of good red wine. During the meal, Sophia talked about the other girls and how nice they all treated her. She also raved about how good the meal tasted. Xander smiled. He'd never seen her so happy. He would have paid twice the three gold pieces price to see the joy in Sophia's face. She seemed to be getting over her days as a slave. He was even happier now that they didn't need to leave the city. Sophia probably wouldn't have handled the move well. They finished their meal and sipped the wine. We'll have to do this again, Sophia said. Maybe not so extravagant next time. I'm almost broke again, Sophia smiled. As long as you sit with me and we can enjoy it, I don't care what we eat. Deal, he sighed. I had better get back. See you tonight. Xander left Sophia sipping her wine and retraced his steps back to the guild hall. The day boss sat in his chair eating cheese and sausage. 
He glanced up when Xander entered. Do you need anything done, sir? The boss shook his head and jerked a greasy thumb toward the door leading deeper into the building. After that articulate exchange, Xander went to find Craven. Behind the door, he found a long hall lined with doors. Halfway down was a staircase leading to the second floor. The first two doors were locked, so he walked to the end of the hall and found the door open. He poked his head into a large dining hall. A dozen rough-looking men and women sat in small groups talking. Xander spotted Kaylin deep in conversation with a handsome fellow he didn't recognize. He doubted she'd appreciate him intruding, so he retreated to the staircase and went upstairs. At the top of the stairs, the clacking of wooden practice swords greeted him. Xander grinned. He loved that sound. He followed his ears to a room with a thick padded mat in the center. Five men sat around the mat while two more sparred in the center with wooden swords. This is where the enforcers train. Xander about jumped out of his skin when Craven spoke. Could you please try to make a little noise? Sorry, force of habit. The day boss was impressed with your collection earlier. He must have had low expectations if he didn't think I could handle an unarmed man. The last two he sent couldn't. Xander shrugged. I'm not them. Craven, a grovelly voice interrupted their conversation. Xander looked back to see a gray-bearded man with a bad limp headed their way. What do we have here? Master Jared, Craven said. Allow me to introduce our newest enforcer. Xander, this is Master Jared. He oversees the enforcer's training. Xander bowed at the waist. Sir, I look forward to learning from you. The other students laughed and Xander frowned. Boy's more polite than the thugs you usually bring me, but can he fight? He claims some skill with a blade, Craven said. Xander looked at him and he winked. Why don't you try him out yourself? The old man grinned. You read my mind. Anyone want to try the new guy? Seven hands shot up. Xander's frown deepened. Their eagerness showed a distinct lack of respect. He'd fix that. Jared pointed to a bald man about 20 years Xander's senior. You first, Sewan. Sewan got up and the other students helped him dress in a padded leather vest. Xander studied his opponent a moment. He was a big man with a broad chest, his whole body thick with muscle. Not as much as Crusher, but enough that Xander would need to rely on his speed. I'll get you some protection. Jared limped to the back of the room where a rack of padded swords sat. Beside the sword stand was a table covered with leather vests. Jared picked through them until he found what he wanted. He limped back with the sword and vest. This is the smallest we've got. Xander took the vest and shook his head. It would just get in his way. He handed it back. Thanks anyway. You sure, boy? Those swords hurt when you get hit. I don't plan on getting hit. Xander unbuckled his sword and leaned it against the wall. He accepted the wooden sword and moved to the center of the mat. What are the rules? Simple, Jared said. The match goes to three touches anywhere on your opponent's body. Do glancing blows count? I'll call the blows as I see fit. The match is over when I say, got it? Xander nodded. On guard. When both fighters stood ready, Jared said, begin. Sewan bore in, hacking and slashing in an attempt to score his hits fast. He had no style, just crude blows that Xander angled away with no great effort. It wasn't long before his opponent overextended a lunge. Xander cracked him on the back of the thumb. Sewan's wooden sword fell to the mat from numb fingers. One, Jared said. His opponent unarmed, Xander wasted no time ending the fight. He cracked Sewan across the back of the knees, and when he started to fall, grabbed his collar and drove him to the mat. Two. Xander ended the match with a chop to Sewan's stomach. Three. Match is over. Xander flipped the wooden sword into the crook of his arm and turned in time to see Jared toss a coin to Craven. So he has some skill, huh? You cheated me out of that silver. Craven grinned. I am a thief. He got lucky. One of the other students had climbed to his feet. Xander shot him a glare. The man had night black hair tied in a ponytail and a slim, athletic build. He looked to be about Craven's age. 
His lip curled in an arrogant sneer. Xander took an instant dislike to him. Sit down, Dane, Jared said. Come on, Master Jared. This brat wouldn't last ten seconds against a real swordsman. Xander's eyes narrowed. Can you recommend a swordsman worth my time? Dane flinched, but to his credit, picked up Sewan's fallen sword and stepped onto the mat. I might at that. Did I miss anything? Everyone turned when Nico slipped inside the room. What are you doing here? Craven asked. I heard Xander was sparring with the enforcers. I figured after what he did to Crusher, it would be a show worth watching. Are you sure you want to do this? Jared asked. Dane is my best man. Xander nodded. Crusher, the name sounds familiar, Dane said. It should, Nico grinned ear to ear. He's the guy that threw you and Mika out on your asses a couple days ago. Dane stared at Nico, who continued on without a clue. I thought the old stink merchant would wet himself when he saw what Xander did to his muscle. You should have been there, Dane. You would have gotten a kick out of it. This kid took out the giant. Nico nodded. Didn't even break a sweat. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. Dane stepped off the mat. Perhaps I spoke too quickly. Xander laughed. This is your best man? No wonder you're having trouble making collections. Dane snarled and charged, sword raised as though he planned to drive Xander through the mat. Xander sidestepped the clumsy attack and brought the hilt of his sword down on Dane's head. He fell to the mat out cold. Xander offered his sword hilt first to Master Jared. Your students are too angry and lack control. Of course they do, Jared said. Why do you think they became enforcers in the first place? So someone would pay them to vent that anger. All they're going to do is get themselves killed. Let's take a walk, Craven said. Xander buckled on his sword and indicated Craven should lead the way. They left the training room and Craven led them back toward the mess hall. You didn't make any friends up there. They don't need me to be their friend. They need someone to hate. Someone to be the focus of their training. You want to give their training purpose? Xander stopped and turned to face Craven. I embarrassed them today. They'll all train harder so they can return the favor. By the time any of them are skilled enough to threaten me, I plan to be long gone. Gone where? Xander looked away, remembering. Home. What's at home? Nothing. Xander looked into Craven's eyes again. Somewhere nearby is the person that killed my family. I will find them, and when I'm done, they'll beg me to burn them alive. How will you find whoever did it? Craven resumed walking and turned down the stairs. Xander shrugged. Someone knows. A little gold or a lot of fear will bring me the information I need. A look of more than casual interest flittered across Craven's face, but it vanished so fast Xander figured he imagined it. Is that all you think it will take? Xander shrugged again. If something else is required, I'll find it. Whoever killed my family will suffer for it. I haven't lived through the last six months for nothing. However long and wherever the search takes me, I will find who's responsible. They reached the dining hall and Craven said, There's nothing else for you to do today. Go home if you want, but return by midday tomorrow. If I have nothing else to do, I'll spar with you. Sander smiled. You'd be an improvement over today's opponents. Craven offered a mocking bow. Till tomorrow, then. Sander went into the hall and Craven walked back toward the front of the building. Xander found Kaylin talking with the same young man as before. He walked over to their table and waited for her to notice him. When she looked his way, he said, I'm heading home. Do you want to walk back with me? No, I'll stay a little longer. Hey, how'd your first job go? It was simple enough. I was there and back in under an hour. Simple? Sander looked beside him and found Nico standing there. He hadn't heard the boy arrive. That was the second time someone snuck up on him today. You shouldn't be so modest. 
Nico explained in excruciating detail what happened. Did you need to kill the guard? Kaelin asked. It was the safest way to deal with him, and it put the necessary fear in the merchant. He paid, and I doubt he'll hire another guard, thus sparing me the need to kill someone else. See you at home. Sander left the guild hall and quick stepped back to the inn. When he got to their room, he found it empty. Sophia must have gone back to work. That suited Xander as he wanted sleep more than conversation. The next three weeks passed in a blur for Xander. With what the guild paid him, he no longer worried about their day-to-day -day survival, and he even splurged on a new set of clothes in gray and black to match his mask. With the burden of mere survival gone, Xander turned his concentration to training. Craven made an excellent sparring partner. His skill surpassed even what Xander expected. Since his first day, the other enforcers wouldn't even look at him. But he didn't care, as sparring with them would be a waste of time. Xander looked up from the mat where Craven had deposited him for the fourth time that morning. Why haven't I gotten any work? Craven wiped sweat from his brow with a towel, then tossed it into a corner. Word of your efforts with the perfume merchant has spread. No small thanks go to Nico, who couldn't keep his mouth shut to save his life. The other enforcers use your name as a threat. Whenever someone is reluctant to pay, they tell them they'll meet the mask if they don't hand over the money. Xander sat up and laughed. The mask? <laughs> That's the best they could come up with? Craven shrugged. And your most notable feature, aside from your voice. How many other people do you suppose run around wearing a leather half mask? I guess it still strikes me as ridiculous. Ridiculous and effective aren't mutually exclusive. Since your display the other day, collections have gone up and violent confrontations down. The truth is, you serve us better as a seldom-seen threat hanging over the head of anyone that would deny us. The Guildmaster himself said so. I wouldn't want to argue with the Guildmaster. Still... You're bored, right? Yeah. Training with you has been great. I can see my skills improving. But training isn't the same as an actual fight. Tell you what, next job that comes along is all yours. Sound good? Thanks, Craven. Xander had been home for an hour when Kaylin arrived. She must have had interesting news if she left her new man so soon. Xander sat up and watched her dance in place at the end of the bed. He raised an eyebrow. Well, Craven paired us together. Tomorrow night, you, me, and Jaden are going out to steal some rubies that came into the city yesterday. Why do you need me? I'm no more a thief than I am a horse. Jaden heard the merchant hired guards to protect his merchandise. If we're discovered, it'll be your job to deal with them. Sander perked up at the thought of some action. When do we go? Tomorrow at midnight. We've all been excused from morning duties. Doesn't the night shift have someone to handle this? It's not that I mind. I'm just curious. After all, there's a whole other shift at night, right? Actually, Galen sat on the edge of the bed. There isn't much of a night shift. The only people that work at night full time are a few guards, the night boss and his assistants. Everyone else is either out on a job or getting ready to go. What time should I get there? The day boss said we shouldn't arrive too early since a long wait makes a thief nervous. We should gather half an hour early. Does he think waiting at home will make us less nervous? Beats me. Just be sure you're there on time. Xander spent the next day in the dining room watching Sophia wait tables and sipping coffee. He developed a taste for the bitter black drink. She seemed to have found her place in the world, laughing and joking with the guests. She sat beside him when her lunch break came. You seem happy, he said. She beamed. I love it here. Everyone's so nice and no one yells at me or hits me. Xander smiled. After the talk he had with Mr. El Kalim, he figured Sophia could break every plate in the kitchen and he wouldn't dare yell at her. Sophia put her hand over his. I'm so glad we stayed. Me too. Well after dark that night, Xander went downstairs. Sophia never flinched when he slipped out of their room and locked the door behind him. The way she ran around that dining room, he wasn't surprised she slept well. Xander walked through the dark city, 
navigating by the light of the full moon. He'd spent enough time walking the streets now that he no longer required a guide. When he arrived, he found Kaylin and her man waiting outside for him. Ready? Kaylin asked. Xander nodded and fell in behind the two thieves. After two blocks of silent walking, Xander asked, So what's the deal? Did the merchant not pay his protection or what? Jaden looked back at him. The muscle doesn't usually ask questions. Xander shot him a glare that would have blistered a stone wall. You sure you want to take that tone with the only person standing between you and several potentially well-armed guards? You wouldn't let anything happen to me. Want to bet your life on it? The two young men locked eyes, engaged in a contest of wills that Jaden had no hope of winning. Jaden looked away. Well, Xander asked again. The guild helped the merchant smuggle his gems into the city, saving him a good deal in taxes, Kalen said. In exchange, we were to get a cut of the stones. The merchant tried to hide some of his best merchandise from us. The guild had a man on the inside who found out. We're going to collect what we're owed plus interest. He must be a fool to cheat us. If he keeps up that nonsense, he and I will be having a conversation. Kaylin and Jaden looked back at him, then at each other before shuddering. Sander chose not to comment on their reaction. The little group came to a stop across the street from an intimidating three-story stone house. No light flickered in the windows, so either no one was home or they were all asleep. That's it? Sander asked. Kaylin nodded. Where are these guards supposed to be? Beats me, Jaden said. All right, you two wait here. I'll check the perimeter, and if it's clear, I'll wave you over. Without waiting for a comment, Xander dashed over to the building, smooth and silent like Craven taught him. No one guarded the front door, so he swung right and made a full circuit of the building. He saw nothing resembling a guard. Xander waved the others over. When they'd joined him, Xander said, Perimeter's clear. If there are guards, they must be inside. How do you want to go in? Kaylin asked. Right through the front door, Jaden said. They'll never expect it. Xander nodded, and Kaylin bent to the lock. She took less than a minute to pop it open. Xander went first and found the entry hall deserted unless you counted gaudy decorations. He made a quick scout of the first floor and found nothing living. Kaylin and Jaden joined him inside, and the two thieves went to a portrait of some nobleman and his hounds. Jaden moved it aside. Behind the painting, they found a locked compartment built into the wall. Jaden handled the lock this time, and inside rested a silver coffer. Kaylin removed the coffer from the compartment and opened it. Gems glittered in the dim light. She closed the coffer and slipped it into her satchel. The three of them got out while the getting was good. They ran three blocks before Kaylin said, That went well. Yeah, Jaden said. I guess Hakim was wrong about the guards. Hakim? Xander felt sick in the pit of his stomach. Jaden nodded. He warned me about the merchant hiring guards. Guess he heard wrong. Did you tell him Kaylin was going with you on this job? Sure, why? I've got to check on Sophia. I'll meet you at the guild hall. Xander ran for the inn. She had to be okay. He was worrying for nothing. No doubt he'd get home and find her sound asleep and none the worse for his worry. He burst through the door to the inn and ran up the stairs two at a time. At the top, lungs burning, he turned toward their room. The door stood partway open. Xander kicked it the rest of the way and charged through, sword drawn. Hakim stood over her bloody and bruised body, a curved dagger poised over her breast. Xander pointed the tip of his sword at Hakim's chest. Throw away your knife. Hakim looked up, an insane smile plastered on his face. You're in luck. You made it in time to see her die. If she dies, you join her. You can't touch me, Hakim giggled. We're brothers in the guild. Xander walked deeper into the room, his face twisted in a rictus of rage. Throw the knife away, and you might live a little longer. I promise if you hurt her anymore, I'll cut your heart out. Guild rules be damned. 
Whether it was the look in Xander's eyes or something else, Hakim realized how close he was to dying. His eyes widened and he tossed the dagger away. He eased around Xander, keeping as much distance between them as the room would allow before he darted out the door. Xander locked it behind him and rushed over to Sophia, his sword forgotten on the floor beside him. She gasped for breath, and her right eye had swollen shut. Sophia, can you hear me? It's Xander. Come on, you've got to wake up. Her left eye fluttered open and she looked at him. I knew you'd come. That awful man said you wouldn't, but I knew. Xander sat beside her. I'm sorry. I should have been here. Where's your bag? I need to tend your injuries. He started to get up, but she grabbed his arm and pulled him back. Don't bother. But, she shook her head. It's too bad. Just hold me for a little while. Xander cradled her head in his lap. Too soon, she stopped breathing. Tears rolled down Xander's face when he noticed she'd gone. He lost all track of time as he sat there, Sophia's head in his lap. At some point, grief turned into a cold, consuming rage. He picked her body up off the floor and put her on the bed. Xander gently wrapped her in the sheet. That done, he locked the door so no one would stumble on her and left for the guild. He figured Hakim would hide somewhere in the hall. Outside, the sun had risen. Xander stalked through the city like a demon sent to claim a soul. The few people out on the streets couldn't meet his eye, such was the rage twisting his features. When Xander reached the guild hall, Craven was waiting in the front room. He took one look at Xander and asked, What happened? Where's Hakim? I don't know. Xander, what happened? Xander brought himself under control enough to tell Craven, as soon as I find him, I'm going to gut him. I hate to say this, Sander, but he's still a guild member. If you kill him, we'll come after you. How many lives is he worth? What? After I kill Hakim, how many enforcers will I need to kill before you decide not to send any more? You'd better decide now, because when I find him, he's dead. You could kick him out of the guild. That would save all kinds of trouble. If it were my decision, I'd have kicked him out years ago. But he's the night boss's cousin, so we're stuck with him. Then you have a problem. Xander stalked off to search the rest of the hall. Is he serious? The day boss asked after hearing Craven's summary of events. Dead serious, if you'll forgive a bad pun. I doubt a battalion of the city guard could stop him from killing Hakim if he found him. If he succeeds, what do we do? Craven had considered little else since Xander arrived. I don't know. I suppose we'll go after him, but none of the enforcers are a match for him. Hell, I doubt if any three could take him. What about you? The day boss looked as nervous as Craven had ever seen him. In the state he's in now, it's fifty-fifty. I thought an angry opponent was easier to beat. Only if they're so angry they lose control... I know Xander isn't thinking clearly, but in a fight I suspect that anger will cool and focus him, giving him an even greater edge. So what do we do? We need to find Hakim and keep him out of sight, Craven said. Once Xander calms down, we can let him out from under our thumb. You think the boy will forget about wanting to kill Hakim? Craven shook his head. No, I just hope he'll control himself enough not to run Hakim through at first sight. When you remember what the kid's been through, that's the best we can hope for. I'll deal with Hakim, the day boss said. See if you can calm the kid down. Craven raised a dubious eyebrow but nodded. He left the meeting room and went to find Xander. How the hell would he calm the boy down? The girl he loved, and Craven had no doubt he'd loved her, died in his arms. He stopped in mid-stride. Xander had another friend. The girl had been his partner before they joined the guild. Maybe she could help. After a short search, Craven found Kaylin deep in conversation with Jaden. Craven knew the boy's reputation, so he had no doubt what they were discussing. As he approached their table, the young thieves stood up. Can we help you, sir? Jaden asked. 
I hope so. Jaden, go for a walk. Kaylin, please sit. Jaden left the dining room and Craven sat beside the girl. I need your help. It's Xander, isn't it? The girl sounded worried. Good, he could use that. When he ran off last night, I figured something was wrong. You are right. Craven gave her the short version of what happened. He's hell-bent on getting revenge. I need you to calm him down. Better if you can get him to sleep. It might help him think straight. I'll do whatever I can. Damn it, I should have gone with him last night. He's so overprotective of Sophia, I figured he was imagining things. Some friend. He saves my life and I can't even give him the benefit of the doubt. Forget last night. You can help him now. Craven handed her a key. The sun locks room two on the first floor. It's his for as long as he needs it. Do what you can, but for God's sake, don't tell him I sent you. I won't say anything. Where is he? I assume he's still in the hall somewhere. Nico walked through the dining room door and Craven whistled to get his attention. The boy hurried over. Nico, have you seen Xander? Yeah, a minute ago. He was headed up to the sparring room. Boy, did he look mad. I sure hope he doesn't find whoever he's looking for. You and me both, kid. Craven looked at Kaylin, who nodded, got to her feet, and headed out. Before Kaylin reached the top of the stairs, she heard rapid-fire thumps. She looked into the sparring room. Xander was punching a padded column with every bit of force he could muster. Kaylin slipped inside and closed the door behind her. Xander? He stopped pounding the column and rested his head on his hands. What's wrong? She thought it best to let him tell her in his own way. Sophia's gone. Kaylin could hardly understand the words but the pain came through clear enough. She went over and put her arms around him and Xander slumped against her. Tell me, she whispered in his ear. The story came gushing out, followed in short order by tears. Great racking sobs shook Xander and she held him like a child until they passed. When he caught his breath, Xander said, I couldn't do anything. By the time I got home, the damage was done. She died in my arms. I'm sorry, Xander. If I'd come home with you last night, Xander shook his head. It wouldn't have made any difference. She would have died anyway. Come on, let's go downstairs. You're exhausted and I haven't slept yet myself. There's a spare room we can use. Xander followed her without a comment. He trudged along like a zombie drained of any life. When they reached the room, Kaylin guided him to the bed and helped him lie down. He was asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. She smiled down at him and removed his mask, the scars underneath an ugly red. She brushed an unruly strand of black hair off his face. It was easy to forget when you saw him fight that he was still a boy of 14. When he slept and the mask was off, he looked frighteningly young. Even knowing everything he'd done, Xander still looked innocent to her. You saved my life. Been my friend, stood between me and danger any time I asked. I promise, whatever it takes, I'll get you through this. Kaylin pulled Xander's boots off, then stripped down to her small clothes and slipped under the covers beside him. She put her head on his shoulder and draped an arm over his chest. Soon she fell fast asleep. Xander had no idea what time it was when he woke up. He touched his face and found his mask gone. He looked over. Kaylin was curled up on her side, sound asleep. Xander vaguely remembered her helping him into bed. He smiled down at her. She was a good friend. Xander slipped out of bed, put on his boots and mask, pulled the covers up over Kaylin, and with a final fond look slipped out of the room. He found Craven at his usual post in the front room. He looked up from the paper he was reading when Xander entered. Doing better? I'll live. And Hakim? He's still going to die. Craven looked relieved. Why, Xander couldn't guess. I need something. Anything I can do. I'm at your disposal. What's traditional here? You know, when someone dies, I haven't seen anything resembling a cemetery. Of course, you need to make arrangements for your friend. The locals cremate their dead, but if you'd prefer to bury her, I could make arrangements for that. 
Sander shook his head. Cremation is fine. We never spoke of that sort of thing, so I don't know what she wanted. Where do I go? And there's a place on the next block north across from a tailor. Besides legal cremations, they do disposals for the guild. Tell them I sent you and what you need. They'll take good care of you. Thanks, Craven. When Kaylin wakes up, would you tell her where I've gone and ask her to meet me at the inn? Craven nodded and Sander left the hall. The sun sat low in the sky. He'd slept the whole day away. It took him a couple minutes to find the crematorium. The place was a big, square, stone building of only a single story. Sander wouldn't have been surprised to learn a hidden tunnel connected it to the guild hall. The small wooden door in the front stood unlocked, so Sander went in. There was a small reception area with a desk and several chairs. Behind the desk sat a thin man with an oiled mustache. Can I help you? I need to make arrangements for a friend that died. Craven said you'd help me. Ah, say no more. Do you need a wagon or will you deliver the body yourself? A wagon would be great. Xander gave him directions to the inn. When can you pick her up? How much time do you need to get ready? I'm ready now. Xander didn't want to think about it any longer than necessary. I just need to bring her downstairs. In that case, you can ride along with my driver. The little man looked back over his shoulder and shouted, Ah, I need you for a pickup. I'll hitch up the wagon, a surly voice from deeper in the building said. It'll just be a moment. When you return, do you have any particular requirements? Sander shook his head. I don't even know which god she worshipped. Let's keep this simple, okay? Of course. Will you be the only attendant? Myself and one other. The clatter of hooves announced the wagon's arrival. That'll be my ride. Go on, all will be ready when you return. Xander went out and climbed up on the wagon. He gave the burly, bald driver directions, and with a shake of the reins, they were on their way. When they reached the inn, Kalen waited out front. Xander climbed down out of the wagon. Have you been waiting long? A couple minutes. Why didn't you wait for me? Sorry, I needed to be moving, not sitting and thinking. I made arrangements to have her cremated. Will you ride back with us? Kalen nodded. Han undid the tailgate. Ready? Xander took a deep breath to steady himself, then nodded. They went upstairs, and when they reached the door to the suite, they found a pretty blonde girl standing outside. Is everything all right? She asked. Sophia hasn't been down all day. She was killed last night. The girl gasped. Did you tell the guard? What happened? I found her when I came home last night. She'd been beaten pretty bad. You don't need to worry about the guard. They couldn't do anything to the animal that did this half as bad as what I'll do. The girl looked into his eyes and shivered. You should go downstairs now. You don't want to see what he did to her. She hurried downstairs, pausing once to glance back at Xander. When she'd gone, Xander unlocked the door and they collected Sophia's body. It was still wrapped in the sheet where he left it. He and Han each took an end. They carried her down to the wagon and loaded her in. When they'd all climbed on the wagon, Han drove them back to the crematorium. They went around to the back of the building where a set of double doors stood open. Han drove through them and parked the wagon. A short ways away was a stone slab piled high with wood soaked in some liquid. The thin man stood beside the slab. Place the deceased on top, he said. Xander and Han managed this with a bit of straining. When it was done, Han left Xander and Kalin standing together, facing the pyre. Since you don't know the deceased's faith, I thought I would keep the blessing short. That would be best. Thank you. The thin man moved to stand beside the pyre. May the gods accept this departed soul that she may enjoy eternal peace. With a spark, we send this mortal vessel to the four winds. He took a piece of flint from his shirt pocket along with a small knife. He struck them together and sparks flew into the soaked wood which burst into flames. In moments, Sophia's body was engulfed. Maybe you should stay away from me, Xander said. 
What? Sander nodded toward the pyre. Everyone I care about seems to end up like that, one way or another. I'm not sure I can stand to lose you, too. Kalen took his hand and said in a fierce voice, You're not going to lose me, and we've been through too much together for me to walk away. No disrespect to the dead, but she and I couldn't be any different. Xander didn't argue with her. He didn't want to. He squeezed her hand as they watched the fire burn. Chapter 23 Craven grunted when he hit the mat on the training room floor. Xander rested the tip of his sword on the older man's throat. They both grinned. In the months following Sophia's death, Xander had thrown himself into his training with an intensity that frightened most of the others, but seemed to intrigue Craven. In addition to running and weightlifting, Xander and Craven sparred for an hour and a half every day. Xander reached down and helped Craven to his feet. Finally got you. It was a good move. Craven stripped off his sweat-soaked training gear. You've come far in the last two months. Xander's smile deepened as he followed Craven's example and tossed his practice sword beside the rack. The intense training had burned away everything that wasn't muscle, bone, or sinew. He was faster and stronger than he'd ever been. Even better, he'd reconnected with Kaylin. After Sophia's death, Craven made them a team again. They'd gone out on five jobs and pulled them all off without a hitch. It was like before they joined the guild, the two of them working together with no one else to depend on. They'd also moved to the hall permanently. Neither of them had the heart to stay in their old room after what happened. Xander belted on his sword. Same time tomorrow? Craven rubbed his ribs where Xander had scored a hit. I'm not sure I can handle two days in a row. Guess you're getting old. Craven snorted. I'll see you here tomorrow. We'll see if you can get lucky twice. Xander grinned. All he had to do was tease Craven about his age and he'd return for more. He wasn't even that old. Well, whatever worked. See you tomorrow. Where are you going? For a run around the city. Care to join me? Craven frowned and shook his head. Xander had known the answer before he made the request. When he said run around the city, he actually meant to run the perimeter wall, a trip that took the better part of an hour. Xander left Craven and went downstairs. Jaden stood by the front door. He hadn't seen much of the thief since he and Kaylin had been spending more time together. Xander nodded to him and reached for the door handle. Jaden blocked his way. Can we talk for a minute? Xander nodded. Jaden licked his lips as though not sure how to begin. After an awkward couple seconds, he said, Since you started staying in the hall, I haven't seen much of Kaylin. I was wondering if I'll ever get to, or if I should forget about her. I love her, Xander said. Jaden's face fell in a sad frown. Xander grinned. Like a sister. Jaden brightened. So you don't mind if I pay her a visit? Not at all. Xander frowned and his expression hardened. If you get serious, I won't appreciate you running around behind her back. Jaden sputtered a protest, but Xander raised his hand to silence him. I know your reputation. If you break her heart, I'll cut yours out. Jaden blanched. I swear I'd never do anything to hurt her. Xander smiled again. Good. Now I've got to run. He brushed past the thief and headed out. Xander found Kaylin waiting for him when he got back. Where have you been? She grabbed his arm and pulled him toward the dining hall. Everyone's gathered and waiting for the guildmaster to speak. You're the last one, come on. What's so important? We've been here three months and haven't heard a thing from him. Beats me, but everyone's here except you. Now come on. Did you say everyone? Yes, but please don't do anything crazy. Hakim's kept this long, a little longer won't make a difference. Xander nodded. Besides, it wasn't like he'd be able to kill Hakim in a room full of people determined to stop him. Xander would get one chance to kill the fat man and he would not waste it. Thieves packed the dining hall and Craven paced a few feet from the door. When he spotted Xander, he said, Where have you been? The guildmaster's been waiting half an hour. 
I went for a run, the same run I go on every day. Well, it's not every day the guildmaster wants to address the whole guild. He doesn't like to be kept waiting. I went right after our sparring match. If you wanted me here, you should have said something. I didn't know I would need you here, Craven said. If you didn't know, how was I supposed to? Craven opened his mouth like he wanted to argue some more, then clamped it shut. Never mind, you're here now. I have to tell the day boss everyone has arrived. He seems worked up. Xander wiped sweat from his face. I wish I'd had a chance to wash. Aren't you worried? Kaelin asked. Everyone's on edge. I don't know enough to be worried. Maybe after the guildmaster speaks. The room fell silent when a robed figure swept in through a secret door in the back wall Xander didn't know existed. The guildmaster stood a little above six feet tall, and that was all Xander could tell since the robe and cowl obscured everything. Even the master's hands were hidden in its folds. I have troubling news. The guildmaster's voice sounded far away. No doubt he used a device of some sort to disguise it. An informant of ours in the guard reports that one of our teams was killed last night. They found the bodies of two thieves outside a merchant's house. On the wall above the bodies written in their blood were the words, Death to all thieves. Murmurs rippled through the assembled guild. The master raised his hands and everyone fell silent. Until this threat is dealt with, all teams will include an enforcer, no matter how simple the job. The master vanished back through the secret door. The thieves talked amongst themselves. Xander yawned and started toward the door. Kaelin fell in beside him. What do you think? she asked. I think from now on where you go, I go. I won't argue. It'll be tight with everyone staying in the hall. It certainly will be. Craven had come up beside them, and as usual, Xander hadn't noticed a thing. What did you think of the Guildmaster? He has a flair for the dramatic, but I don't see that he needed to tell us that in person. All we know is our people got killed. Isn't that enough? Craven asked. Xander shrugged. He had no strong feelings for most of his guildmates. I guess it'll have to be. Just between us, Graven, does he know any more? I don't think so. If you have any thoughts, I'm all ears. Xander laughed. My thought is that you'd best require regular baths or this place will stink. Craven's grim mask cracked into a smile. Get some rest, you two. You've got a job tonight. Xander nodded and Craven went off to deal with other business. When he'd gone, Kaelin asked, Do you think it'll be just us? I hope so. We'll attract less attention that way. Xander and Kaelin slipped like shadows through the dark city. They'd passed the day napping and lounging around their room. Since the two of them already shared a room, they'd avoided a third roommate. Craven had stopped by late in the afternoon to give them the assignment a simple burglary to convince a merchant new to the city to pay his protection money. That's it. Kaelin pointed to a three-story home across the street from the alley in which they hid. Xander ran across the street and crouched under a window on the right side of the building. Everything looked clear, so he waved Kaelin over. What do you want to do? Craven said to grab the most obvious valuables. I'll go in, rummage around, and snatch the best stuff on the first floor. I'll keep watch here. Be careful. Kalen kissed his uncovered cheek. I'm always careful. Kalen took a small pry bar out of her satchel and in short order had the window open. Xander helped her inside, then took up position in the shadows nearby. A few minutes later, Kalen returned her satchel, stuffed to bulging. That didn't take long. Xander helped her down from the window ledge. Are you kidding? I could have filled a wheelbarrow in the first five rooms. This guy must be loaded. If he doesn't pay his protection money, you might get a chance to do that. Let's go. We're too exposed here. They retraced their steps to one of the guild's hidden tunnels, this one behind a meat market. The stench of offal gagged him, but it kept the curious away. Xander held the trapdoor open for Kaylin, then followed her down. They made their way down the tunnel by the light of Kalin's glowstone. He hoped everyone else's jobs went as smooth as theirs. At the end of the tunnel, a pair of nervous guards pointed crossbows at them. 
What's the password? Rats in the dark, Sanders said. Their fingers tightened on the crossbow triggers. What? Rats in the dark, Kalen said. The guards lowered their weapons and motioned them through. Xander shook his head. He'd never seen the guards so jumpy. When they got upstairs, the night boss was pacing behind the counter in the entry hall. He stopped to take the satchel from Kalen. Any trouble? No, Xander said. The most dangerous part was getting past our guards. You better calm them down before they shoot one of our people by mistake. We don't want to do the killer's job for him. I'll send Craven down to talk to them. Has anyone else gotten back yet? Galen asked. The night boss shook his head. You two are the first. They left the night boss to his pacing and returned to their room. Despite the rest he'd gotten earlier, Xander was tired. When they reached the door, he said, I'm beat. Kaylin looked away, her mind somewhere else. I'm going to stay up for a while, see who comes in. Xander nodded and put a reassuring hand on her shoulder. When Xander woke, he found no sign of Kaylin. He dressed and headed toward the dining room, hoping to find her, or at least find breakfast. Sure enough, he found Kaylin curled up in the corner half asleep. Thieves packed the dining hall. There were as many thieves there now as when the master spoke the day before. Xander wondered if anyone else got any sleep last night. Jaden sat near Kaylin and Xander went over to join them. Has she been here all night? The thief started, as though he'd been on the verge of sleep. Since I got back in at least, there's a team still out. They're way overdue. Xander nodded, his expression grim. I'll take her to bed. He scooped Kaylin up, ignoring her murmur of protest. If you're going to sleep, you might as well do it in a real bed. He carried her back to their room, laid her on the mattress and covered her up. He looked down at her and smiled. Xander closed the door and returned to the dining hall. A table near Jaden had emptied, so he sat down. Who's still out? Cohen and Alana. I haven't met all the thieves. Who was their enforcer? Dane, Jaden said. They were making the rounds of our gambling houses. It wasn't a risky job. Yeah, and Dane knew it. I doubted he was paying attention. Xander got up and collected his breakfast, grits and sausage today. He ate in silence, Jaden a near unconscious presence beside him. Xander shook his head, damned if he was carrying Jaden to bed. When he finished, he went upstairs to work out. Jared was sleeping on the training mat, so Xander got a weighted training sword and began the movements of a basic training routine as quiet as possible. Jared's eyes popped open. I should have known it was you. No one else is crazy enough to train with everything that's going on. Why don't you get some breakfast? The sausage is edible today. The old man grunted and Xander helped him to his feet. I'll do that. Doesn't look like I'm going to get any sleep. Xander grinned at the old man's back and swung the sword again. He was halfway through his routine when Craven entered. Xander stopped, hoping to do a little sparring. Craven saw the look on his face and raised a hand. I'm not here to train. We got word our missing team was found dead. The same message written nearby. Worse, the killer took a large amount of gold. Something has to be done. The reason for Craven's visit became clear to Xander. Do you have a plan? The guildmaster has suspended all activities until the killer is dealt with. I'm open to suggestions on how. Xander smiled an evil smile. I've thought about it, and I have an idea. I don't know if it will pass muster with the master. Tell me. Anything would be better than what we've been doing, which is nothing. It's not complicated. You should send out a team, same as any knight. I'll follow along behind, and when the killer shows up, I'll cut him down. That's it? What if the killer doesn't show? Then the team finishes their work, none the worse for the walk. At least some work would get done. Don't you think the killer might suspect a trap? Craven asked. Sanders snorted. You think someone crazy or arrogant enough to think he can take down the guild on his own will hesitate because it might be a trap? Craven nodded. 
Good point. I'll talk to the bosses and ask for volunteers. Better send the ones you are least afraid to lose. If I fail, they won't last long. One more thing. Don't send Kaylin. I'll be better off if I know she's safe. Craven left to talk to the bosses and Xander returned to his workout. When he finished, he went down to his room. Kaylin's eyes opened the moment he stepped inside. The late team? They were found this morning, like the others. Kaylin closed her eyes. Something has to be done. Something's going to be done, assuming the bosses agree. Her eyes snapped open and she sat up. The bosses are sending you? Xander nodded. A team will go out tonight. I'll follow along behind and take the killer from behind. You make it sound easy. If the killer is skilled enough to take out a whole team, what chance will you have on your own? Xander smiled without humor. No offense to the rest of the men, but I could take out one of those teams if I wanted to. They aren't that good compared to a real swordsman. I can do this. I have to, or the guild will fall apart. I'm the best. He said it without arrogance, but as a simple statement. If I can't do it, we're finished. I don't want you to get hurt. Me either. But no one will be safe until this is taken care of. So I'm going to take care of it. Xander climbed out of the secret tunnel and pushed aside the crates hiding it from view. He was in the warehouse district and the team was already on the street. He had to go north from the tunnel and pick them up as they made their rounds. When he'd returned the screen of crates to their proper position, he angled north and made his way through the dark city, fast and silent, ears straining for any sign of pursuit. He rounded a corner and spotted the rest of the group a hundred yards ahead. He needed to keep his distance, so he stopped and let them get a little further ahead. While they moved away, he considered the best way to keep an eye on them. Xander looked up at the flat warehouse roofs 15 feet above him and grinned. The buildings were 10 feet apart. He could jump that easily. From up high, he could keep watch, ready to leap down on the killer when he showed himself. A pile of crates sat beside one of the warehouses and Xander climbed it, jumped up, grabbed the edge of the roof and pulled himself up and over. He jogged to the far side of the roof where he watched the team. Hakim strutted in the lead. Xander assumed the bosses sent him as a test of some sort. Tempting as it was to wander off and let the killer get his revenge for him, Xander had no quarrel with the other members of the group and they'd die as well. The team moved out of sight so he leapt to the next roof and ran a little ways to catch up. Xander frowned. The attack should have come by now. Something creaked behind him. Xander spun and drew his sword in the same motion. He caught a glint of metal in the moonlight and batted aside a thrown dagger. The man that threw the dagger stood behind him. He wore a long, thin sword at his waist which he drew when his first attack failed. Xander advanced, not wanting to meet his opponent so close to the edge of the roof. He studied the killer as he approached. The man had a slim, athletic build, a shaved head, and dark beard. He carried a rapier, not a weapon popular in the city. He had to be an outlander. I was told the finest swordsman in the guild waited to kill me tonight. His voice was deep and rich like a singer. Imagine my disappointment when I find a half-grown child instead. Xander smiled at the vain attempt to anger him. He had moved so far past caring what anyone thought the word slid right off. I get that a lot. His harsh whisper sounded the polar opposite of his opponent's fine voice. I suppose no one expects to get killed by someone my age. I certainly don't. The killer advanced to meet Xander in the center of the roof. The killer cocked his arm, telegraphing the lunge that followed. Xander parried it and counter-slashed at his opponent's eyes. The man jerked his head back in time to avoid getting blinded. After the initial clash, their blows came at a lightning pace, the night showered by the sparks of their clashing swords. Xander fought on pure instinct. His opponent moved so fast if he tried to think he'd be killed. After a furious exchange, the killer bound Xander's sword with his own. They leaned together, fighting for position. When the man made a final big push, Xander didn't resist. 
He spun to the right, and the killer staggered past. Before he recovered, Xander slashed him across the back, a deep six-inch gash that bled bright red. First blood to me. Xander held his blade ready to accept his opponent's next attack. The killer snarled, both in pain and anger. He came at Xander again, but his movements had slowed. Where before it had taken all Xander's skill to survive, now he found the blows easy to dodge or block aside. Xander dodged left and his foot caught on a twisted up board. He staggered and fell to the roof. The killer lunged, trying to finish him. Desperate, Xander rolled to the side, avoiding a killing blow but taking a slash to the ribs. He grimaced and kicked the killer's left knee. Bone and cartilage crunched and his opponent crashed to the roof. Xander rolled back, pinning the killer's sword arm under his knee. He put his sword to his opponent's throat. Who told you I'd be here? Go to hell, the killer spat at him. Xander pressed his blade harder against the man's throat, enough to draw blood. Who? The killer screamed, sat up, and then wrenched himself to the side, cutting his own throat. Shaken, Xander got to his feet. Who could do that to themselves? Xander grimaced. The cut to his ribs was long, but shallow. He'd live, but he wouldn't be working out anytime soon. He walked to the roof's edge and found the team staring at him. They must have heard the fight. Anyone got a rope? he asked. One of the young thieves, Xander had never met the boy before tonight and didn't remember his name, took a silk rope with a grapple out of his shoulder bag. With an expert toss, he threw it up on the roof a couple feet from where Xander stood. Xander hooked it tight, eased himself over the side and climbed down. When he hit the ground, he grimaced as a spasm of pain shot through him. You're hurt, the boy said. It's just a scratch. Xander clenched his teeth against the pain. Hakim stared at him, arms crossed over his great belly. When they told me you would be our protection tonight, I thought I was as good as dead. I guess you've decided to let bygones be bygones. Xander glared at him through pain-narrowed eyes. No one will kill you but me. When the day comes, I'll be the last thing you see. Now let's get out of here. He led the way down the streets, followed by the silent thieves. His threat had unnerved them, but his ribs hurt too much for him to care. It couldn't have come as a surprise. Everyone in the guild knew how he felt about Hakim. If he could have gotten the fat man alone, he would have cut his throat tonight, but the opportunity never came up. When they got back, they found both bosses and Craven, pacing like a caged animal, waiting in the entry room. Well... All three demanded at once. It's done. Sander winced and grabbed his ribs. Craven, can you help me to my room? The walk back took more out of me than I thought. Of course. Craven slung one of Xander's arms over his shoulder and they made their careful way out of the room. When they'd gone beyond earshot, Xander said, Someone set me up. The killer knew I would be there. If he'd been a little less arrogant and brought a friend, I'd be dead. Are you sure? He said as much before we fought. He seemed confident of winning, so I can't imagine he'd lie. I didn't want to say anything in front of the others, since I'm pretty sure one of them is the leak. You think it's one of the bosses? One of them or one of the team members. What about me? Craven asked. I could have set you up as easily as one of them. Yeah, Xander said, but I had to tell someone, and you seemed the most trustworthy for a thief. Craven smiled. Of course. It couldn't have been any of the team members. They didn't know they were going until a couple hours before they left. It had to be one of the bosses. What about the guildmaster? We didn't have time to contact him before you went out, which is just as well since I must contact him now without the bosses finding out so he can force them to take a truth potion. They stopped in front of the door to Xander's room. Kaelin must have heard them because the door opened at once. You're hurt. It's just a scratch. Kaelin shooed Craven away. Before he left, he said, I'll let you know when I learn something. Xander nodded and Kaelin helped him inside.
Xander's side had healed for the most part when Craven came to see him three weeks after the battle. He sat up in bed when Craven entered, wincing a little. How did it go? We finished the interrogations yesterday. The night boss masterminded the whole thing. The killer wasn't a vigilante, just a mercenary the night boss hired to kill those thieves that wouldn't pledge themselves to him. We dealt with him yesterday. What took so long? The guildmaster isn't an easy man to get a hold of. I got a message to him last week, then we had to figure out who we could trust before we grabbed the bosses. The master must be pleased. That it's been dealt with, certainly. In fact, there's going to be an announcement tonight. Do you think you're up to attending? This concerns you most of all. Xander frowned. Announcements were seldom a good thing. I'm fine. A little sore, maybe. What's going on? I've recommended you for membership in an elite group of assassins. The Shadow Hand are the most feared assassins in the world. None but the best make it through their training. Back up. Xander didn't understand what was happening. Why would I want to be an assassin? And how is it you can make such a recommendation? I'm a member of the Shadow Hand assigned to scout for talent. I don't mind killing a man in a fight, but it turns out I don't have it in me to run someone through from behind. So instead of an assassin, I became a scout. You're the first person in this city I found worth sending back to the Hand. They send a courier to fetch you if you're willing to join. What do I get? Xander asked. Aside from the wealth that comes from working as a top-tier assassin, you'll eventually get access to a worldwide group of agents like me. What better way to discover who killed your family? Xander smiled. With a sales talk like that, you should have been a merchant. What do I have to do? Nothing. When the courier asks if you want to join, say yes and be ready to go. You'll leave at once. I'll be ready. Craven took his leave and Xander sat on the edge of his bed, musing on what he'd agreed to. He wasn't sure if joining a group of assassins was the right move, but if they could do what Craven promised, it made the risk worth taking. The only thing that made the decision hard was leaving Kalen behind. The door opened and Kalen entered. I saw Craven leaving. Is everything okay? Xander nodded and patted the bed beside him. She sat. I'm leaving this afternoon to join a new guild. An assassin's guild. Craven recommended me. Why? Kaylin trembled and Xander said a silent prayer that she wouldn't cry. The guild has spies like Craven all over the world. I'll have a chance to learn who killed my family. I can't let this chance pass. I can't. She hugged him and whispered in his ear. I know, but I'll miss you. Xander kissed her on the cheek. I'll miss you too. If you need to get a hold of me, Craven can help you. The two of them walked to the dining hall. Most of the guild had gathered as word of the meeting spread. Craven and the day boss stood on a rough built platform in the rear of the hall. Craven caught his eye and motioned him up. Xander gave Kaylin's shoulder one last squeeze and went to join Craven. Said all your goodbyes? Xander nodded. Keep an eye on her for me. I will. Thanks. How long is this stupid ceremony supposed to last? Not long once everyone gets here. Fifteen minutes at most. It's a waste of time. I always hated this sort of thing. I couldn't have said it better myself. Craven grinned. Still, you're the first member of the guild to be asked to join, and the master wants to make a big deal of it. Well, he's the boss, for a little longer at least. The hall was near three quarters full. It wouldn't be much longer. A few minutes later, the robed guild master arrived along with a whip-thin man, his face also hidden by a deep cowl. It looked like no one wanted their face seen, not that Xander could comment with his mask. The guildmaster and courier joined Xander, Craven, and the day boss on the platform. The guildmaster raised his hands and the room fell silent. My friends, one of our own has been selected for a great honor. He beckoned Xander forward. Swallowing a sigh, Xander went to stand beside the master. 
Xander has been chosen to join the Shadow Hand Assassin's Guild, the first member of our guild so honored. A smattering of polite applause followed the announcement, more for the master's sake than Xander's. He hadn't made many friends during his time in the guild. Do you join the Shadow Hand of your own free will? The courier asked. When I join, will I still be considered a member of the guild? No, your sole allegiance will be to the Shadow Hand. In that case, I join with pleasure. The courier nodded and handed a heavy-looking sack to the master. With grandfather's thanks. The guildmaster hefted the sack, seeming well pleased with the weight. The courier turned to Xander. Are you ready? I have one more thing to take care of. He scanned the room and soon spotted Hakim. The fat thief must have felt the eyes of death on him because he turned and started for the nearest door. He managed two steps before Xander leapt on him from behind and drove his sword clean through him, pinning him to the floor like a bug. Hakim howled in pain. Xander leaned in and whispered, You didn't think I'd leave without saying goodbye. No. The word came out so weak Xander almost missed it. Sander reached into his pocket and drew the curved knife he'd taken from Hakim's friend the first time they met. He hacked into the fat man's neck, once, twice. On the third strike, Hakim's head rolled free. Xander's hands dripped blood, and he cleaned them along with his knife and sword on Hakim's back. At last, he'd avenged Sophia. Now I'm ready. Xander walked through the stunned thieves and joined the courier who stood at the edge of the platform. Without a word, the courier led the way through the hall and outside where a pair of black geldings waited, saddled and ready to go. They mounted up and rode out of the city heading south. They rode the rest of the day, and when darkness fell, the courier led them off the road a few hundred yards until they reached a level spot clear of the scrub that grew all along the road. Once they dismounted and looked after the horses, the courier took a fist-sized sphere out of his saddlebag, along with a metal rod. He set the sphere on a dirt path and struck it with the rod. The sphere burst into flame. The courier replaced the rod and returned with a satchel and water skin. Xander helped himself to a couple strips of dried meat from the satchel. Sorry about what happened in the dining hall. I couldn't leave while he still drew breath. Don't apologize. I found your display heartening. It showed a level of mercilessness you need for this job. All our prospects say they have it, but when it comes down to it, most don't. I didn't. That's why I'm a courier rather than a killer. The way I see it, Sander said, swallowing a piece of meat, I'm just speeding along the natural process. Everyone dies. The courier glanced at him. You consider cutting a man's head off a natural death? Sure, if you cut someone's head off, it's only natural they die. The courier laughed. Get some sleep. We ride at first light. The two men rode for three days before reaching a small port town whose name Xander didn't know and his guide didn't offer. The courier offered little conversation or information. Hell, he hadn't told Xander his name. As they rode through the town, the people went out of their way to avoid them some even crossing the street to get further away. Sander smiled at the reaction. The two of them must have made a grim pair. They reached the docks and the courier led them to a ship with two masts and black sails. What struck Sander most was where another ship might have a mermaid figurehead. This ship sported a grim reaper. Sander dismounted. Nice ship, the courier smiled. It discourages pirates. They left the horses on the dock and boarded the ship. A man with a great barrel chest Xander assumed to be the captain met them at the top of the gangplank. The courier shook hands with the captain. Your cabin is ready and we can sail with the tide. The courier nodded and walked across the deck toward a set of stairs leading down. Xander paused a moment to offer the captain his hand, which the captain ignored. He shrugged and hurried after his guide. Not very friendly. No, Captain Corrin is many things, but friendly isn't among them. They went below deck, and the courier opened the first door they came to. 
Inside, they found a nice-sized cabin with two hammocks and a dresser bolted to the floor. Well, I'd always been told sea travel was cramped and uncomfortable. This isn't bad at all. If this were a standard merchant ship, you'd be right about the lack of space. But this ship's sole purpose is to transport guild members wherever they need to go. Space devoted to cargo is instead given over to large cabins. So how far are we going? The courier stretched out in one of the hammocks. The trip should take about three weeks, depending on the wind. You may as well make yourself comfortable. There isn't much to do aboard ship. Two days out of port and Xander started going crazy. He paced in the cabin he shared with his guide. They'd been traveling for almost a week, and the man still hadn't offered Xander his name. He couldn't stand it anymore. I'm going up on deck. Make sure you stay out of the way. Sailors can get rough. Eager now, Xander left the cabin and scampered up on deck. The fresh sea air smelled wonderful, and the spray cooled his face. Sailors swore and hauled on ropes to what purpose Xander had no clue. He found an empty place in the front out of everyone's way where he could exercise. Xander set his sword to one side and stretched. He had no trouble compensating for the rolling of the ship. He worked his upper body, then his legs. A group of sailors had gathered to watch, and Xander wondered how long he'd have to wait for the inevitable fool. Less than a minute, as it turned out. Xander eased down into a split. One of the sailors approached, a great brute of a man covered in tattoos. Xander laid his hands on the deck and pressed up into a handstand, then rolled to his feet. Good morning, he offered a polite smile. Boy, why are we wasting our time taking a runt like you to the mountain? I ought to drown you now and save the masters a lot of time. You are welcome to try. Xander's smile never wavered. Nothing like pounding a dumb sailor to liven up a boring trip. Xander slipped a punch so badly telegraphed they must have seen it coming back on shore. Too slow. The furious sailor launched a barrage of punches, any of which would have put Xander down for a long time. Unfortunately for the big sailor, none of his blows came close to landing. It was like an elephant trying to catch a mongoose. Xander spun, ducked, and dodged before slipping behind his opponent and slapping him across the back of the head. Come on, gruesome. Try to keep up. The other sailors had gathered and they cheered their champion on. The sailor spun with a backhand that Xander ducked under. His opponent wheezed like a leaky bellows and Xander got bored again. I think you should give up now. Getting tired, boy, the sailor said between wheezing breaths. No, bored. If you don't surrender, I'll have to end this contest, and I promise it will be more pleasant for you if you give up now. The day I give up to a whelp like you is the day I leave this ship and take up farming. The other sailors cheered this pronouncement, and his opponent launched a straight right at Xander's head. He let the punch come close enough that the hair on the sailor's arm brushed his cheek. Xander spun and in one motion drew the curved knife from his pocket sheath. He came up behind the sailor and laid the blade against his throat. The man's pulse thrummed against the edge of his blade. Sure you don't want to give up? Xander whispered in his ear. The crowd grew silent, waiting to hear their champion's answer. After the silence stretched to an uncomfortable length, the sailor said, I surrender. Wise decision. Xander sheathed his knife and collected his sword. If anybody else wants to dance, I'll be back to exercise again tomorrow. The courier waited for him at the top of the steps. Quite a show. I was bored. That's never been a good thing for me. Besides, if I'm going to be of any use when we arrive, I need to stay in shape. Did you have to embarrass him that bad? Sailors have a lot of pride. He didn't seem concerned about embarrassing me. Xander brushed past his guide and went down to their room. Xander exercised in peace for the rest of the trip. Three weeks and two days after they set sail, they docked at a large city. Xander went down the boarding ramp with his guide. They found a young man holding the reins of two black horses that could have been the twins of the two they rode from Arbata. Where to now? Xander asked. The courier pointed to the highest mountain in a nearby range. Assassin Mountain.
Chapter 24 They rode through the bustling city at a quick trot. Xander didn't have a chance to get a feel for the place. Since they were bound for the mountain, it didn't matter. Soon they rode out the massive stone gate and turned toward the mountains. Xander put the city out of his mind. Maybe he'd have time to explore it later. He followed his guide through a sparse scrub plain and up into the foothills. The courier led him up a well-worn horse trail that twisted even higher into the mountains. Before the mountains went near vertical, they came to a wide plateau. A large fenced-in area served as a corral for a dozen black horses that looked like relatives of the ones they rode. Next to the corral sat a small cabin with smoke coming out its chimney. Hot as it was, Xander failed to imagine who would want more heat. Whoever it was must have had his eye out for them, as the moment they approached, the door opened and a gray-bearded man, seventy years old if he was a day, hobbled out to take the reins of their horses. The courier nodded to the old man and they dismounted. The courier walked over to a sheer granite face and slammed his fist against the stone twice. A hidden door swung open. Xander leapt back and reached for his sword. The door blended so well he hadn't spotted a seam. Behind the door stood a grim, broad-shouldered man with a four-foot-long sword strapped to his back. He nodded to the courier and ignored Xander. The guard stepped aside, and they entered the tunnel. The tunnel wasn't like any tunnel Xander had ever heard of. Rich, golden wood covered the walls and floor. It resembled a hall in a noble's estate more than a mountain tunnel. As they walked, the hall sloped up a little. Every twenty feet, a glowstone lantern provided a bright, cheerful glow. For the home of the most feared assassins in the world, the place wasn't intimidating. Xander wondered who decorated the place. At the end of the hall, they arrived at another door, a simple wood-paneled one that would have been at home in any house in the world, except this one. The courier knocked and a guard that could have been cousins with the first one opened up. Courier and guard exchanged nods and they continued on their way. Behind the door, they came to a foyer with a marble-topped desk and half a dozen soft chairs. A plain woman of middle years manned the desk. She wore the bored expression of receptionists the world over. The courier took pity on his ignorance. When someone wants to hire us, they wait here for a chance to talk. Xander's guide waved to the woman behind the desk and led him out one of the two doors leading deeper into the mountain. So where are we going? The Grand Hall. Other hopefuls have gathered to meet with the mistress of candidates. Now that you're here, this year's batch of twelve candidates is complete. A word of warning, the mistress can get a little harsh, so mind your temper. Thanks for the warning. How much further? They stopped before a black wood door. Right through there. Good luck. The courier pushed the door open and they stepped into a huge room with a high domed ceiling. A thin gray carpet covered the floor. Eleven people... Nine men and two women stood in a circle around a scowling woman dressed all in black. The mistress of candidates, he suspected. His guide went to speak with the mistress while Xander took the chance to study his fellow candidates. The first thing that struck him was the range of ages. He'd assumed most of them would be young, but they ran the gamut from his age to one gray-bearded man that looked to be his father's age if he'd lived. They all had one thing in common, a hardness in the eye. They'd seen too much of the world and little of it good. Xander knew those eyes. They stared back at him in the mirror every morning. The courier finished his conversation and left by the same door. He didn't spare Xander a second look. You, come here, the mistress called him over. Xander stepped into the circle and bowed. Yes, ma'am. It's about time you got here. We've been awaiting your arrival for a week. What do you have to say for yourself? Xander had no idea what the woman expected him to say. I didn't know I was holding you up. And? And what? Xander kept his tone polite, but his annoyance was growing by the word. Aren't you going to apologize? Xander's eyes narrowed, but he held his temper. A week ago, I was on a ship in the middle of the sea. I couldn't get here any faster than I did, and I don't intend to apologize. The mistress's face got red and she sputtered something he couldn't make out. When she got herself under control, she pointed to a spot between a man in his twenties wearing a crimson waist cape and a plumed hat and the younger of the two women. Just take your place. 
Xander did as she bid, and out of the corner of his eye he saw a hint of a smile on her face. Either he'd passed some sort of test, or the woman had lost her mind. When Xander stood in his place, the woman beckoned to the shadows, and a pair of men dressed in black emerged. He hadn't noticed them standing there. The candidates will be divided into three groups of four. One team will answer to me. Each of the others will answer to one of these men. She nodded toward the new arrivals, then pointed to the younger man. Soren, you may choose first. Soren gave them all a cursory glance, then pointed to the woman to his left. You, he pointed at Xander and the two men to his right. You three as well. Soren stepped out of the circle and Xander and the others followed. They hadn't taken three steps when a young man entered the hall. The mistress spotted him. You there, how dare you interrupt? The unfortunate young man scurried over and handed her a note. He flinched when she snatched it out of his hand. She read it, then turned and glared at Xander. Now what had he done to upset the woman? Grandfather wants to see you, the mistress said. The messenger will show you the way. Xander turned to his controller and raised an eyebrow. Grandfather is our guildmaster, Soren said. You'd best not keep him waiting. I will show the others to their quarters. You'll be in East Dorm Room 1. Yes, sir. Xander followed the messenger back the way he'd come. They walked down the hall and Xander asked, Why does Grandfather want to see me? The messenger looked back at him. I haven't the slightest idea. No one tells me anything. I just deliver messages. Xander nodded, not expecting anything else. So far, he'd annoyed the mistress of candidates and gotten called to the guildmaster's presence. He hadn't even been in the mountain for an hour. They turned down a short connecting hall and stopped before a black door carved with a death's head design. This must be it, Xander said. The messenger nodded and rapped on the door. Enter. A voice from behind the door said. I'll wait here until you're done, the messenger said. East Dorm is on the other side of the mountain, and you'll get lost if I don't show you the way. Thanks. Xander pushed the grim door open and stepped through. The master's chambers were lit with scores of black candles. Black silk hung from the ceiling, and seated on a cushion, surrounded by pillows in the center of the room, was the most wrinkled man Xander had ever seen. Come here, the ancient figure said. Xander wondered if Grandfather was some sort of undead creature. He hesitated a moment, then sat down in front of the guildmaster. Sir? A smile pulled his wrinkles tight. Call me Grandfather. Yes, Grandfather, the old man chuckled. I expect you're wondering why you're here. You and everyone else that knows I sent for you. The question crossed my mind. I won't keep you in suspense. The fellow that recommended you is my great nephew. He's been an evaluator for five years, and you're the first candidate he sent to us. That alone would pique my curiosity. But combined with the detailed report of your personal history, I became enchanted. I can scarcely remember a candidate with a more unfortunate past. Is it true you joined us so you could use our resources to find your family's killer? Yes, Grandfather. The old man laughed again. I appreciate your honesty. Take this. Grandfather picked up a black box that blended so well with the cushion Xander hadn't seen it sitting there. Xander accepted the box and offered a seated bow. Thank you, sir. Well, don't sit there looking at it. Open it up. Xander did as instructed and inside found a mask that appeared identical to his own save that the eye hole was covered with a clear lens made of crystal. Beside the mask rested a vial filled with a viscous red liquid. If you smear a thin layer of the liquid on the lens, it will allow you to see in the dark until it dries. A useful trick for someone in your new line of work. I'll do my best to use it wisely. And I'll keep my eye on you. Craven has excellent instincts 
and if he saw something special in you, I expect you'll do well. Sensing a dismissal, Xander got up and bowed again. Thank you, Grandfather. The old man smiled and waved him off. Xander left the dark room and found the messenger waiting outside, a look of trepidation on his face. How'd it go? Very well. He even gave me a gift. Xander held up the box for the young man's inspection. Wow. I know. Now, aren't you supposed to show me to my quarters? Number one in the East Dorm. Sure. East Dorm, follow me. They walked through the mountain at a brisk pace. Once in a while, the messenger would pause and point out a mark hidden in the grain of the wood that allowed those who knew how to read them to find their way anywhere in the mountain. It would take practice, but Xander felt sure he'd learn his way around. This is East Dorm. The messenger pointed to a hall lined with numbered doors. Thanks. His guide trotted off on his way to his next job. Xander found the door to room one unlocked and stepped inside. Sitting on one of two bunks was the fop from earlier. Looks like we're roommates, he said. Xander nodded and gave the room a quick once over. There wasn't much to see. The two bunks, footlockers for each of them, and a bed stand apiece. Dismal, isn't it? I didn't expect luxury, but I figured we'd at least get our own rooms. I've seen worse. Xander thought back to the three months he'd spent living in an eight-by-eight cage. The face his roommate made suggested he couldn't think of anything much worse. My name's Alan. The others are waiting in the lounge. Since we're roommates, they had me wait here to show you the way. He held out his hand. Xander. He shook the man's hand and found his grip firm. If they're waiting, we should go. Right you are. The lounge is nicer than this, at least. Xander followed Alan out of their room and up the hall. Soren says we're going on our first mission tomorrow. They walked a little ways, then turned into a side hall that opened into a room filled with tables and soft chairs. Xander recognized some of the group's members sitting together. What about training? The missions are our training. From what I understand, the missions start out simple and get harder as we go along. There they are. Alan spotted their group and led Xander over to a table near the back wall. Before settling into one of the soft chairs, Alan said, Allow me to introduce Annika and Olin. Guys, this is Xander, our fourth. Xander nodded to them and sat down on Annika's left. So what's with the mask? she asked. Rather than answer, Xander lifted the mask off, revealing the mass of scars underneath. The others winced and looked away. I fought a burning timber and lost. He settled the mask back in place. Does it still hurt? Annika reached for his mask. Xander grabbed her wrist before she could touch him. Only when I remember how I got it. Now how about we interrogate someone else? I know, Alan said. Let's go around the table and say how we got chosen. Xander closed his eyes and sighed. The fool was entirely too happy for someone in this line of work. They all looked at Xander, but he'd had enough of answering questions and just glared back. A moment of uncomfortable silence passed before Alan said, My specialty is seducing old ladies and poisoning them for their wealth. I was so good at it, one of the hand scouts recommended me to the guild. Xander felt sick, but held his tongue. I was a bounty hunter, Olin said. Bring them back dead or alive. I brought back so many dead I caught the eye of a scout and here I am. My father was an assassin, Annika said. Xander found the woman a remarkable contrast. At first glance, a beautiful woman with long silky black hair and curves in all the right places. Yet a closer look revealed flat, emotionless eyes so brown they almost looked black, like a shark. He could imagine her cutting a man's throat without a blink. Father spent most of his life as a mid-rank slayer. He trained me, and I hope to one day surpass him and join the ranks of the elite, perhaps even the Council of Eight. Xander smiled a humorless smile when he thought what his father would have said about his new profession. Or his old one, for that matter. The others all looked at him. I was a thieves' guild enforcer. 
Craven, the man who recruited me thought I was good enough with the sword to deserve a shot at being an assassin. Olin chuckled. Enforcer, you ain't big enough for the job, boy. I seen my share of enforcers and they were all burly guys. You said the man that recruited you was named Craven, Annika said. I know that name. He's grandfather's great nephew. Her eyes widened. Blade Master Craven? His skill with the sword is legend. He was the last member of the hand to gain the title. It didn't surprise Xander to learn Craven's skill was a legend. He trained me for months before I could take him one on one. You bested a blade master. The incredulity in Annika's voice set his teeth on edge. In a sparring match, but yes, I beat him. If you doubt me, I'd be happy to give you a demonstration. This place must have a training room. Hey, we're supposed to be a team, remember? Alan said. Xander shrugged. He'd said all he intended to. He listened to the others for the better part of an hour before the weeks of travel caught up to him. Xander yawned and got up. If we're going on our first mission tomorrow, we'd best get some sleep. Good evening. Xander returned to his room and opened the empty footlocker. He had next to nothing in the way of gear, so he put his old mask in the locker so it wouldn't be empty, then undressed and leaned his sword next to the bed where it would be handy. He slipped his fine dagger under his pillow, crawled into bed, and went to sleep. High Sun found Xander and the team riding well north of the city. Early that morning, Soren had gathered them together and explained the mission. It was a straightforward assassination. A group of bandits had taken to raiding the trade routes leading to the city under the mountain. The city council had dispatched a messenger requesting the bandit leader be dealt with as a warning to the rest. Grandfather had been happy to help. Shadowhand scouts had located the band and determined the group made a regular stop at a village 20 miles from the mountain. They were due to arrive today. Soren had laid all this information at the team's feet with the simple order to kill the leader. He didn't care how or how many others they killed as long as the leader died. They received directions to the village and a detailed drawing of the target. They rode at an easy pace, intending to arrive at the village around dusk. Olin pointed to a creek flowing near the road and guided his horse toward it. Xander and the others joined him and dismounted. The horses drank and nibbled the grass along the bank while their riders took food from the saddlebags and sat down for lunch. They ate in silence for a couple minutes before Olin said, I suppose we should make a plan. The others nodded, but Xander kept eating. Perhaps I could charm one of the serving girls to slip poison into his food, Alan said. Too many things could go wrong. Olin spoke around a mouthful of food. I figure we should wait till morning, and when he comes out, I'll put a quarrel through him and we'll be on our way. Annika shook her head. Tradition demands one of us sneak into the inn and cut his throat while he sleeps. That technique has been used by generations of assassins. Xander smiled as he listened to them argue that each of them had the best plan. Alan noticed his amusement. What's so funny? You haven't even offered a suggestion. Xander took a pull from his water skin. There's no point in making a plan. We have to have a plan, Annika said. We can't rush in with no idea what we're going to do. If you'd let me finish, I was going to say there's no point making a plan yet. We need to see the lay of the land, what the inn looks like, how many men we need to get past and a bunch of other things I don't know yet. What's the town called again? Rocky Knob, Alan said. Right, we get there, scout around, and then make a plan. Who put you in charge, boy? Olin asked. I lay no claim to being in charge. I stated the facts and made a suggestion. If you don't like it, make whatever plans you want. Xander lay back on the grass and closed his eyes. Ten minutes later found the group back on the road and Olin grumbling. They made no plan after Xander spoke and he'd seemed displeased. Alan rode up beside him. You know more about strategy than I'd expect from a thieves' guild enforcer. 
Xander glanced at him, trying to make up his mind whether he should take offense, and decided he didn't care enough about what Alan thought to get offended. My father held the rank of knight commander before he was killed. He taught my brother and me how to fight and how to think. Most wars are won before the first battle is fought. This isn't a war. Wrong. All life is a war on one scale or another. Take an old married couple. Are you going to tell me two people married for fifty years aren't at war? Xander grinned. In this little war we have one big advantage. What's that? Alan asked. The enemy doesn't know the battle is about to start. They reached the outskirts of the village at sunset. Not far off the road, they found a clump of trees and tied up the horses. The group walked into town and down the main and solitary street. On the right-hand side, three quarters of the way into town stood a large building with a couple dozen horses tied up out front. That had to be the inn. I'll check it out, Alan said. Xander nodded, and when no one else objected, he walked up to the door like he owned the place, ignoring the two large men standing beside it. Xander and the others continued down the street. He turned to Olin. See any good hiding places? The older man nodded. I see a couple. The town wasn't large, and they soon reached the far end. A middle-aged man in a peasant smock came out of a shack at the edge of town. Xander walked up to him. Excuse me, sir. Could you tell me where three weary travelers might find a room for the night? The peasant coughed and spat. You've picked a poor night to visit. Town's got but one in and she's full up. I feared as much when I saw the horses. Perhaps we can find a spot on the common room floor. It would be warm if nothing else. The villager looked around quickly. I wouldn't recommend it, son. Rough crew over there tonight. I see. Thanks for the warning. Xander flipped the villager a copper penny. The man caught it and stomped back into his hovel. That all but confirms it. Let's find Alan and make our plan. They walked back up the street and Alan ran over to join them when they passed the inn. The four of them continued on to the horses. How'd it look? Annika asked. Two guards at the front and two more at the rear. They looked bored but alert. Xander raised an eyebrow. Any ideas? All three argued for the exact same plans they had that morning. Xander listened for a few minutes before losing his temper. Enough! They fell silent and looked at him. We're supposed to be a team, remember? Here's what we'll do. Olin, you hide in one of the spots you mentioned and watch the front. Annika and I will go to the back door and take out the guards. I'll go in and eliminate the target while she watches the back. Alan, you stay here. If he gets past us, you are our last chance to finish the job. I thought you didn't want to be in charge, Olin said. I don't, but since you three want to argue, I guess the job falls to me. Now let's go. Xander walked toward the inn, not caring if the others followed or not. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Olin sneak into position across from the inn. They were following along after all. Annika hurried to catch up to him, and the two of them kept their distance as they eased around to the back of the inn. Like Alan said, two guards stood beside the back door. A torch burned beside them. Looking from the light into the dark would ruin their night vision. Xander leaned in close to Annika and noticed the faint scent of jasmine. Let's sneak around to the other side and make sure no one else is keeping watch. He could just make out her nod, and they slipped silent as mice to the far side of the rear of the inn. They found no other guards. Xander picked up a pebble. I'm going to take them. He flipped the pebble over the guards' heads so it clattered on the ground opposite from where the assassins crouched. When the guards looked toward the sound, Xander charged, drawing his sword as he went. The nearest guard looked back in time to get his throat cut. Xander reversed his grip on his sword and rammed through the second guard's ribs, piercing both lungs. When the guard tried to shout an alarm, all that came out was a bloody bubble. Xander ripped the blade free and drove it into the guard's chest as he tried to reach for the door. With the two guards down, he looked back toward Annika. 
She'd come out of her hiding place and stood at the edge of the torchlight staring at him, mouth agape. He cleaned his sword and sheathed it. She was still staring at him. Xander frowned and snapped his fingers in front of her face a couple times. You want to focus? We've still got work to do. Sorry, Annika shook her head. I've never seen anyone move that fast. Be grateful. If you had, you'd probably be dead. I'm going in. If you hear a brawl, get ready. The target will most likely try to escape out this door. I'll be ready. Xander nodded and opened the door. He slipped inside in a hurry so none of the staff would see the bodies. He needn't have worried. There was only one harried cook in the kitchen and he was focused on a stove covered with six bubbling pots. He never registered Xander's entrance. Happy to leave him in ignorance, Xander went through the door connecting the kitchen to the common room. Noise and the stink of spilled ale and vomit assaulted him when he stepped through the door. A pair of drummers pounded out a drinking song, and better than two score voices sang with more enthusiasm than talent. Xander shook his head. It looked like the ale flowed freely. He threaded his way through the room unnoticed or ignored by the drunken bandits. He spotted the leader in a booth at the rear of the common room, a buxom blonde beside him. The thick black beard and missing left eye made him easy to spot even in this rough crew. One of the bandits slapped him on the back. Xander spun around and reached for a sword. Have a drink, the bandit handed him a sloshing mug of ale. Xander accepted the mug and clinked it against the bandits who took a huge swallow before staggering off. Xander set his drink down on a table untouched. He continued his meandering path to the back booth. When he'd almost reached the target, he slipped the stiletto he'd taken from the armory out of its forearm sheath and held it in a reverse grip in his right hand. The blade laid along his forearm. He stepped up beside the table. Do you lead these dogs? When the bandit chief looked up, Xander's hand shot forward, switching his grip as he went and burying the blade in the man's good eye. He fell forward onto the table, twitched once and went still. The woman started to scream, but Xander clamped his hand over her mouth. She looked at him with eyes wide with fear. Xander grimaced. She'd bring the room down on him the instant he let go. He sighed, balled up his fist and decked her. She crumpled beside the dead leader. Xander turned and relaxed when he saw none of the bandits even noticed what he'd done. Satisfied, he turned back to the kitchen, staggering in his best imitation of a drunk. He paused to collect his untouched mug of ale and went through the kitchen door. The cook looked up when he entered. Do you need something? A little fresh air. Xander set the mug on the kitchen counter and went out the back. He stepped into the torchlight and slammed the door behind him before the cook could spot the dead guards. Annika emerged from her hiding place. Well, it's done. Let's go. Did you have any trouble? They skirted around the end to collect Olin. No, I could have marched through behind a band and carrying a sign that said I'm here to kill your boss and they wouldn't have paid any attention. Annika motioned Olin out of his hiding place and they left the village. Alan waited by the horses, pacing. Did you get him? We got him. Xander untied his mount and swung up into the saddle. Let's put a few miles between us and the village. I doubt we'll have anything to fear before noon tomorrow, but why risk it? They rode for an hour by moonlight before going off the road to camp. I'll take last watch, Xander said. He stretched out on the ground and closed his eyes. The excitement of the last hour left him more drained than a day of hard training. A few minutes passed and the others must have thought he'd fallen asleep. What happened? Olin asked. We went around back. Annika said, we found the two guards, like Alan said. Xander tossed a pebble to distract them. What an amateur move, Olin said. Three strokes in as many seconds and the guards were dead. I've never seen anyone move like that. They might as well not have been there for all the difference they made. The pebble trick might not have been the most complex distraction, but it was all he needed. I hope I never find myself on the opposite end of his sword. Xander heard the shiver in her voice. Once the guards were down, he went in and five minutes later came back and said it was done. 
He made it easy for the rest of us, Alan said. Xander smiled and stopped listening. It would be dawn soon enough. Chapter 25 Two years and dozens of missions passed, and a team of four became a team of two. Xander and Annika had made the cut and been accepted as full members of the guild. Alan got reassigned to recruiter, his charm making him a natural for the position. The council deemed Olin too old and sent him to serve as a guard at a guild safe house up north. It's your move. Grandfather's voice shook him back to the present. Xander looked over the chessboard at the wizened figure that had become both mentor and friend. Sorry, my mind wandered. I could tell. Do you wish to continue? I have mate in five moves. Xander saw Grandfather had him boxed in and tipped his king over. I'll try to do better next time. Grandfather laughed, then started coughing. When he caught his breath, the old man said, I think that's enough for today. How goes your search for your family's killers? It doesn't. Grandfather nodded. I know. Why haven't you asked Soren to talk to the spies? I don't think I've done enough to earn it. Grandfather patted his arm. You've done enough. Ask him. I will. Thank you, Grandfather. Xander replaced the pieces on the board, got to his feet, and bowed. He left the old man to rest. Outside, a messenger waited. The boy bowed. Message, sir. For Grandfather? No, sir, for you. Master Soren wishes you to join him in the lounge at once. Xander patted the boy's shoulder. Thanks, I'm on my way. He made his way through the mountain, and when he arrived at the lounge, found Annika and Soren waiting. Where have you been? Soren asked, a scowl creasing his features. Last month, Soren received the much-coveted promotion to elite assassin, thanks in no small part to Xander and Annika's success. He stood one step away from a place on the Council of Eight, and he wanted that place bad. I sent the messenger for you an hour ago. I was playing chess with Grandfather, and the boy didn't dare disturb us. When he mentioned Grandfather, Soren's eyes narrowed. Since Xander and Grandfather became friends, the other assassins had fallen into two camps. Those that wanted to use Xander's relationship with the old man to gain more power, and those jealous of him. Soren seemed both jealous and interested in using him. Xander sat across from Annika. What's the job? Who said I wanted you for a job? Xander raised an eyebrow. Soren sighed. We've been contracted to eliminate a rich old merchant. The target is Sullivan Shale. He lives in a fortified mansion on an island about two weeks from here by ship. The guild hasn't gotten any spies into his mansion, so use your best judgment on how to proceed. A ship is waiting to take you as soon as you gather your equipment. Who hired us? Annika asked. Intermediaries were used, so I don't know the client's name. Not surprising. This isn't the sort of thing you want getting out. Xander stood. Before we go... I wondered if you'd have the spy master look into who had my family killed. Soren frowned. The spy network has more important tasks. They aren't here for the personal benefit of a junior member. That's what I said to Grandfather, but he insisted I ask. Grandfather told you to ask? Yeah, but if the spies are busy, I understand. Forget I mentioned it. I can have them keep their ears open. If they learn anything, I'll pass it along. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Xander and Annika left the lounge and split up to gather their gear. They'd worked together enough to know who could best handle which task. Xander headed for the armory. Since he didn't know what they'd be dealing with, he decided more weapons would be better than less. Annika hadn't reached the stables yet when Xander arrived, so he helped the stable boy saddle two horses. They finished a few seconds before Annika arrived a bulging pack slung over her shoulder. All set? Xander asked. She swung up on her horse. I think so. If not, they keep spare gear on the ship. They rode through the city, one look at their black horses and weapons convincing the locals to get out of the way in a hurry. When they reached the docks, they found the ship easy enough. Xander smiled at the grim reaper figurehead and wondered if he'd get a more polite reception this time. 
The assassins dismounted and left the horses for a youngster to collect. Xander never gave a thought to someone stealing them. No one would be so stupid. He led the way up the boarding ramp. At the top waited the large figure of the captain. The man's name escaped Xander, but his face looked familiar enough. Well met again, captain. The captain frowned. It was clear he had no memory of Xander. Don't you remember? You were kind enough to give my guide and me a ride here about two years ago. I recall at the time you thought little of my chances of making it as an assassin. The captain's eyes widened. I meant no disrespect. I transport many hopefuls and so few make it. Xander grinned. I hold no grudge. This is my partner, Annika. Annika and the captain exchanged polite nods. How long to reach the island? Ten days if the winds aren't against us. Would you like me to show you to your cabins? No need, Xander said. I remember the way. Xander led Annika below deck. He took the same room he used on his last trip, and she took the one across the hall. After he stored his gear, Xander went up on deck. He stood in the front of the ship like last time, a light breeze blowing his hair around his face. He smelled the salt air and smiled. It would be a good trip. When they were underway and Xander stood in his spot enjoying the breeze, the captain came to join him. I trust you won't abuse my men this trip. Xander turned a predatory smile on the older man. As I recall, they were the ones looking for trouble last time, not me. If your men mind their manners, we'll get along fine. Fair enough, the captain returned to the wheel. After a couple days, Annika got her sea legs and joined Xander on deck. One day when he was at his post, her soft footsteps came up behind him. What do you think we'll find? Xander turned to face her. A big house with a dead old man in it. Annika cocked her head. Doesn't it ever bother you? What? The killing? Xander frowned at the question. He'd never thought of Annika as the squeamish type. That's an odd question coming from someone raised around this business. Does it bother you? A little, sometimes. Our first mission didn't. The bandit deserved to die. But killing an old man in his home, it seems different. It isn't. Everybody dies. One thing I've learned is that life has little value. It doesn't matter how much you value someone. Love them. Try to protect them. They still die. Sometimes there's a reason, sometimes not. Doesn't matter. Someone has a reason why this old man has to die. If we don't kill him... It'd be a greedy relative. If not that, then time will do it. So what? There it is, the captain pointed at a distant island. In a sheltered cove, someone had built a good-sized town on the side of a hill. At the top of the hill, a walled mansion loomed over the town, backlit by the crimson sunset. The Mark had built his mansion near the edge of the jungle that covered the rest of the island. We'll sail around the far side and anchor. We'll have to cross that line of hills and approach from the jungle side, Annika said. The wall doesn't look like a problem from here. What do you think? Xander looked over the town and shrugged. No problem. A day to cross the hills, an hour or two to get in and out, and another day back. Three days, maybe four tops. It'll be dark by the time we anchor, the captain said. Will you go ashore tonight or in the morning? In the morning, Xander said. It'll take most of the day to reach the mansion. That'll put us in place near nightfall. Annika nodded her agreement and they returned to their cabins to get their gear sorted. An hour later, the anchor splashed. Someone knocked on his door and he turned to see Annika poke her head in. I'm all set. Me too. Better get some sleep. We'll set out before dawn. She started to withdraw, then stopped. I've got a queasy feeling about this job. Something stinks. If you'd rather stay on the ship. No, we're partners. Where you go, I go. I wanted you to know how I felt, that's all. Okay. But unless you want to order the captain to raise anchor and sail for home, we're stuck. 
and I don't like the idea of telling Soren we quit without even taking a look at the place. Annika winced. That would be an uncomfortable conversation, wouldn't it? We'll take it slow, and if anything looks off, we'll fall back, okay? Sure, Xander. Thanks. See you in the morning. Dawn's dim light colored the horizon when Xander and Annika climbed into the rowboat that hung on the side of the ship. Two burly sailors lowered them to the water and Annika unhooked the block and tackles from the boat. Xander set the oars in place and rowed for shore. Nice of you to row, Annika said. Xander grunted. Enjoy it because you're rowing back. Twenty minutes later, they pulled the boat up on the beach and tied it to a palm tree well above the water line. Xander helped Annika on with her backpack, then shouldered his own. He bowed and gestured toward the jungle. Lead the way. He followed Annika through the lush jungle, sweat dripping off his nose. The vegetation was thick, but not so dense they had to hack their way through. They made good time despite the heat and humidity, and at noon took a break to eat. They sat on a ridge top with an ocean view in all directions. Xander sighed, enjoying the peace. When they finished their meal, they continued down toward the mansion. The only other life they saw was a wild pig that ran squealing from them. The sun had set when they reached the edge of the forest. Thirty yards of open space separated them from the mansion wall. Sander eyed it. About twenty feet. Taller than I thought, but not enough to make a difference. She must have heard him. Xander motioned for silence when a man wearing a leather breastplate and holding a naked sword walked by. Xander smiled, amused by the guard's bare arms and knee-length pants combined with the chest protection. Perhaps it was the best compromise between protection and comfort in the heat, but Xander saw a dozen ways to kill the man, armor or not. When the first guard passed, Xander counted. The next guard passed at 157, and the original returned at around 375, they had a window of about two minutes to get over the wall. No sweat. There was no way to check the inside without exposing themselves, and Xander didn't want to risk it. If the perimeter guards were any indication, the inside should be simple. Let's go, Xander whispered. Soren paced in his room. The spymaster was due to arrive with the information on Kane. For six months, Soren had searched for something that would let him control Grandfather's new favorite. With any luck, the spymaster would deliver it. A knock sounded on his door. Enter. The spymaster, a bearded little man about four feet tall, slipped inside and shut the door behind him. I got the information you wanted. Tell me. Seems the boy was born into a house of some status. Xander's father held the rank of knight commander. In his home country, that's a high position in the military. The spymaster told him about the attack and resulting fire. Soren growled his frustration. There's nothing I can use. The identity of the person behind the attack might come in handy, but I can't control him with it. I saved the best for last. The spymaster's eyes crinkled. Xander's brother survived the fire. He's living in the city of Lord's Way and is a lieutenant in the city watch. A smile spread across Soren's face. I can use that. If I threaten the brother, I can force Xander to do whatever I want. Sir, the spymaster hesitated to interrupt Soren's scheming. I would never try to correct you, but considering what I know about the boy, I suspect if you threaten his only surviving relative, you're more apt to get your throat cut than a useful servant. Soren frowned as he considered the spymaster's words. He had to admit the man was correct, and Xander was too loyal to betray grandfather anyway. You have a point. It might be best to keep this to ourselves. The spymaster's eager nod betrayed his desire to avoid angering the dangerous young assassin. You may go. I need time to consider how best to use this new information. The spymaster bowed and left Soren alone with his thoughts. There goes the guard, Sander said. Annika held a coil of knotted rope tied to a grappling hook. When the guard rounded the corner of the wall, they ran across the gap and Annika sent the hook flying over the wall with a well-practiced twirl. The sharp points dug into the stone, and after a hard tug to test the setting, she climbed up, Xander right behind. When they reached the top, he pulled the rope up, flipped the hook around, reattached, 
and tossed the rope down into the courtyard. They climbed down and hid in the shadows of the wall. Annika unhooked the grapple with a deft flick of her wrist. Aside from the mansion, there were three more buildings inside the wall. The largest Xander guessed was a barracks, the smallest a storage shed, and the last a stable. No surprises so far. A pair of guards stood by the main gate, leaning on spears and trying to stay awake. Another two patrolled the courtyard, for a total of six guards watching the place. Pretty soft security, Annika said as though she'd read his mind. Enough to keep the locals from sneaking in and causing trouble. Rich people cut corners on the strangest things. In the dim moonlight, he saw her shrug. The families lived here for years with no trouble. I bet they don't even think the guards are necessary anymore. Do you want to take them out or avoid them? We'll avoid them. If they don't walk by every so often, even those idiots at the gate will notice. Besides, if we can't evade two men, we're in the wrong business. Sander pointed to the mansion. They slipped like shadows through the courtyard, pausing once near the shed to let the guards pass. They circled to the left, and on the opposite side from where they started, Xander spotted a second-floor balcony. That's our way in. Annika flicked the hook over the balcony rail. Xander tugged on it and climbed up. He slipped over the railing and reached back to help his partner over. Annika coiled up the rope, and Xander reached out and touched the door. It opened into an unoccupied bedroom, without a squeak, on well-oiled hinges. They slipped inside, and Xander shut the door behind him. This is too easy. I think you're right. Something stinks. Do you want to go back? I find that much more tempting now than when you first voiced your concerns. Still, I'd hate to go back and say we quit because the mission was going too well. Let's keep going. If it's a trap, whoever's waiting to spring it will get a surprise. Annika didn't argue, but he saw she didn't like it. They snuck across the room and Xander peeked out the door into an empty hallway lit at regular intervals by oil lamps. Xander pulled his head back in. If you were an old man, where would you be? She thought for a moment. In bed? Right. How many bedrooms do you think this place has? Eight? Ten? We need more information. There's got to be a few servants still up. Let's find one. Xander led the way out of the empty bedroom and started down the hall to the left. They passed three doors, none of which showed a light under them. When they reached the wall at the end of the hall, they turned back to check the right-hand side. They were almost back to the empty bedroom when footsteps sounded from the stairs to the right. The two assassins ducked inside. Xander held his breath as the steps passed the door. He waited another second, then stepped out behind a young woman in a black and white maid's uniform. Xander clamped a hand over her mouth and dragged her back into the empty room. With his left hand, he pulled his knife and set it against the girl's throat. Please don't scream. If you scream, I'll have to kill you, then find another servant to question. You don't want me to have to go to all that trouble, do you? The maid managed a minute shake of her head. Good girl. I'm going to take my hand away, and you will tell me where the old man is, right? She nodded this time, and her tears tickled Xander's palm. He took his hand away, muscles tense, ready to clamp down at the least noise. Master Shale lives on the third floor, her voice trembled. There are three rooms, all connected. The staircase is behind the final door on the right. Xander took his knife away from her throat. See, that wasn't so bad. She relaxed, and he struck her across the back of the head with the hilt of his knife. She collapsed on the bed. Sleep well. You're going to let her live? Annika asked. Whether she was pleased, concerned, or curious, he couldn't tell. Why not? We'll be long gone before she wakes up, and she was helpful. Besides, no one paid us to kill her. Xander checked the hall and found it empty. Come on, let's get this done. Annika followed him down the hall. Xander opened the door the maid indicated and found a set of wide stairs leading up. He took them silent as a cat. At the top waited a closed door. No light shone under it. Xander looked back at Annika. Ready? She nodded, and Xander tried the door. It wasn't locked. 
He pushed it into the room, just enough for them to slip through. The moment they were inside, lights blazed to life. For a moment, Xander couldn't see. He drew blind, listening for attackers. When his vision cleared, he found four armed guards surrounding a huge bed. An old man, all but invisible amid the pillows, lay in the center of the bed. You must be the ones they sent to kill me, the old man said. I thought you'd be older. I get that a lot. Xander evaluated the guards. Big men, dressed like the ones outside, carrying bared scimitars. Nothing that concerned him over much. Never from the same person twice. The old man chuckled. You're hardly in a position to make threats, veiled or otherwise. Why don't you throw down your weapons and my men will escort you out of here? I have a better idea. Sander switched his sword from his right hand to his left and let his right hand fall by his side. Why don't you order your guards out of here, and I'll kill you as painlessly as I know how. Shale laughed out loud at this, but Xander stared back, unblinking. You're serious? You can't think you can win? I don't know if I can win, but I'm not leaving until one of us is dead. Xander twitched his wrist, and a thin throwing dagger dropped into his right hand. He whipped his arm forward, burying the dagger in the nearest guard's throat. Guards! the old man shouted. The three surviving guards surged forward, weapons raised. Xander lunged to his right to avoid getting surrounded. He slashed at the nearest guard, forcing him to raise his sword to block. When he did, Xander kicked him in the stomach, doubling him over. He shoved the bent-over guard into the others, putting them off balance. He seized the moment and slashed one of them across the back of the neck, killing him. Annika drew her sword, and the old man screamed again, Guards! There were footsteps thundering up the steps. He was calling for reinforcements. Barricade the door, Xander said. I'll handle these two. Trusting Annika to do what he said, Xander focused on the guards who had gotten untangled and back on balance. Xander blocked an overhead chop from the closest guard, then spun away from a thrust from the second. His riposte caught the guard on the inside of the forearm and laid it open to the bone. The guard's sword fell from nerveless fingers. Something crashed behind him, but he ignored it and focused on the final guard. The man licked his lips and shot a glance at his bleeding partner. His hand trembled. You don't have to die for him. The hesitant guard looked back at his master. Xander struck, driving his blade through the man's chest, armor and all. Annika finished the wounded guard and they turned together to face the old man who had pulled his blankets up over his head like a child hiding from the monster under his bed. In this case, the monster wasn't under his bed, but standing beside it and hiding wouldn't do any good. Xander grabbed the covers and ripped them off the bed. Someone warned you we were coming. Who? The old man trembled. If I tell you, will you let me live? A crash came from behind them. He needed to wrap this up in a hurry. The door won't hold much longer, Annika said as if to reinforce his thought. You will die, Xander said. Talk, and I'll make it quick. If you force me to drag it out of you, I swear you'll wish you'd never been born. The old man hesitated, and Xander clashed him across the chest. My son-in-law. He heard some of our rivals hired an assassin to kill me. His name? Another crash, and the door splintered. Michael Oren. Thank you. Xander cut the old man's throat. Let's go. Xander smashed out a window and Annika hooked the rope to the ledge. She went down first and he followed as close as he dared. As he slid down, the shouts of guards elsewhere in the compound grew closer. He hit the ground and Annika retrieved the hook. The wall waited a hundred yard dash away and no guards were in sight. Seizing the moment, he grabbed Annika's hand and they raced to the wall. The moment they reached the wall, the hook went up and over. Annika climbed, not even bothering to check the hook, and Xander followed right behind. They reached the top and shouts rang out. The guards had spotted them. Xander hauled up the rope and tossed it down the other side of the wall. Xander followed Annika down the rope, dropping the last six feet when she stepped out of the way. Annika reached for the rope, but Xander said, Forget that. Let's go. They ran for the jungle. 
If they made it, the guards would never find them in the dark. They were halfway between the wall and jungle when Annika screamed and staggered. Sander caught her and half carried her to the tree line. A crossbow bolt stuck out above her left hip. It didn't look like anything vital got hit, but she wouldn't be running a marathon soon. How bad, she clenched, her teeth in obvious pain. You'll live if we can get back to the ship. Voices echoed in the distance. The guards had heard her scream. Can you walk if you lean on me? He helped her up, but she collapsed again. I can't. My leg won't hold. Leave me here. Xander ignored her. He wouldn't leave her. He couldn't lose another friend. I guess I'll have to carry you. You can't carry me the whole way back. You'll never make it. One way to find out. He scooped her up and walked as fast as he could deeper into the jungle. The guards thrashed through the undergrowth behind him. A hundred paces in, he set Annika down against the trunk of a tree. Lanterns bobbed through the jungle behind him. Sanders shook his head. The fools had spread out like they were searching for a lost kid rather than two assassins that would as soon kill them as look at them. He leaned down beside Annika and whispered, I'll be right back. Xander applied a coat of the liquid grandfather gave him to the lens of his mask. The night became day and he saw the men searching for them as clear as if the noonday sun shone above them. Xander drew his curved knife and slipped through the jungle like a great cat stalking its prey. He grabbed the first guard in line and cut his throat before moving on to the next. Xander paused, a third guard dead at his feet. Two men stood together without a lantern a short ways away. They had to be in charge. He stalked toward them, slow and silent. We've already lost two men, the man on the left said. We should return before they kill the rest. Do you want to tell the mistress her father's killers have escaped? The other man asked. Before the first man could answer, Xander came up behind him and laid the blade of his knife across the man's throat. I can make it so you never need to explain anything again. Order your men out of the jungle and you can live. If you could kill us all, you wouldn't be offering to let us go, the man without a knife to his throat said. I'm in a hurry. You have ten seconds to give the order or your friend dies first. Five seconds passed and Xander pressed the blade harder against his hostage's throat. Five, four, three. All right, men, that's enough for tonight. We'll start fresh in the morning. Smart. Xander shoved his prisoner toward his partner and melted into the jungle before he could turn around. He watched until the men started back for the mansion before he returned to Annika. Annika lay half-conscious against the tree, which was just as well. He notched the bolt, then snapped it off, leaving three inches sticking out of the wound. She moaned and Xander flinched. It wouldn't get any better carrying her back to the ship. He crouched beside her lifted her across his shoulder, careful to keep the bolt from rubbing as he walked, and turned toward the beach. It was a long night. Xander paused every quarter mile to rest. When he reached the beach, the sun sat high in the sky. The boat waited where they'd left it. Xander staggered the last hundred yards, so exhausted he could only manage a weak shuffle, and deposited Annika's unconscious form in the boat. He untied the boat, pushed it down to the surf, and climbed in. Xander looked down at his partner. She still breathed, and that was enough for now. Teeth clenched, he unhooked the oars and pulled for the ship. Xander had no idea how long it took, but he finally reached the side of the ship. With his remaining strength, he hooked the ropes to the boat so they could haul it up. The last thing he felt was the boat leaving the water. The rolling of the ship and creaking of the hull greeted Xander when he woke. His body ached and his mouth tasted like he'd chewed a piece of felt for the past ten hours. He rolled out of his hammock and found a pitcher of water on the small stand. Xander gulped down a quarter of the pitcher in one go and sighed. That was better. After he dressed, Xander went up on deck. He figured he'd find the captain there and if anyone could tell him how Annika was, it would be him. As he expected, the captain stood at the wheel. The captain spotted him approaching and handed control of the ship over to a mate standing close at hand. He met Xander halfway across the deck. Did you have a good rest? Xander nodded. How long? About 18 hours. I was getting worried. I'm touched. 
How's my partner? The healer removed the bolt from her side. Nothing vital was hit and her blood loss was minimal. She should make a full recovery. If you wish to check on her, she's in the healer's cabin two doors down from you. Thank you. Xander turned to leave. When she came to, she said you carried her all the way to the beach. Xander turned to face the captain. That's a hell of a thing. If you can't count on your partner, who can you count on? Not waiting for the captain's reply, Xander went back below deck to check on Annika. He found her asleep in bed, a middle-aged man with a gray-spattered beard sitting in a chair beside her. The healer looked up when Xander entered and whispered, You are my next stop. I'm pleased to see you up and around. How are you? I'm hungry and my shoulders ache, but otherwise I'm fine. How is she? The wound was painful but superficial. She should make a full recovery. If you'd like to sit with her, I'll send one of the ship's boys to bring you a meal. Thanks, I'd appreciate it. Xander took the healer's seat and studied his partner. Annika looked pale but otherwise fine, her breathing steady and deep. He rolled his shoulders, trying to work the stiffness out. A few minutes later, a boy arrived with his food, which Xander accepted along with a mug of ale. He'd finished half his meal when Annika opened her eyes. Xander swallowed a mouthful of fish stew. Good morning. How are you? I'll live, Annika winced when she sat up. Thanks to you. Why did you do it? No one would have thought less of you if you left me behind. We are partners, Xander smiled. Where you go, I go, remember? I was going to the beach, so that's where you went. We're only partners until they split us up. We have no say. I deal with the world as it is, not how it might be tomorrow. We're partners, and until that changes, you can count on a ride out of trouble whenever you need it. Do you want some stew? It's very good. They shared the rest of Xander's stew. Then Annika slept again. A little later, the healer arrived and changed her bandage. The next three days passed much the same. Xander spent the day sitting with Annika as she healed and regained her strength. When she was strong enough, they went for short walks out on deck. They were out walking one night, the stars glittering, the wind blowing in their faces. Annika was paying more attention to the sky than her feet, and she stumbled. Xander caught her before she hit the deck. Are you all right? Yeah, but I think I've had enough exercise for tonight. Xander helped her down to her room. He turned to leave, and she put a hand on his shoulder and spun him around. Before he could speak, she kissed him. When he woke, Xander had a moment of dislocation before Annika moved beside him. He groaned. What had he done? They were partners and made a good team. But now... He grinned. They were more than partners now. He hoped they could still work together. He let his concerns float away. Done was done, and he wouldn't trade last night for anything. When they reached port several days later, a young man waited with a pair of horses. Xander frowned. We should send for a wagon. You're in no shape to ride. I can handle it. Annika sounded confident, so he bit his tongue. You could help me up. He did as she asked, then mounted his own horse. He nodded his thanks to the boy when he accepted the reins. Annika looked strong as they rode through the city and turned toward the mountain. When they reached the foothills, a grimace creased her face. Halfway to the mountain, she leaned to the left. Xander caught her just before she fell out of her saddle. Are you okay? Annika nodded, obviously not trusting herself to speak. Xander sighed at the woman's stubbornness. He did what he could to keep her in her saddle. They had about another mile to reach the pasture. She could make it, he hoped. They kept the horses at a walk the rest of the way as he couldn't steady Annika at anything faster. When the pasture came into view, Xander didn't know when he'd been so relieved. The old man hurried out of his little cabin and opened the corral gate for them. Xander leapt down and helped Annika, who slumped into his arms. He carried her to the door, which opened without the usual security rigmarole. He made his way down the twisting paths through the mountain and soon reached Annika's room. She hadn't locked the door, so he kicked it open. Sander laid his unconscious partner on her bed and looked her over. Her wound hadn't torn open, which was good. 
The exertion of the ride must have been too much for her. To be safe, he'd send a healer over to check on her later. For now, he had to report to Soren, then check on Grandfather. He hadn't liked the sound of the old man's cough the last time he'd seen him. Xander went to see Soren first, since he knew his superior would expect it, and it would save an argument later. He found the door to Soren's suite locked, so he knocked. Soren opened the door a moment later. Xander, welcome back. I trust your mission went well? He frowned. Where's Annika? She was wounded on the mission, sir, and is resting. Serious? The ship's healer says not, but I'll feel better when one of our people has a look at her. Soren nodded. Let's hear your report. Xander told him everything up to the moment of the trap. The old man said his son-in-law, Michael Oren, warned him we were coming. I'm curious how this fellow found out about it. My first thought is he must be the one that took out the contract. Possible, I'll look into it. If it turns out this man hired us to set up a trap, I'd like to talk to him. I don't care for getting set up. We'll see. Continue your report. Xander did as instructed, and when he finished, Soren said, You really carried her all the way back to the beach? Annika was in no shape to walk, and I wasn't leaving my partner behind. Soren smiled and shook his head. Remarkable. I expect you'll want to rest. When your partner has recovered, I'll have another mission for you. Xander nodded. We'll be ready. He left Soren and went to Grandfather's room. Xander knocked on the door, then stuck his head in. Grandfather? Xander, come in. He could barely discern the old man where he sat surrounded by pillows. Grandfather's face looked more sunken than when he left. He didn't say anything, but he was more than a touch worried about his friend. So how did it go? Grandfather was always eager to hear about Xander's missions. We took care of the mark, though we ran into some difficulties. He told the old man everything, including some details he hadn't shared with Soren concerning the change in his relationship with Annika. Before he got to the ride up the mountain, Grandfather started coughing. He sounded worse. His whole body shook as he hacked. Are you all right? Grandfather waved off his concern. I'm an old man. As far as I know, there's no cure for that. See to your partner. I must rest. I'll check on you later tonight. The way the old man was coughing, Xander hoped he'd make it to tonight. Chapter 26 Annika walked through the halls on her way to meet Soren. She flexed her hip. Though it still hurt, she had her full range of movement back. Thanks to twice daily workouts with Xander, she'd also regained most of her strength. She sighed and shook her head at the thought of Xander. He confused her on almost every level. On one hand, when necessary, he was the coldest killer she ever met, never hesitating to eliminate anyone between him and a mark. On the other hand, despite his skill as an assassin, he didn't seem to enjoy killing. In fact, he seemed happier training or even better lying in bed with her. There it was. Since their first meeting, their relationship had changed a great deal, going from partners to lovers in a couple years. Did she love him? Annika wasn't sure. She sighed again. Maybe she loved him and maybe she didn't, but she trusted him without reservation. Xander saved her life and made it clear he'd do so again. Annika believed him, not that she wanted to put that belief to the test any time soon. Annika shook her head. She was overthinking again. Father always said that was her biggest weakness. She'd take the relationship as it came and enjoy every minute. In this line of work, you never knew which moment would be your last. Annika arrived at the intersection where Soren said to meet him, but of the man himself she saw no sign. Annika couldn't imagine why he'd want to meet in such an out-of-the-way corridor instead of in the lounge or Soren's suite. She respected Soren as her superior, but sometimes the man's paranoia got out of control. Soren must have been watching for her because he came down the hall seconds after her. Thanks for coming. You told me to. Where's Xander? Isn't he joining us? No. Soren took a furtive look around. This is a private meeting. That's why I chose this place. Annika frowned, not liking the direction the conversation had taken. 
Her first thought had been a sensitive mission, but now she wasn't sure. So what is it? I've learned some interesting news. The council plans to offer Xander an elite position. She looked at him, waiting for the rest of his news. Soren said nothing more. He called her here for that? I'll have to congratulate him. The council hasn't made an official announcement yet, so you shouldn't say anything. Besides, there's something else we need to discuss. Here it comes. Yes? Did you know I was a friend of your father? Annika didn't recall ever seeing the two of them together. Not that that meant anything, since her father spent so much time away. No, I didn't. I'm not surprised. We kept our friendship quiet. When I heard the council's plan, I was reminded of it. I didn't think it was fair to elevate a newcomer that joined to gain access to our spies over the daughter of a loyal member. Xander's better than me. It hurts my pride to admit it, but it's the truth. It may be true, Soren looked around again, but that doesn't mean you have to accept it. If you kill Xander, I can arrange for you to get the opportunity he's been promised. You want me to kill him? Annika couldn't believe what she'd heard. Not so loud. Understand this. As long as Xander lives, you have two choices to rise above him. Improve your skills to surpass his, or kill him. No offense, but I don't see you becoming more skilled than Xander. He saved my life. Soren was right about Xander. She'd never be as strong or fast as him. But to kill him? She didn't know if she could. Before her father died, she swore she'd be the best but killing Xander to get there seemed too much. That's why you're the perfect one to do it. He trusts you. You could catch him off guard in a way no one else can. I can't, Soren patted her shoulder. Think about it. You'll make the correct decision for yourself and your father's memory. He slunk off, leaving Annika alone with her thoughts. She wandered aimlessly through the halls, one thought rattling through her head. Could she kill her lover? Xander finished his workout and went to finish the chess match he'd started with Grandfather yesterday. For the past few weeks, he'd trained with Annika to help her get her strength back, but she still couldn't manage a full session. He smiled. They'd gotten even closer since returning from their last mission. Annika shared his room and all but name. He was worried their close relationship might get in the way on a mission, but not enough to stop seeing her. Xander hadn't been this happy since before Hakim killed Sophia. He made his way through the halls, nodding to the occasional familiar face. When he reached Grandfather's door, it was unlocked. Xander knocked and entered. He found the chessboard sitting as they'd left it. Grandfather was too weak now to manage a full game in one sitting. Though he kept his thoughts to himself, Xander feared the old man had little time left. Hello, Grandfather. Sander carried the chessboard over to the old man sitting amongst his pillows. You've been training. Grandfather sat up and studied the board. Weak as he was, Grandfather still beat him eight out of ten games. Sander took a couple sniffs and winced. I didn't bother to wash up. Sorry. Nonsense. That's the smell of hard work and dedication. I wish more of our people worked as hard as you. Grandfather made a move and Xander countered. Your patience needs work. Learn to study your opponent before you act. Once you master that, you'll be unstoppable. I'll do my best, Grandfather. But patience was never my strong suit. He'd lost track of how many times the old man scolded him for acting too fast. Grandfather chuckled and took Xander's bishop. We all have our weaknesses. Dealing with them is what makes life interesting. Xander studied the board and considered Grandfather's advice. Telling him to have more patience was simple enough, but it was execution that counted. Xander frowned. Grandfather had made in seven moves. The frown smoothed when he realized he could get two of his opponent's pieces, but it had cut the duration of the game by half. When in doubt, Xander attacked. When they finished, Grandfather said, you shortened the game by attacking. When we first started playing, you told me chess was like life. If that's true, then when I saw I couldn't win, I chose to hurt my enemy as much as possible before I fell. 
In real life, that's how I would want to go. Grandfather laughed, then coughed until his body shook. When he got himself under control, he said, I wish we had more people like you, my boy. I need to rest now. Of course, Grandfather. Do you need anything before I go? The old man smiled. I'll be fine. Grandfather was lying, but Xander had too much respect for him to say anything. Xander spent the rest of the day in the library studying strategy and philosophy. He sometimes found it hard to sit still, but at moments like this he remembered sitting with Gabriel and Mother in their little library at home. Mother had loved to lounge in the sun for hours reading. Xander clenched his fist. She'd done nothing to anyone, and she was dead. His nails cut into his palm. Soon, somehow, he'd find out who was behind the attack. Xander's stomach growled, and he figured it was time to meet Annika for dinner. He replaced his books, left the library, and returned to his room to clean up. When he finished and came out of his small washroom, Xander found a rolled-up scroll on his bed. He snatched it up, annoyed that someone would sneak into his room. He unrolled the scroll and froze. It said Annika intended to murder him tonight. His throat tightened. Impossible. Annika would never betray him. They were partners. He'd saved her life. Xander read the scroll twice more as though the warning might change. It didn't, and he couldn't mistake the stylized G at the bottom of the page. That was Grandfather's sigil, and the old man had no reason to lie. Even worse, he seldom made mistakes. Xander tossed the scroll into the charcoal brazier in the corner of the room. Grandfather had made a mistake this time. He had to have. Xander started toward the door, then turned to the small chest of drawers that held his few possessions. He took a thin-bladed dagger from the weapons drawer and slipped it between the mattress and frame on his side of the bed. Annika picked at her food. Xander saw something was bothering her. She usually had a better appetite than him. The silence dragged between them. Unable to stand it any longer, Xander asked. What's wrong? She forced a smile. Nothing. I've been cooped up too long. I'm anxious for a new mission. Xander nodded, not believing a word of it. She seemed afraid to meet his eyes. He grimaced. Grandfather's warning had him seeing ghosts. I'm sure Soren will have something for us before long. He thought her eyes widened when he said Soren's name, but wasn't sure. I'm not very hungry. Let's go back to your room. Xander grinned. Sounds good. Xander lay awake in the dark, mind whirling. Something was wrong with Annika. When they got back to his room, she'd been overeager, almost frantic to get into bed. Not that Xander was bashful, but tonight she had a desperation to her he'd never experienced before. He closed his eyes. Tomorrow, he'd try to get her to tell him the problem. A few minutes later, Annika shifted beside him. He almost spoke, but something, instinct perhaps, stopped him. There was little light from the smoldering brazier, but after years of training, he could follow her movements by sound and feel. Inch by inch, Xander eased his hand over the side of the bed and to the hilt of the dagger. Roll over and go back to sleep. Xander tightened his grip. Please go back to sleep. Next came an intimately familiar sound. Steel on leather. She was drawing a weapon from its sheath. Xander eased the dagger out from its hiding place. Put it away, please. She shifted again. He had to act or die. He acted. Sander drove the dagger up into Annika's chest. Warm blood ran down his hand. Annika moaned and fell to the side. He pushed her body aside and scrambled out of bed. Xander threw a couple chunks of coal into the brazier, and after a moment they flared to life. Annika lay in a pool of blood, a stiletto clenched in her fist. He threw on a robe and fled, unable to share the same space with her cooling body. Xander needed to talk to Grandfather. He'd know what to do. Barefoot and bloody-handed, Xander ran through the maze of tunnels to Grandfather's room. Had he met anyone, they'd have believed him a madman. His luck held, and he reached Grandfather's room without encountering another soul. 
The door wasn't locked. He went in without knocking. I'm sorry, my boy. Xander about jumped out of his skin. He hadn't expected to find Grandfather awake at this hour. The sound of his voice soothed Xander and his heart rate slowed. You were right. She had a stiletto with her tonight. If not for your warning, there are times I'd prefer to be wrong. I know how much she meant to you. Xander nodded in dull silence. He'd thought his capacity to absorb pain had maxed out after Sophia's murder. He was wrong. After a few minutes, he asked, How did you know? First, you have to understand, not everyone in the guild is pleased with my leadership. Some think I'm too old and others want my power and influence for themselves. One of my enemies is your master, Soren. He has yet to make an overt move against me, but he works to undermine me whenever he imagines he can get away with it. Given that, I keep him under near constant surveillance. One of my people overheard him trying to convince Annika to kill you. That bastard. I'll kill him. An excellent idea, but I have a favor to ask. Anything. I need you to wait. Xander scowled and Grandfather hurried on. Not for long, a few weeks at most. When the time is right, he's yours. It seemed his revenge always had to wait. I will do as you ask, of course. But can you tell me why? A member of the Council of Eight has died. Soon there will be a vote to decide on his replacement. I've arranged for Soren to win that vote. Once he's on the council, you can kill him and take his place. I lose an enemy and gain an ally on the council. Xander hated politics, but could find no fault with Grandfather's reasoning. What about Annika? Not to mention my bed looks like a war zone. Have no fear. My people are cleaning it up as we speak. We'll give them an hour, then you can go back. What about tomorrow? How do I look Soren in the eye and not shove a foot of steel through his guts? Strangle him in your mind while you smile and nod like a good assassin. An important skill for you to master is the ability to look your mark in the eye and give no indication you mean to kill him. Use this as training. One last thing. He'll ask about Annika. Tell him you parted company last night and you haven't seen her since. Understand? Xander nodded, but he had no idea how he'd manage. Xander returned to his room, but got no sleep. He lay there staring into the dark and thinking about love. It wasn't healthy for him to love, not for those he loved at any rate. When he got up, and for the rest of the week, he resembled a zombie more than a person. He saw Soren twice and managed on both occasions not to murder him on the spot by the narrowest of margins. Servants discovered Annika's body two days after he killed her. Grandfather's people made it look like a suicide. Soren appeared to accept that she preferred to kill herself rather than Xander. Nine days after Annika's death, Soren called Xander to his suite. When he arrived, he found Soren strutting around in a strange, shimmering black cloak. He motioned Xander to sit and then joined him. You've been out of sorts since losing your partner, Soren said. I have news that will cheer you up. I have been elected to the council, doing no small part to your efforts. As a reward, you are to be elevated to elite status. You need to complete a final solo mission. With your skill, I have no doubt about your success. As your superior, I will go along to observe and evaluate. I promise I won't disappoint you. I know you won't. Get some rest. We leave in the morning. Xander left Soren's room and returned to his own. On his new mattress was another scroll. Xander's hands trembled as he unrolled it. The message was short. It said, Finish the mission, then he is yours. It was signed with a G. At last, at last he had permission to kill the pig. For the first time since Annika's death, he slept in peace. 
the ship arrived at the docks of the city of Isis around noon. They had sailed south for a little over two weeks. Xander lay back in his hammock and put his arm over his eyes. Seventeen days trapped on a ship with a man he planned to kill. Worse, Soren wanted to regale him with stories about the city. Soren had been born in Isis and worked in their thieves' guild before the Shadow Hand recruited him. Tonight they planned to meet the guildmaster, who happened to be Soren's best friend, the two of them having joined the guild together and worked their way up the ranks. Tonight would be their first meeting in several years. Soren was so excited you'd swear he was a little kid instead of a middle-aged killer. There came a knock on his door and Soren poked his head in. It's sunset. Ready to go? Xander rolled out of his hammock, belted on his sword, and slung a light pack over his shoulder. Ready. He followed Soren off the ship and down the docks. The guildmaster said to meet him in a particular alley a safe distance from the mark's location. While they walked through the dark city, Soren inflicted more nostalgia on Xander. He'd robbed a street vendor here, committed his first murder there. Xander almost killed him just to get a little quiet. We're here. Soren stopped at the edge of an especially run-down neighborhood. Where? Xander eyed the dilapidated buildings and heaps of garbage with distaste. This area looked like a cesspool by anyone's standards. A little ways into the pit and we'll reach the alley. The pit? Xander couldn't believe he'd asked for more information. That's what we call this part of the city. We brought anyone or anything we wanted to disappear here and threw them in just like a pit. It's a fitting name for the place. Soren smiled. There's the alley. Something moved in the shadows and Xander loosened his sword and its sheath. If Soren planned anything, he'd be ready. Soren glanced at him. Relax, that's Doran, the guildmaster. This is where we're supposed to meet him. Xander nodded but didn't remove his hand from the hilt of his sword. When they got closer, a weasel of a man with thinning, greasy hair and a long, pointed nose stepped out of the alley. Soren? Soren embraced the man like a long-lost brother. Doran, it's been too long. The little man relaxed a fraction. I almost didn't recognize you. You've gained a few pounds. Soren laughed and patted his spreading paunch. I see you've lost more hair. Xander cleared his throat. He'd had enough of the friendly insults. If we can get to the point, you two can catch up while I'm gone. Soren guided the guildmaster next to Xander. Doran, this is my impatient protege, Xander. Xander, this is my oldest friend, Doran. Doran looked up at Xander, about as comfortable as a rabbit in a cage with a lynx. Xander raised an eyebrow. Well? Right. The target is the youngest son of the local lord. The target is holed up in a building north of here. There are many guards on the ground floor, but only two guard the secret exit on the roof. That's your best bet to sneak in. The target is a morbidly obese man with greasy black hair. You can't mistake him if you see him. He keeps an ornate sword on the wall of his bedchamber. Bring that back as proof the job is done. I should warn you, the sword is rumored to be possessed by the soul of a demon. Right, so what did this slob do to deserve a death mark? What does it matter? Doran asked. It doesn't beyond satisfying my curiosity. I'm curious as well, Soren said. Your letter was rather vague. Will is the black sheep of the Lord's family, and considering the family, that's saying something. He came to Isis a year and a half ago and contacted us about importing and selling a new drug he discovered up north. He offered us a nice cut and we agreed to help. In less than a year, Bliss was the most popular drug in Isis and Will decided he didn't need us anymore. None of my enforcers can get past his security, which brings us to you. Xander nodded, a little disappointed with the story. This shouldn't take long. He walked toward the Mark's hideout, studying the debris piled against the leaning tenements. In some places he had trouble telling where the junk ended and the building began. Most of the buildings were three stories and separated by narrow alleys. 
Every building in sight had a flat roof which combined with the short distance between them would make it easy to jump from one to the next. When he'd moved out of sight of Soren and the guildmaster, he took a thin silk rope tied to a grappling hook out of his pack. Xander sent the hook up onto one of the roofs, gave it a couple tugs and climbed. He sighed. Annika usually handled this part of the job. Xander clenched his teeth and pushed the memory aside. He'd settle things soon enough. From the rooftop, he surveyed the immediate area. The neighborhood looked every bit as squalid from above as it did below. The only way to improve this part of the city was fire, and plenty of it. He leapt from one roof to the next, making his way north. After ten jumps, he spotted a roof with two guards standing on either side of a trap door. That had to be it. The target building was on the opposite side of the street instead of across an alley, but Xander knew he could make the jump. He backed up to the edge, then raced forward, jumping with only inches of roof to spare. When his feet hit, Xander rolled forward to absorb the impact and drew his sword as he came to his feet. He charged the guards without breaking his momentum. Unlike on some of his past missions, these guards were professionals. They had their swords out and they separated so one could flank him the minute they spotted Xander. He grinned like a lunatic. Perhaps he'd have a worthwhile fight for a change. Xander slashed high at the first guard, then spun to parry the attack he felt coming. He spun and dodged, glorying in the fight. It didn't take him long to figure out the guards were too slow to lay a blade on him. Xander took his time, working his opponent into the position he wanted. When he had the guard off balance, Xander ducked behind him, reversed his grip on his sword and stabbed the guard in the back, severing his spine. He ripped the sword free and whirled, ready to face the second guard. The man ran toward the edge of the roof. Xander hurled his sword like a javelin, piercing the second guard between the shoulder blades and dropping him to the roof. Xander froze and held his breath. No sounds of alarm. Good. He retrieved his sword and went to the trap door. It looked simple enough and he saw no traps. He found the latch and lifted the hatch. The door shrieked loud and long, setting Xander's teeth on edge. He listened again. Still no sign of alarm. Unless the mark hired deaf guards, something was wrong. Xander applied a coating of night vision liquid to the lens of his mask and descended the ladder into the building. The steps led down into a bedroom. A massive canopied bed dominated the room. In the center of the bed lay a huge mound under the covers. Xander frowned. It couldn't be this easy. On the wall opposite the bed hung a gaudy, gem-encrusted short sword. Maybe it could be this easy. He walked over to the bed, but the mark never stirred. Xander pulled his sword back and drove it into a sack filled with hay. A decoy. Great. One other door led out of the room. Xander assumed many men with weapons waited on the other side. He slipped over to the door and pressed his ear against it. Silence. Either the guards were better trained than most or no one was on the other side of the door. One way to find out. Xander pushed open the door and went through, sword leading. No guards, just a fancy bed with a fat, snoring man in it unaware he was about to die. How no one had heard the trapdoor screeching he neither knew nor cared. An overhead chop half decapitated the mark. He thrashed a little while he bled out, then went still. Satisfied that he'd completed his task, Xander retreated back to the decoy room and collected the sword on the wall. Up on the roof, Xander took a deep breath of cool night air. Now to kill Soren. He examined the ornate hilt of the sword. It was exotic. Black wood and the pommel and crossguard were encrusted with all manner of gems. It was worth a fortune, but garbage as an actual weapon. As far as being possessed by a demon, Xander snorted and pulled the blade from its sheath. The instant the blade cleared the sheath, the world went black. He floated in oblivion. A voice said, Xander Cain, thank you for rescuing me from that fool of a nobleman. Who are you? What are you? My true name is unpronounceable in any language you would recognize, but you may call me by the name my first mortal bearer gave me. I am the devourer of souls. I'm a demon, and you're holding my body in your hand. 
My contact said a demon possessed the sword, but I didn't believe it. The sword isn't possessed, the demon said. It's my actual body. You clearly have scant knowledge of demons. A little education is in order. All higher order demons have mutable bodies. We can become anything we want. Why would you become a sword? Isn't such a form too limited? Limiting is an understatement, and I assure you I didn't choose this form. Millennia ago I was the most powerful demon lord in existence. I devoured the essence of anyone that dared challenge me. Unable to best me on their own, my enemies set aside their personal hatreds and joined together to defeat me. Even their combined power wasn't enough to destroy me, so they bound me into this limited form. I've passed from one mortal to the next, dependent on mere humans for my sustenance. This last mortal was a particular disappointment. When I felt you approaching, I knew my moment had arrived, so I lent you what little help I was able. You kept the guards from hearing the trap door and the mark from waking up. Why do you want me to take you away so bad? I want to be used, the devourer said. I'm starving. With my powers at your command, you can be the greatest assassin ever. Very well. Return me to my body. There's a soul just waiting for you to devour. Xander blinked and stood on the roof again. In his hand, the once gaudy short sword was now an exact replica of the sword hanging at his waist, save for the blade, which was so black it seemed to absorb the starlight. Xander drew his old sword and tossed it away, replacing it with the devourer. He leapt across to the next roof and retraced his path to Soren. When he was a couple roofs away, the demon said, Stop. The word echoed in his mind. There are two men hiding on the roof to your right. How do you know? I can feel their anima. What would anyone be doing on the roof of a rat hole like this? They were too close to Soren's hiding place. Sander felt sick. That feeling had saved his life more than once. Xander leapt to the roof and drew the devourer the instant his feet hit the boards. Two crossbowmen crouched, weapons loaded, watching the alley where Soren waited. He closed to within a few feet, his steps making no more noise than the night breeze. You boys enjoying the view? The two men jumped and raised their weapons. Sander didn't hesitate. He stepped toward the left-hand man and cut him in half from left shoulder to right hip spun and decapitated the second. Xander stood silent for a moment, awestruck by the sword's power. He'd cut a man in half with no more resistance than if he'd cut paper. Nothing could cut like that. He watched the demon absorb the blood on it like a sponge. The demon radiated pleasure. They were waiting to kill you. They had orders to shoot when they received a signal. Soren. It's time I introduced you to my former superior. Xander leapt two roofs east so Soren wouldn't realize he'd killed his men, then climbed to the ground and walked back to the alley where Soren and his friend waited. It's done. The two older men came out to meet him. Where's the sword? Doran asked. Xander drew the devourer and held it up. Right here. That's the wrong sword. I told you it was ornate, not plain. At Xander's silent request, the demon shifted back to its former shape. The guildmaster's eyes widened. Incredible. Indeed, Soren said. Now for your reward. He waved his hand. They stood in expectant silence. Xander smiled at their confusion and had the demon change back. Soren waved his hand again. I hope you're not waiting for those two crossbowmen. The look of desperation on Soren's face brought a warm glow to Xander's heart. Before his fellow assassin could make a move, Xander had his blade at the man's throat. With a flick of his wrist, he sent the shadow cloak fluttering to the ground. He glared at Doran when the little man tried to sneak up behind him. Go away. 
Doran scurried away like a kicked dog. Satisfied that they wouldn't be disturbed, Xander smiled. I'm going to enjoy this. Wait, Soren dropped to his knees. Please don't kill me. I'll do anything you want. Generous of you, but all I want you to do is stop breathing. Stop, Soren screamed when Xander drew his sword back to strike. I can tell you who killed your family. I'll tell you everything, just don't kill me. How long have you kept that little secret? It doesn't matter. When I kill you, the devourer will absorb all your knowledge. I don't need you alive to get your secrets. This is for Annika. No! Soren's head fell to the ground with a wet plop. Xander had never seen a happier sight. Xander retrieved the shadow cloak and swirled it around his shoulders. He sheathed his new sword and walked back toward the ship. For a human, Soren had a complex mind. Perhaps he had demon blood. I wouldn't be surprised. It would take him some time to get used to talking with his mind. For now he was content to mouth the words, though anyone watching would think he was a lunatic. He said he knew who killed my family. Did he? Or was he lying to save his worthless life? He was telling the truth. It was a nobleman named Hayden Carradine. I know that name. He was one rank above father's lord. Why would he attack us? Father was as much his servant as he was Duncan's. Xander shook his head. Doesn't matter. He should be easy enough to find. There's more. It seems your brother survived the attack. Xander stopped dead in the street. Gabriel's alive? If Soren's information is correct, he's a lieutenant in the watch. Xander moved on. So Gabriel is alive and following in father's footsteps, no less. Unbelievable. An assassin and a watchman. He grinned at the absurdity of the situation. It should be an interesting reunion. The captain was waiting on deck when Xander got back to the ship. You can set sail when ready. Where's Master Soren? He won't be making the return trip. On the journey back to the mountain, the crew seemed tense. Through his connection with the devourer, Xander sensed their unease. They must have known, or at least suspected, that he'd killed Soren. Whether some of them were his allies or not, Xander didn't care. He kept to his cabin for the bulk of the trip, and no one bothered him. As soon as they docked, Xander went up on deck and found the captain barking orders. When he finished, Xander said, Take on whatever provisions you need. We sail for the port nearest Arbata in a day or two. The captain scowled like he wanted to argue, but he nodded. Satisfied that his orders would be carried out, Xander disembarked and rode the waiting horse back to the mountain. He went straight to Grandfather's room to check on the old man. When he entered the familiar room, Grandfather struggled to sit up, then slumped back. Xander hurried over and knelt beside him. What can I do? Grandfather took a rasping breath. There's nothing you or anyone can do short of turning back time. I'm an old man whose time is running short. Can you share some of the power you took from Soren and the crossbowmen? What little I can give him will only delay the inevitable. Give him what you can. Sander took Grandfather's leathery hand and wrapped it around the devourer's hilt. The power flowed between the sword and Grandfather. The old man perked up. What was that? Grandfather sounded stronger and Xander relaxed a little. A final gift from Soren. Xander grinned and explained everything that happened on his mission. Amazing, Grandfather said when Xander finished. He touched the sword again. With this sword, I can bring back all the life energy you'll ever need. You can lead us forever. No, Grandfather held up a hand to stop Xander's eager speech. Thank you for what you've given me. I haven't been this strong in months, but I have no interest in living like a vampire. 
With the time you've given me, I can put things in order before I die. When my time ends, you will lead the shadow hand. Xander sat, stunned. Me? I am no leader. I haven't the patience for it. You have the will, Grandfather said, his voice fierce. From the moment I met you, I saw it. You can delegate the politics and lead by example. Be who you are and get the others to follow you. Not now. Go north and finish your business. We'll speak again when you return. Yes, Grandfather. I have a favor to ask. Anything. On your way, stop and ask Craven to come home. I'd like to see him once more before I die. Of course. Thank you, my boy. Now let me tell you how to use that fine cloak. Chapter 27 After a month of sailing and three days hard riding, Xander found himself inside of Arbata. Nothing had changed in the time he'd been gone. The city seemed smaller, but that was no doubt due to his altered perspective. Xander clicked his tongue, urging his mount into the city. A short ways from the gate, he found a stable where he left his horse. Walking through the city at twilight brought back memories for Xander, some of them good. The sun had set when he got close to the guild hall. He didn't want to deal with the guard, so he tried the shadow cloak. He'd used it once, back at the mountain, with Grandfather keeping a close watch. Xander took a breath to steady his nerves and pulled the hood up. The moment the hood's shadow covered his eyes, he saw rippling doors in every dark place. Xander clenched his teeth and stepped through the nearest one. Xander floated in a world of darkness. All around him, portals large and small writhed in the midnight realm. As he'd been taught, Xander pictured himself flying up and forward. There was no sensation of movement, no breeze in his face. The only reason he knew he was changing position was the portals changing all around him. It seemed to Xander that several minutes passed when he found a portal into Craven's room, though in reality only an instant had gone by since he entered the Shadow Realm. Grandfather explained during his lesson time didn't affect the Shadow Realm. When he stepped into Craven's room, he found it empty. No surprise, it was the start of the night shift and Craven no doubt stood at his usual post near the entrance. Xander ducked back into the shadows. This time he emerged in his old room. Kaylin was just out of bed and getting dressed. Xander smiled, pleased she still used the room they'd shared. Been a long time. Kaylin jumped, pulled a dagger and spun to face him. Who are you? How dare you sneak into my room? Xander threw back his hood. It used to be my room too, so I didn't bother knocking. Xander! She tossed aside the dagger and leapt into his arms. When did you get back? I never expected to see you again. He held her for a moment, then stepped back. Did you think I wouldn't survive or I wouldn't bother to return? Kaylin smiled. I knew you'd survive. So what's the occasion? I assume you didn't come all this way just to visit me. Unfortunately, no. I have a message for Craven, then I'm heading home. Home? Her eyes widened. You found out who killed your family? Sander nodded. Even better, turns out my brother survived. That's great, and I'm sure Craven will be happy to see you. Any idea where he is? No, but I'm sure we can find him. They searched the ground floor but came up empty. Sander enjoyed strolling through his old home, and they took their time heading upstairs. The clack of wooden swords came from the training room, and sure enough, they found Craven watching a pair of slender young men battering away at each other. Got any more fighters lined up for us? Craven turned and smiled. None of your caliber, more's the pity. They shook hands. That cloak, is it? Craven stopped short. Xander nodded. Grandfather says I'm the youngest to earn one. He wants you to come back, Craven. Craven grimaced. I hate it there. You'll have to accept my apologies and pass them along. He's dying. What? Craven stared at him. 
If he lasts another six months, it'll be a wonder. Grandfather wants to see you once more. He asked me to pass along the message on my way north. The ship's waiting for you in the usual spot. I told them to wait three weeks. After that, they sail home. It's been so long. I didn't leave under the best circumstances. Xander clapped him on the shoulder. The old man wants you to come back. Do you need any more than that to know you're welcome? Craven sighed. Thanks, Xander. I'm glad he sent you to tell me. What are we going to do now? Kaylin asked. Can you stay a while? She sounded so hopeful he hated to disappoint her. I'm only staying the night. Then I have business to finish. Oh, tell you what. I'll stop for a week on my way back. How's that? Kaylin brightened. Deal. I'm sure you two have a lot to do. I'll just rest in my old room. Xander pulled up his hood and ducked into a handy shadow. Xander woke early and found Kaylin sitting in a chair watching him. He sat up and slipped on his mask. Do I talk in my sleep? She shook her head. If you aren't here to learn my secrets, what are you doing? You left so abruptly last time. I wanted to be sure to give you a proper goodbye. Sander smiled, touched that she wanted to see him off so badly. I appreciate the thought. He got out of bed and dressed, not the least self-conscious around her. Are you and what's-his-name still together? No. I kept comparing him to you and he kept coming up short. Jaden got sick of the comparisons and moved on. Xander strapped on the devourer and draped his shadow cloak over his shoulders. Why did you compare him to me? Jaden's a thief, not a warrior. It wasn't his skills I was comparing. When he went out on a job, he seemed ready to bolt at any sign of trouble. When we worked together, I knew you always had my back no matter what. I've never felt as safe as I did those months we were together. Yeah, I know what you mean. I haven't found anyone I could trust like I trusted you. We made a hell of a team, and I see no reason we couldn't again. When I finish my business in the North, why don't you come back with me? I'm no assassin. Despite the protest, Xander saw the idea intrigued her. You don't have to be. Many other people work for us. You can be my eyes in the city, keeping track of the city lords and the thieves' guild. I doubt any of them would be stupid enough to betray us, but better safe than sorry. They'd accept me just like that? Xander grinned. One of the advantages of my new position is they pretty much have to accept it. You're that high up? I'm as high as you can go. The truth is you coming to work with me as my personal spy is important to me, but it's nothing in the grand scheme of the shadow hand. Kalen smiled at last. If it's that simple, I'd love to join you. I'm sick of this place. Good. I'll stop for you on my way back. He pulled up his hood and started for a shadow. Before he disappeared, Kaylin hugged him from behind. What's that about? Just be careful and be sure you come back. Xander turned around and kissed her on the forehead. Don't worry, I'll be back. Xander stepped through a shadow and left her behind. He moved through the darkness and found fewer doors than usual. No surprise, since it was daylight out. He stepped out of a shadow in an alley two blocks from the stable. One of the stable boys stood waiting out front. Xander flipped him a gold coin. The Black Gelding. The boy smiled at his good fortune and ran inside. A few minutes later, he led the horse out, saddled and loaded with a pair of bulging saddlebags. Xander mounted up and rode out of the city. Xander kept a brisk pace and stayed on the main trade routes. It took him two months to reach the outskirts of Lord's Way. He turned off the main road around midday and down a rough cart path carved through the forest. He reached the edge of a large clearing a few minutes later. Near the center sat a pile of charred timber. Scattered here and there slumped half a dozen wrecked outbuildings. Xander shook his head. Be it ever so humble. He urged his horse down into a clearing and rode around, eyes closed, remembering the day of the fire. Xander let the pain and fear fill him. He let out a breath he hadn't realized he held and opened his eyes. I know who did this, 
he spoke to the ghosts that lived in his memory. I promise he'll die screaming. Before the end, he'll know who killed him. He turned back to the main road and continued on to Lord's Way. He set a good pace and arrived at the gate at dusk. The guards led him through after a cursory inspection. He found a stable for his horse and went to visit the local thieves' guild. Xander walked through the dark streets, unafraid of any potential attackers. If anyone lurking in the shadows thought a lone pedestrian would make an easy mark, a second look must have changed their mind, as he reached the back door of the guild with no trouble. The Lord's Way Thieves' Guild operated out of a basement under a theater in the Arts District. It had to be nothing more than a meeting place since they had no space to store loot. Xander rapped on the unmarked wooden door and waited. After a few seconds, the door opened a crack. This is the stage entrance, get lost. The shadow hand requires your assistance. I would speak with your guildmaster, and I'm in a hurry. There's no guildmaster here, now beat it before I crack your skull. Was the man stupid or ignorant? Either way, Xander was sick of talking. He side-kicked the door off its hinges and sent the guard sprawling. Before he could recover, the devourer was at his throat. The only reason I didn't kill you is I don't want to look for the master myself. Now go tell him the shadow hand needs a moment of his time. The guard's gaze followed the length of the black sword at his throat and up to Xander's scowling face. The terrified man scrambled away, around a rack of costumes and through a hidden door in the back wall. Xander shook his head and sheathed his sword. The demon's disappointment radiated from the sword, but he wouldn't kill a man to satisfy the sword's appetite, if that were even possible. He needed the thief's help, and killing one with no good cause wouldn't buy him any goodwill. A few minutes passed before a slender woman of middle years dressed in skin-tight black leather came through the hidden door, a pair of over-muscled goons beside her. My apologies, assassin. Our door guard hasn't been educated regarding his betters. How may I help you? Not interested in excuses, Xander said. I need the location of Gabriel Kane. He's an officer in the watch and Duke Carradine. Are they your targets? That's not your concern. Now where are they? The Duke is easy enough. As of this morning, he's in residence at the mansion of an old friend of his named Baron Jameson. Would that be Gabriel St. Jacques Kane, the Lord Mayor's adopted son? Xander nodded. So Uncle Duncan adopted Gabriel. How nice for him. That's him. The woman smiled, looking relieved she'd done something Xander approved of. He lives in the Lord's mansion. He also spends a great deal of time at the Church of the Bright Shield. You have my thanks, but should any of you try to warn either of them, I will return, and our next conversation will be less pleasant. Xander pulled up his hood and disappeared into the shadows. He emerged several blocks away. Eager as he was to visit the Duke, he decided to find Gabriel first. This was as much his revenge as Xander's, and he deserved a chance to be part of it. Xander turned toward the city center where the Lord's Mansion waited. As he got closer, Xander found he was nervous. It was ridiculous. He'd killed men without batting an eye, but the thought of seeing his brother again set his heart racing. He smiled and shook his head. Xander stopped when he reached the iron fence that bordered the property. He looked at the dark grounds, his mind going back to the times they'd visited Uncle Duncan. It seemed like another life. Xander stepped into a shadow and emerged in an unused guest room. He had no idea which room Gabriel used, so he resolved to check them all. After seven failures, he found a room that appeared lived in. A glowstone sat on the table by the bed. Xander rubbed it until it gave off a soft light. A quick search turned up Gabriel's journal. He got as far as the battle with the river pirates when the sound of heavy boots on the floor outside got his attention. Xander doused the light and put it back on the table. He stood in the dark corner away from the door, not bothering to enter the shadow realm. A broad-shouldered figure entered the dim room. Xander's throat tightened when he saw his brother for the first time in so long. He stepped out of the shadows, and Gabriel drew a gleaming sword from the scabbard at his waist. That's hardly the greeting I expected after so long, Gabriel.
And that's what happened, Xander said, his story complete. Gabriel stared at his brother, trying to reconcile the boy he remembered with the man sitting on the bed across from him. It's a miracle you survived the fire, much less everything else. I saw him, you know, the slaver. I met him on the road when I fled after the battle. He seemed a little odd. Xander laughed a humorless laugh. He was worse than odd. Now, will you help me? Together we can avenge mother and father. I killed the demon that led the attack on our home, but I can't find any solid evidence on the duke. Without proof, I can't arrest him to face the king's justice. The king's justice doesn't interest me. I will cut his heart out and feed it to the wolves. Before Gabriel could respond, the door to his room burst open, and standing on the other side, a triumphant smile on his face, was Morgren. I knew I'd eventually find a way to get even with you. Conspiring with killers? Hardly the proper behavior for an officer of the watch, especially the ever-so-perfect Gabriel Kane. I will enjoy destroying your reputation as you did mine. For all your arrogance, Morgren fell silent when Xander buried a dagger in the casing an inch from his head. Some things haven't changed. A worthless, obnoxious child has grown into a worthless, obnoxious adult. Do you pretend to know me? A sneer curled Morgren's lip. Xander laughed again, and Gabriel shivered to hear the coldness in it. Know you? The three of us played together as children. How could I fail to recognize your fat, petulant face? Morgren's eyes widened. Xander, you're dead. You're not that lucky. Why don't you run along and pretend you never saw me? It'll be good for your health. Your threats don't frighten me, Morgren stammered and trembled. Like a blur of shadows, Xander crossed the room, and before Gabriel or Morgren could move, he had a knife at Morgren's throat, their faces inches apart. You would do well to fear me. I swear, if you cause any trouble for me or my brother, I'll come for you. I'll come from the shadows when you least expect it. First, I'll drive needles into your eyes. Then I'll think of something really unpleasant. Morgren swallowed and fell over in a dead faint. Xander laughed to himself and put his knife away. Did you have to scare him so bad? Gabriel asked. Still smiling, Xander said, Probably not, but it was fun. Gabriel shook his head and sighed. We can't leave him here. Help me get him to his room. Xander snagged Morgren's left leg. Which one? Gabriel grabbed Morgren by the arms and lifted him off the floor. Second door on your left. They carried Morgren to his room and dumped him on his bed. When they got back to Gabriel's room, Xander said, Now that we've dealt with that pest, we can figure out how best to deal with the Duke. Gabriel sat on the edge of his bed, every minute of the past day weighing on him. How could he make Xander understand? He was an officer of the watch, and he couldn't sit there and plan the murder of one of the leading nobles in the kingdom. No matter what he may have done, and Gabriel was certain he'd done some terrible things, his duty was to find proof and arrest him. We can't just kill him. What? Gabriel winced at his brother's reaction. I've sworn to uphold the laws of this land, and those laws don't condone murder. I can't move against the Duke without proof. Proof? You know he was involved with the raid that killed father and mother. Does your precious oath mean more than avenging their deaths? Gabriel stiffened at the insult. Xander made it sound so simple. He wished it was. Father would have understood. Honor and duty come before revenge. Eventually, I will find the evidence I need. Then Duke Carradine will answer to the law. Men like him never answer to the law. Xander paced like a caged tiger. He's too well connected. You could spend the rest of your life searching for evidence, and when you found it, he'd pin everything on some expendable lackey. No, the Duke will answer to me. 
If your precious honor keeps you from helping, then stay out of my way. I'll do what needs doing. I can't stand by and let you kill him. The watch will do its best to protect the duke until the law says otherwise. Will you fight me to protect that murderer? The watch will do its duty. Xander nodded and pulled up the hood of his cloak. If that's the way you want it. But send no one you value because I will kill anyone that gets in my way. Xander stepped into a dark corner and Gabriel lost sight of him. Xander? Gabriel grabbed the glowstone and checked every inch of the room. But his brother had gone. Chapter 28 After a miserable night's sleep, Gabriel rose a little after dawn. He figured everyone else would still be asleep, and he had no interest in making conversation. Gabriel dressed, stopped in the kitchen to get leftovers for breakfast, and walked to the church. He didn't worry about waking Solon. It didn't seem to matter what time he arrived. The priest was always awake. How long did he have before Xander made his move against Duke Carradine? Gabriel figured at least a couple days. It didn't matter. He still had no idea what to do about it. When he stepped into the church, a warm sense of calmness settled around him. Something about the gray stone and cut glass windows made him feel at peace. The church was one of the few buildings in the city that remained from its founding. It had a sense of permanence that made Gabriel think some things would never change. He climbed the short flight of stairs and pushed open the always unlocked doors. He found Solon dusting the wooden benches in the chapel. The old priest smiled when he entered. Good morning, Gabriel. I didn't expect to see you so early after your adventure yesterday. I didn't expect to be here this early, but then I didn't expect my brother to come home alive after all these years either. Didn't he die in the fire? It seems not. He's returned. And while he was gone, he's grown into a skilled assassin. The boy I loved is gone. He also knows Duke Carradine was involved in the attack on our home. He's sworn vengeance, and I have no idea what to do about it. Your brother's the one from our dreams. Gabriel nodded and dropped onto one of the benches. You have no doubts? None. Will he aid us or oppose us? Gabriel smiled a tired smile. He wants revenge, and as much as our goal and his coincide, he'll help. If we try to stop him, Solon nodded. It seems both of our dreams were true. He wishes to kill the Duke so you are opposed, yet he wishes to destroy the great evil, even if for less than noble reasons, so we are allied in that. Bring him here. I must speak with him. I doubt I can bring him here if he doesn't wish to come but I will ask. Something thumped against the church door. Gabriel jumped up, hand on the hilt of the bright sword. What the hell? Solon shrugged and started for the doors. Gabriel a step behind. Solon opened the door to find a rock with a piece of parchment tied around it. Gabriel bent down and picked it up, a queasy feeling in the pit of his stomach. He untied the parchment, tossed the rock aside, and read the note. What's it say? Solon asked. We have Amanda, Gabriel read. If you want to see her alive again, bring the key fragment to Baron Jameson's mansion at midnight tonight. The parchment fell from his nerveless fingers. How could he use his own daughter? I'd be surprised if he had any idea what was happening. He left for his country estate late last night. I doubt his masters informed him of their plan. Kyera? Solon nodded. I sent her to keep an eye on him. The Duke has the three remaining pieces, and we must claim them when the time comes. I need the key fragment. Solon sighed and closed the door. It's unfortunate the girl is involved in this. Where did you hide it? I have to save her. Solon shook his head. I'm sorry, but I won't trade the world for one girl's life. What do you suggest? We let them kill her? How could Solon be so cold-hearted? I can make a copy of the fragment and put it inside the coffer. When you meet, they won't be able to tell it's a fake. And when they open it, Amanda's still dead. 
Perhaps if you act as a diversion while someone else sneaks inside and rescues her. Xander. Gabriel's eyes widened when he realized what Solon was suggesting. With his skills, he can slip in with no trouble at all. If I tell him the kidnappers had something to do with the attack, he'll jump at the chance to help. After you save her, bring them both here. Amanda will be safe nowhere else, and I must talk to your brother. Gabriel nodded, eager now that he had a way to save the woman he loved. Amanda will come, but I can't speak for Xander. He didn't even see fit to tell me where he was staying. I suggest you find him. I'll prepare the counterfeit fragment. You should return around eleven so you have plenty of time to make it to the mansion. Right. I'll talk to Griff. His contacts might know where I can find Xander. I'll see you tonight. Gabriel left Solon to his work and headed to watch headquarters. If anyone could help him find Xander, it was Griff's friend Lucy. Since Gabriel already told his partner everything anyway, he figured it wouldn't hurt to share a little more. At the back entrance, he found a handful of off-duty watchmen standing around. They straightened as he approached, but he waved them to relax. Anybody seen Griff? He's next door getting breakfast, one of the guys said. Thanks. Gabriel was happy not to have to talk in front of the others. He crossed the street to Tommy's and found his partner at his usual table, a heaping plate of potatoes and eggs in front of him. Griff looked up when Gabriel entered and waved him over. Hungry? Griff asked. Gabriel sat across from his partner. No, thank you. I have a problem. Fill me in. Gabriel told Griff everything that happened since he rode out from the church the day before. When he finished, Griff said, You've been busy. I imagine seeing your brother again came as a shock. Not as big a shock as learning he's a killer for hire. Do you suppose Lucy can find him? She can find him, Griff said around a mouthful of food. Whether she can do it by midnight's the question. That's not much time. That's not the encouragement I was hoping for. Griff finished his breakfast. Let's go see what she knows. Will she be awake? Gabriel followed his partner out of the tavern and toward Lucy's bar. If not, we'll wake her up. This is an emergency. It didn't take them long to walk to the rundown bar. They went in, but it was way too early, and the place was empty save for a bartender and an old man sitting in the back near the hidden door to Lucy's office. They walked over to the old man. Your boss up yet? Griff asked. The old man shook his head. She's not to be disturbed until noon. Sorry, Griff. Griff grinned. We really need to see her. That's what everyone says. You'll have to wait. Gabriel was growing angrier by the second. He reached for his sword, but Griff put a restraining hand on his arm. Gabriel took a deep breath and let it out slow. You can wake her up, or I can kick the door down. Your choice. We gotta deal with the watch. You can't barge in here any time you want. If you think I will let a kidnapping investigation wait while your boss gets her beauty sleep, you're either crazy or stupid, Gabriel said. Now are you going to wake her, or am I? The doorman turned a pleading look on Griff, who shrugged. Okay, wait here. The old man slipped into the secret passage. What do you think? Gabriel asked. Lucy will be pissed. Will she help anyway? Probably it's in her best interest to keep the watch happy, and under the circumstances I believe she'll understand your anxiety. Five minutes later, the old man emerged from the back room. Come on. The boss will be along in a minute. The old man escorted them to Lucy's office. It looked the same as their last visit, and they sat in the chairs in front of her desk. It wasn't even a minute before Lucy joined them, hair in disarray and no makeup on. You two have a lot of nerve threatening to break my door down at this time of the morning. Well, don't sit there like lumps. Tell me what you want. An assassin arrived in Lord's Way in the last day, and I need to find out where he's staying. He's a little younger than me, wears a half mask and dark cloak. Ah, he had Lucy's attention now. He made quite an impression on my guild contact. He's a member of the Shadow Hand. They're the most ruthless assassins in the world. Did he kill someone already? No, 
I don't want to arrest him, just talk to him, Gabriel said. Interesting. Want to tell me what this is about? No. Lucy smiled and shrugged. Suit yourself. I don't know where he is, but I can find out. You're welcome to wait here. When I learn something, you'll know it. Thank you, Gabriel said. Lucy wrote three notes, then pulled a rope hanging by the desk. Three young men entered from a side door and hurried over to her. She handed each one a note, and without a word, the messengers left. Now we wait. Gabriel got up. I can't sit here. Let's walk our usual patrol. Griff got up beside him but made no comment. We'll check back in three hours after noon, Gabriel said. Lucy nodded. Are you sure you don't want to tell me what's going on? You're safer not knowing, Gabriel said. Gabriel and Griff left Lucy's bar and started their patrol. Gabriel tried to pretend it was a day like any other, but several times found himself on the edge of running so he could get back to Lucy's faster. It won't do any good to rush, Griff said the third time he broke into a jog. She'll know when she knows. Running back to get in her way won't speed things up any. Yeah, Gabriel sighed. I hate not being in control. The bastards took Amanda. I know where she is, but if I try to save her, they'll kill her. All I can do is hope my brother will help me. What will his reaction be? Griff asked as they entered the warehouse district. Gabriel smiled when he imagined Xander's reaction. I expect he'll be amused at the irony of me asking for his help less than a day after refusing to help him. You don't think he'll help out of brotherly love? Gabriel's smile faded. After everything Xander's been through, I'm not certain he's capable of that emotion anymore. They got back to Lucy's two hours early and found her deep in conversation with a young man wearing an eye patch over his right eye. She nodded at him when they entered. Just the men I wanted to see. This is Denny, one of my sources. Tell them what you told me. Denny looked at her like she'd asked him to stick his head in a lion's mouth. You want me to talk to a couple watchmen? Forget it. I told you everything. Now I'll take my money and be on my way. Suit yourself. Lucy tossed him a pouch, which he snatched out of the air. He gave it a shake and seemed pleased with the jingle. He slipped out the side door without another word. I think you two scared him. I have that effect on thieves, Gabriel said. So does your assassin. Last night he kicked down the guild hall door and demanded to see the master. When he finished talking, he made it clear if they interfered in any way, he'd come back and wipe them out. What'd the guild do? Griff asked. Nothing. They seemed confident he was willing and able to do what he threatened. They told the members to watch for him. A pickpocket spotted him a few blocks from the Lord's Manor. Are you certain you don't want to tell me what's happening? Completely. Where can I find him now? Gabriel didn't want to waste time now that he had a location. He's staying at an inn called the Black Swan. Before you rush over there, you should know someone else saw him leave this morning, headed toward the river. Damn it, he could be anywhere along the banks. Thanks for the info, Griff said. Turning to Gabriel, he asked, You want to go looking for him? No, I'll wait at the inn. Xander's bound to be back sometime. The sun sat low in the sky when Xander started back toward the inn. He'd spent the day fishing by the river. Seeing Gabriel again reminded him of the times they spent fishing in the pond near the house. He even caught a two-pound rock lurker and planned to have it broiled for his dinner before he scouted the mansion. Is he still back there? Xander mumbled the words. He was getting close to speaking just in his mind, but hadn't got the knack yet. Yes, shall we take him? Xander considered it, but since the Watcher hadn't interfered with him, he chose to let him live. When he went to scout the mansion, he'd shadow walk there and leave the spy none the wiser. The demon sensed his decision. I'm hungry. I must feed soon. You're always hungry. I'll feed you when I find someone worth killing. Now be silent. When they reached the inn, Xander had no desire to carry a dead fish through the dining room so he went to the kitchen entrance. The door stood open to let the heat escape. 
Xander went inside and found the head cook barking orders at his assistants who scurried around rushing to obey. The head man spotted Xander and hurried over, waving his hands like Xander was some barnyard animal to be shooed out. A glare from Xander brought the man up short. No one had shooed him in years and he wasn't about to start now. He threw the fish in an empty sink. I want that broiled with garlic butter and brought to my table in half an hour. I'm not sure you know whom you're speaking to, the cook said. Xander's eyes narrowed. What makes you say that? To his surprise, the cook was smart enough to interpret the scowl on his face and realize his danger. Never mind, and we'll be done. Good. Xander stepped out of the door into the dining room and spotted his brother sitting at a table watching the entrance. What did Gabriel want? How had he learned where Xander was staying? The spy. Of course, Gabriel must have an informant in the guild. Xander chewed his lip and considered why Gabriel would have sought him out again so soon after they parted company. He doubted his brother had changed his mind about helping kill the Duke. Xander felt stupid he'd asked in the first place. Gabriel was too honorable to even consider helping murder someone. He also doubted his brother had come to try to arrest him. Something must have changed in the past day. To be safe, Xander stepped into a shadow and emerged beside his brother's table. He appeared to be alone. Xander sat down beside Gabriel and grinned when his brother jumped. So are you here for the food or the company? The company. I'm flattered. After our last conversation, I doubted you'd be eager to seek me out. Still, you shouldn't dismiss the food. I have a broiled rock looker on the way. Want to split it? Gabriel smiled. He had dark circles under his eyes. Did you catch it yourself? Xander nodded. I spent most of the day down by the river, reminiscing, I guess. I haven't been fishing since you, Morgren, and I went before the attack. Neither have I, but something drew me to the water today. I need your help, little brother. So I assumed. You can tell me about it over dinner. We can't talk here. Gabriel seemed nervous, and Xander couldn't imagine why. Do you remember the Church of the Bright Shield? Sure, it's a landmark. Meet me there, and be sure you're not followed. Equal parts annoyed and curious, Xander said. I'll be there in an hour. Xander emerged from the shadows across the street from the church. The lack of portals in the church surprised him. He crossed the street and slipped like a shadow inside the building. Welcome, a kind voice said. Startled, Xander reached for his sword but found only an old man standing beside the altar. Where's Gabriel? Your brother is waiting in the kitchen. He gestured toward the rear of the church. I have tea brewing. Xander followed the old priest toward the back room. Who are you that my brother shares his confidences with you? The priest looked back and smiled. Never fear, everything will be explained in time. He found Gabriel pacing in the kitchen, a teapot whistling on the stove. The old priest bustled over and poured three cups. The smell of mint filled the room. Tea's ready. Solon, how can you think of tea at a time like this? The agitation sounded clear in his brother's voice. Tea will help you relax and clear your mind so you can focus. Solon passed out the mugs. Sit, please. Gabriel did as the priest bid and Xander sat across from his brother. Perhaps now he'd learn what was happening. Well, brother, what's so important to cause you to seek me out? Someone very important to me was kidnapped. Unless I give them an artifact, they say they'll kill her. I want you to help me rescue her. A woman. I should have guessed. Xander remembered the women in his life and what he'd do to protect them. Perhaps his brother wasn't so different from him after all. Why don't you give them what they want? It's not that simple. Gabriel set his mug down and looked at Solon, who nodded. What I'm about to tell you may sound improbable but I promise you it's the truth. Do you remember when father went after the bandits a little while before the attack? It was his last mission. 
One of the items he recovered was an artifact, a piece of a magical key. Let me guess, that's what the kidnappers want. That's right, but I can't give it to them. It would be far too dangerous if they got their hands on it. Fine, but what does this have to do with Duke Carradin? He's allied with the kidnappers. They want me to bring the artifact to the mansion of one of the Duke's friends at midnight tonight. So the Duke kidnaps your girlfriend and demands a ransom. When this is over, will you still object to me killing him? Would it matter if I did? Gabriel asked. Sander shook his head. No, I was just curious. What do you want me to do? I've created a counterfeit artifact, Solon said. Gabriel will take it to the front door to meet the kidnappers. While they're distracted, you sneak in and rescue the girl. You must move fast, as it won't take them long to realize the key is a fake. Why don't I go in, kill everyone but the girl, and bring her out the front door? Too dangerous, Solon said. If the demon senses your arrival, it will kill the girl. If you wait for it to be distracted, you will have a better chance. Xander shrugged. Suit yourself? When do we move? They said midnight, so why don't we head out now and scout around first? Xander got to his feet. The tea was excellent. Perhaps we'll share another cup before you leave, Solon said. Perhaps. Xander gestured for Gabriel to lead the way. They left by the back door and started toward the mansion. Xander followed a step behind his brother. After a few blocks, Xander said, What would you have done if I didn't come? Gabriel stopped and looked back. I never considered the possibility that you wouldn't help me. We're family. Xander smiled when they resumed walking. Typical Gabriel, assuming he'd help for no other reason than his brother asked. He was right, of course. Xander knew the pain of losing someone you loved all too well. If he could spare Gabriel that pain, he would. They stopped in a dark alley across from the mansion. Two guards stood by the main entrance, big, muscle-bound types, there for decoration more than anything. The demon is in there. Not much of one, mind you, but a demon all the same. That was expected. Xander mouthed the words without speaking. How many guards? A dozen, at least, perhaps more. I can't tell from here. What do you think? Gabriel asked. Xander took a moment to orient from mental conversation to verbal. If the guards at the door are any indication, we shouldn't have any trouble. I can't see through walls, though, so I can't say what we'll find inside. Gabriel nodded. Thanks for doing this, Xander. Xander offered a cool smile. You're lucky we're family. If you had to hire me, it would cost you a fortune. Gabriel glanced up at the moon and figured it was close enough. Ready? Xander nodded, and Gabriel started toward the mansion. Xander pulled up his hood and watched. When the door opened, he stepped into the shadows and out of time. Xander Shadow walked into the mansion, peering through one portal after another, never leaving the timeless void of the Shadow Realm. He lost count of how many portals he checked before he found a room with guards standing out front. That must be the room, but he only had one chance to get it right, so he found a small portal in the well-lit room. A blonde wisp of a girl sat on a bed covered with stuffed animals. That had to be her. Xander drifted to a portal across from the guards and drew the devourer. Dark power and insatiable hunger filled him. He stepped out of the portal and into the hall, a dark figure out of the guards' nightmares. Two slashes in as many heartbeats and the bisected guards lay bleeding on the floor. Xander slashed the hinges off the door and kicked it in. The girl stared at him in slack-jawed horror. Xander knew how he must look and sheathed his sword. You're Amanda? She nodded, unable to speak. Gabriel sends his regards. Xander held out a hand to help her up. If you want to live, come with me. Amanda's hand seemed small and fragile in Xander's as he led her through the mansion. With the devourer's ability to sense the guards, he avoided two patrols. Their luck could hold only so long, so when they emerged from their most recent hiding place, Xander asked, What's the fastest way out of here? 
Amanda looked around with wide, frightened eyes. But to the girl's credit, she kept her wits. At the end of this hall is a staircase. At the bottom, turn right. The main corridor leads right to the front doors. All right. I'm sick of hiding. We are going straight for the door. Stay behind me and out of the way. Amanda nodded, and they started down the hall. Xander reached out to the devourer. Where are they? So you finally mean to stop hiding? Three humans are engaged with your brother. Two guard the staircase and nine patrol the mansion in groups of three. The demon is approaching from behind. It's forty yards away at the girl's room. Good. Keep me advised of the demon's position. I can handle the thugs on my own. They reached the end of the hall and turned down the stairs. Halfway down, Xander stopped. There is a pair of guards at the bottom of the stairs. Wait here while I deal with them. How do you know? Xander held a finger up to his lips. I just do. Now keep quiet. He left Amanda standing in the stairwell and slipped down to the bottom. Xander sensed the guards through his connection with the sword. He raised the devourer and prepared to lunge out and kill the guards. The demon approaches. It will reach the girl in moments. Xander pulled up his hood and leapt into the shadows. He floated in the shadow realm trying to sense the demon. Why didn't you run back up the stairs? Because I want to reach the demon before it reaches the girl. With any luck, I can ambush and kill it before it knows I'm there. Excellent plan. I haven't tasted demon flesh in centuries. Are we getting close? The demon blade hesitated. It always seemed uncertain in the shadow realm. A little further up. Now we're even with it. It's using magic to stay invisible. Let me guide your hand and we can take it. Do it. A clawed skeletal hand wrapped around Xander's sword hand. The devourer urged him forward. Xander stepped out of a portal and lunged the moment his feet touched the stairs. The hand on his guided the blade up and to the right. The metal slid through something, and a moment later a wriggling form flickered into view on the steps. He guessed the demon was around two feet long. It was hard to judge since Xander had cut it into two pieces. The top half featured a horned head and the bottom a barbed tail. What, by all the watching gods, is that? Amanda pointed a trembling hand at the remains of the creature. After she spoke, black fire flared around the demon and reduced it to ash. That was a demon. Xander mentally slapped the devourer's bony grasp from his hand. Before he could say more, the guards charged up the stairs. Stay behind me. Xander stepped in front of Amanda and met the first guard slash with a parry. He forced the guard back and leapt a cut from the second man that would have taken his right leg off. Xander landed on the steps and slashed down, cutting the first guard in half. The devourer crackled with power after killing the demon. The second guard hesitated when he saw his partner taken down, and that gave Xander all the opening he needed. He slashed low, taking the guard's legs at the knee and sending him tumbling down the stairs. He looked back to check on the girl and found her staring at him, hands over her mouth, eyes wide. Xander forced himself not to smile. They walked down the steps, careful not to slip on the blood. At the bottom, Xander paused long enough to lop the moaning guard's head off. They entered the hall outside the stairwell. Which way? Right, then the next left. The girl shook and he assumed shock was setting in. He grabbed her hand and they ran down the hall. When they rounded the corner, they arrived in time to see Gabriel finish the last guard. Amanda spotted his brother, pulled away, and ran to him. She leapt into Gabriel's arms, and Xander smiled with more warmth than he had in a long time. Gabriel set Amanda down. I knew you could do it. Let's head back to the church. You two go ahead. There are more men in here. I'll deal with them and catch up. The mission is accomplished, Gabriel's eyes held a pleading look. You don't have to kill anyone else. Rule number one, never leave an enemy alive behind you. Better to kill them now than have to fight them later. Get her out of here. I'll take care of this. Xander stalked back into the mansion before his brother could say another word.
Gabriel left his brother and Solon talking in the kitchen while he went to get Amanda settled. He led her by the hand to the small guest room across from Solon's bedroom. She hadn't said a word since they left the mansion. They sat at the edge of the bed. Don't worry, you'll be safe here. She looked at him, tears streaming down her face. What's going on, Gabriel? First those men grab me. Then that man in black rescues me and says he knows you. I wasn't sure who I should fear more, him or the kidnappers. The man in black is my brother, Xander. Her eyes widened. I thought he died in the fire. Up until yesterday, I did too. I was wrong. He's come back. Why? Gabriel couldn't look at her. He came back to kill your father. He believes Duke Carradine was involved in the attack that killed our parents. Amanda put her hands on either side of Gabriel's face and turned him toward her. Why does your brother think that? Because your father was involved. He's made a deal with demons to claim the throne. My father was on the verge of figuring out what was happening. The demons decided to remove him. Your father didn't order the attack, but he knew and said nothing. How could he? The pain in Amanda's voice brought Gabriel to the verge of tears. Has he lost his mind? Gabriel shook his head. He had no answers for her. He had few enough for himself. I'll do my best to stop Xander from killing him. Can't you arrest him? If I could, he'd still be executed for treason, but it doesn't matter since I can't prove anything. Treason. Amanda leaned back in bed and sighed. I hadn't considered that. Considered what? Do you know what will happen if my father is found guilty of treason? Beyond his execution, I hadn't thought about it. It's much worse than simple execution. The crown will strip the family of all our lands and holdings, erase our name from the histories. We'll be reduced to nothing. Twenty generations of loyal service wiped away by one man's ambition. Perhaps it would be best to let your brother have him. Gabriel blinked certain he hadn't understood her. You want me to let Xander murder your father? Amanda sighed again. Better if he's a victim of an assassin than a traitor to the crown. I will not see my family torn apart by my father's stupidity. Gabriel nodded. He saw her point, but it pained him that such a decision needed to be made at all. If that's your wish, I'm sure Xander will be happy to grant it. I won't stand in his way. Thank you, Gabriel. I hope you don't think less of me. Sometimes hard decisions must be made. As a child of the nobility, you learn that at an early age. We'll be leaving soon. Promise me you'll stay in the church. I'll arrange for Griff to come check on you. I promise. Just be sure you come back safe. I will. Gabriel kissed her, then left her to get some rest. He went to the kitchen to check on Solon and Xander, but found the priest sitting alone. Where's Xander? He went back to his inn to sleep. He says he's ready when we are. How's Amanda? Better than I feared. When I told her about her father, she said it would be best if I let Xander kill him. That isn't surprising. Her family stands to lose everything. So she said. Gabriel couldn't accept Amanda's willingness to sacrifice her father no matter what he'd done. He was still her father. Don't be too quick to judge her. Solon must have read his mind. Remember, she has scores of relatives to protect. Would you condemn them along with the Duke? Of course not, and I don't judge Amanda. It's hard to hear such sentiments spoken out loud is all. Especially after losing your own father. Gabriel nodded. So when do we leave? How about noon tomorrow? That will give me time to make arrangements and buy supplies. I'll be ready. Chapter 29 How many are there? Xander asked the druid, Kyera Oakshadow. It was three hours after moonrise, and he, along with his brother and Solon, had met the woman half a mile from Duke Carradine's hunting lodge. The lodge was a sprawling, two-story mansion built of logs, to one side, a barracks of the same style housed his guards, who now patrolled the area. Thirty guards patrol the grounds in groups of five. I have no idea how many are inside. Kyera eyed Xander, lip curled with disdain. 
What are you thinking, Xander? Gabriel asked. I'm trying to decide the best way to take them out. We don't need to kill them, Gabriel said. We can sneak past. Xander shook his head. You're either soft or stupid. Those soldiers' job is to kill trespassers like us. I doubt they'll have any qualms about doing it. Your brother is correct. Solon laid a hand on Gabriel's shoulder. Gabriel and Kyera stared at the priest in dumb silence. The old priest surprised Xander as well, but he hoped he hit it better than they did. He'd taken the old man for a softy like his brother. I'll take care of it. Xander drew his sword. I'll call you in when the way is clear. Solon, Gabriel's voice held a pleading tone. It has to be done, Solon said. If one of us is hurt and we need to retreat in a hurry, those soldiers might be the death of us. Our mission is too important to allow sentiment to stop us from doing what must be done. I won't be long. Xander pulled up the hood of his cloak and stepped into a shadow. He emerged from the shadow of the barracks. Through his connection with the demon sword, he sensed the life forces of the men scattered around the grounds. From the lodge, he sensed a demonic aura that made the imp he killed earlier feel like a mouse. That is a greater demon, no doubt the sorcerer second in command. My power can shield us as long as we don't get too close. Can you kill something that strong? The devourer's disdain echoed in his thoughts. I can kill anything. The question is, can you get us close enough to strike without getting yourself killed? Now the disdain belonged to Xander. Don't worry about me. He moved toward the closest guard patrol, a panther on the hunt. Gabriel, Kyera, and Solon crouched behind a pile of boulders within sight of the lodge grounds. They had neither seen nor heard any sign of Xander. Gabriel took that as a good sign, as any raised alarm would mean the guards had spotted Xander. Xander is quite bloodthirsty. Kyra said. Gabriel offered a glum nod. Don't judge him too harshly. Gabriel was surprised the priest would come to Xander's defense. In his world, the least hesitation might get him killed. I don't believe he enjoys killing. It's just his job. That's a poor excuse. Contempt dripped from Kyra's voice. I'm not offering an excuse, but an explanation. Xander does what he must to survive. Kyra snorted, and Gabriel understood how she felt. Xander seemed more of a stranger than a brother now. Gabriel still loved him, but he didn't understand the way he thought. Explain it any way you wish, Kyra said. The man's a monster, and if we didn't need him, I'd be happy to put him down. Anytime you care to try... Sanders' cold voice came from the darkness a moment before he stepped from the shadow of a large pine. They started at Xander's sudden appearance. Gabriel watched his brother and Kyera lock gazes. It didn't take the druid long to look away. Xander laughed. That's what I thought. The way is clear. We can move when you're ready. The four of them ran across the manicured lawn and came to a stop beside the main entrance to the lodge a set of twelve-foot-tall double doors. I'll wait here, Solon said. I'm no warrior and will slow you down. Gabriel, you and your brother have to deal with the demon. Kyera, you must find the key fragments. They could be anywhere, she said. How do I find them? Solon reached into his pocket, pulled out a golden compass and handed it to her. The arrow pointed straight at the mansion, I enchanted the compass for this occasion. It will lead you to the fragments. Kyra nodded. I'm ready. Gabriel drew his sword, which glowed with a pure white light. He looked at his brother, who wore an eager smile, his black blade in hand. Xander's sword drank in the moonlight, giving no reflection. Looking at the blade gave Gabriel a chill. Shall I open the doors? Xander asked. Gabriel was better suited to opening the heavy doors, but if Xander thought he could handle it, he'd let him. Go ahead. Xander stood straight and raised his sword above his head. Gabriel realized what his brother intended, but didn't act quick enough to stop him. 
He winced, expecting to hear the black blade bounce off the heavy doors. Instead, Xander made half a dozen lightning slashes and the door clattered to the ground in pieces. Xander offered a mocking bow. After you. Gabriel stared at the inch-thick oak slabs lying on the ground. Xander's sword cut through them like they were silk. Gabriel stepped over the debris. Kyera followed right behind him, and Xander brought up the rear. They entered an entry room. Halls branched to the left and right. Straight ahead, they found a staircase leading to the second floor. Where are the guards? Xander asked. Gabriel wondered the same thing. They must have heard the racket when the doors fell. Guards should be pouring out of the woodwork. Gabriel shrugged. Beats me. The compass says I have to go this way. Kyera pointed down a hall to the left. Be careful. Gabriel spoke to Kyera's back as she had already turned down the hall. Turning back to his brother, Gabriel asked, What now? Sander ignored him, his brow furrowed in concentration, eyes closed. The men are upstairs along with the demon. I assume Duke Carradine is with them. They're waiting for us, Gabriel said. Xander nodded, a vicious grin twisting his lips. It would be rude to keep them waiting. We should warn Kyera. I'm sure she can take care of herself. We can rescue her after if need be. Gabriel couldn't fault his brother's reasoning. Let's go then. They charged up the steps, taking them two at a time. At the top, Xander turned right, down a door-lined hall. Are you sure this is the way? Xander ignored him, leaving Gabriel no choice but to follow. Xander stopped in front of a door. Through there. Gabriel took a firm grip on his sword and nodded. Xander cut the door off its hinges and kicked it into the room. Ten guards stood in a semicircle in front of Duke Carradine, who waited behind a large desk, serpent staff gripped in his right hand. You two are trespassing, the Duke pointed his staff at them. I insist you leave at once. I wonder if you recognize me. Xander ignored the Duke's order and stepped deeper into the study. My name is Xander Kane. You ordered my family killed for some stone trinket. It's time for you to die. The name doesn't ring a bell. Remove him. One of the guards reached for his sword. Xander's attack came so fast Gabriel barely registered it before the guard was twitching on the floor in two pieces. Who's next? All hell broke loose. The remaining guards drew their weapons and attacked. Gabriel had time enough to see his brother cut down a second man before he had his own hands full with a pair of guards eager to carve him into chunks. Xander cut down another guard. He found no satisfaction in it. None of the guards had the skill to challenge him, and they got in each other's way as much as anything. It was like slaughtering sheep. All of them together weren't worth his time. The devourer was in his glory. Every time its transformed flesh sliced into another guard, a jolt of pleasure surged through Xander as the demon sword consumed the unlucky man's soul. Drop! Xander fell to his stomach an instant before a blast of flames shot through the space he'd vacated. The guard trying to sneak up on him screamed when the fire seared the flesh from his bones. Xander looked up to see the duke pointing the golden staff in his direction, flames dripping from the serpent's mouth. The staff is the demon. No kidding. Sander rolled away from another blast of fire. He sprang to his feet and leapt back to avoid a third blast. How do I get past those flames? Very carefully. Xander cursed all demons and sprang away from another stream of fire. When he landed, he whipped his throwing dagger at the duke, and a howl of pain rewarded him when the blade sank into Duke Carradine's shoulder. Even better... The staff fell to the floor and rolled a few feet away from the now unarmed nobleman. Xander advanced, eager to complete his business with the duke. Two guards remained, but Gabriel had them well in hand. Perhaps he could take his time getting his revenge. The golden serpent coiled and spat fire at him. Reflexes honed by years of fighting for his life saved Xander, who yanked his head clear of the flames an instant before his face would have been burned off. The stink of scorched hair filled his nostrils. Xander rolled away from yet another blast. You didn't tell me it could move. I told you it was a demon. 
So are you, Sander dodged again. It took all his skill to avoid getting burned to a crisp. He couldn't even think of counterattacking. Steps thudded behind him. Xander glanced away from the serpent to see his brother racing forward, glowing sword raised. The demon swung its head toward Gabriel and spat a stream of fire. No! White fire erupted from Gabriel's blade, snuffing out the demon's fire. Without missing a step, Gabriel attacked, slashing at the serpent. The demon's supernatural speed kept it from getting cut in half by a hair's breadth. Xander regained his feet, grinning like a madman. I see you know a trick or two. Gabriel chose not to comment, instead advancing on the golden serpent without a hint of fear. It must be nice to have a sword that absorbed demon magic. Why can't you do that? Even I have limits. The devourer managed to sound defensive. Xander flanked the serpent to his brother's left. No matter which direction it turned, one of them would be free to attack. A golden light surrounded the serpent. Xander flinched, ready to dodge whatever flavor of death the demon loosed at them. Instead of an eldritch blast, the serpent grew, doubling in size and then doubling again and again. Soon its hooded head scraped the ceiling. Undaunted, Gabriel attacked, swinging his glowing sword with enough force to put a gash in the now tree-trunk-sized body. Gabriel's sword bounced off scales thicker than steel plate and twice as tough. The huge head reared back. Xander leapt, hitting Gabriel in the side and pushing him out of the way of yard-long fangs that would have skewered him like the kebabs the vendors sold in the market back home. Are you okay? Xander rolled with Gabriel out of the serpent's reach and clambered to his feet. Gabriel nodded. The bright sword didn't cut it. He sounded dumbfounded. I noticed. I can kill it if you can keep it from incinerating me. Stupid mortals, the serpent hissed. Your pathetic weapons can't harm me. Your plotting only delays your inevitable deaths. I will devour your body and soul, and when my master is free, my kind will dominate your world. After we finish with you, worm, your master is next. Xander raised his sword, ready to continue the battle. The serpent roared and breathed fire. Gabriel stepped in front of Xander, sword raised to snuff out the flames. If you won't burn, I'll crush you to pulp. The serpent lunged, smashing the desk and chair into so much kindling. Gabriel leapt back, not letting the serpent get too close. Xander shot forward to attack. He dodged the serpent's huge fangs, which sank into the floorboards. When it pulled back, the wood smoked as the demon's venom rotted them away. Xander slashed as he leapt past the serpent, the devourer cutting a deep furrow in the serpent's scales. The demon snake hissed in pain, and a surge of power unlike anything he'd ever experienced hit Xander like a bolt of lightning. The giant serpent didn't realize it was supposed to die after one blow, and struck at Xander, fangs leading. He had no time to dodge. Xander raised the devourer in a vain attempt to block the attack. Fang and sword came together, but instead of being sent flying, the serpent only pushed him back a foot. Then Xander stopped and held the giant demon back. Stolen power surged through him, and the serpent's fang cracked along its length. The demon recoiled, hissing in pain and anger. Xander grinned. He never felt so much power. The devourer threw off waves of energy, and Xander felt the demon sword's desire to attack. The serpent coiled in the corner of the room and regarded Xander with a wary hooded glare. Gabriel eased up beside Xander. You okay? Never better. Xander willed the devourer to grow until he held a six-foot-long greatsword. Xander charged, his great speed made blinding by the infusion of demonic energy. He leapt and with a single powerful slash lopped the serpent's head off. Xander screamed as the overflow of energy poured into him. Every muscle clenched until he feared his bones would break. Then it stopped. Xander fell to his knees and gasped. He had no time to recover. The slain serpent burst into flames which soon engulfed half the room. Gabriel knelt beside him. Xander! 
It took a moment for Xander to realize that was his name and his brother was speaking to him. He faced Gabriel, who flinched away. We need to find Kyera and get out. Xander nodded. He had no wish to be burned alive again. You go on. I'll deal with the Duke and catch up. We should stick together. Don't worry about me. Xander got to his feet. I'm sure Kyera needs you more than I do. Go. Gabriel left the burning office, a disappointed frown wrinkling his face. With his brother out of the way, Xander focused on finding Duke Carradine. The Duke's pitiful life force hit not far away. The flames weren't spreading too fast. Good, he could take his time. He honed in on the Duke's life force like a bloodhound on the trail and soon came to a blank wall. There had to be a hidden door. Carradine couldn't walk through walls. Xander pulled up his hood and stepped into the shadow realm. It didn't take long for him to discover the hidden room behind the wall. The Duke trembled and stared at the secret door, no doubt expecting his demon master to come for him. Xander stepped into the secret room, killing the Duke's hope first. Xander smiled when the Duke jumped. The terrified man looked around for an escape, but the room had one door and Xander stood in front of it. You should be dead, Carradine's lips trembled as he spoke. Your demon wasn't up to the task. This is the second time you failed to kill my brother and I. You have my word you won't get a third chance. Your cane son. I knew one of you survived, but I thought the other burned. Xander ripped his mask off, drawing a gasp from the duke. I did burn, but I survived. You won't. Wait, please. Carradine dug through his pockets before pulling an odd-shaped stone cylinder. This is what you want, right? Take it and let me go. You're in a poor position to bargain. Xander snatched the fragment from the duke's trembling hand. Let me have him. No, I have a special fate in mind for him. Can you sear his wounds so he won't bleed to death? The devourer's amusement echoed through Xander's mind. A death worthy of a demon. I will do as you wish. Xander found the catch for the secret door and kicked it open. Flames engulfed the office. Good. We have to get out of here, Duke Garridan said. I intend to. Xander shoved the duke out into the burning room, then lashed out, taking his legs at the knee. As his blade passed through the duke's flesh, black fire flashed, searing the wounds. The duke fell to the floor screaming. Xander gave Carradine's arms similar treatment, taking them at the elbow. Xander stood over the stump of a man writhing on the floor. When you get to hell, tell them I sent you. Xander vanished into the shadows. Gabriel raced down the stairs. Kyera! He left Xander to deal with the Duke alone. He shuddered at the thought of what his brother might do. Leaving that morbid idea alone, he focused on finding the druid. He reached the remains of the door, but Kyera was nowhere to be found. He hesitated. If she'd left the lodge already, he'd be wasting his time looking for her. A woman screamed from his left. That had to be her. He followed the shouts down the hall. Kyera! Fire crackled above him as the second floor burned. He rounded a bend and found the druid kicking at a heavy door. It's time to go. He had to shout to be heard over the roaring fire. There's a key fragment in there, but I can't get the door open. Damn it. Gabriel stepped back, intending to kick the door down. Before he could, the bright sword vibrated against his leg. He frowned and drew his weapon. The sword blazed with white light and Gabriel understood. He touched the tip of the sword to the door and it swung open. Kyera slipped inside to search. The heat grew by the second. If she didn't hurry, Kyera emerged a moment later, a stone fragment in her hand. Let's get out of here. Gabriel took her free hand. Kyera didn't budge. I've only got two pieces. The third's in here somewhere. We can't leave without it. This building will come down around our ears. We can dig the last piece out of the ruins if we must, but if we don't get out of here now, we're dead. Gabriel ran for the door, a reluctant Kyera in tow. 
They raced out into the cool night air. Solon stood a safe distance from the burning lodge. They hurried to join him. Have you seen Xander? Gabriel turned a worried eye back to the blazing building. Solon shook his head. The key fragments. Kyera handed him the two pieces she'd recovered. I couldn't find the final piece. Solon watched the lodge burn. It'll be days before we can dig it out. Perhaps I can speed things up for you. Gabriel turned at the sound of his brother's voice in time to see Xander separate himself from the night. He tossed the final fragment to Solon. I persuaded the Duke to hand it over. Gabriel shivered at the tone of Xander's voice. Where is the Duke? Xander nodded toward the burning building. I thought he'd like to see how hot the burning building got. You left him alive in there? Kyera made no effort to mask the horror in her voice. What sort of monster are you? My mother burned in a building not so different from this. For that crime, I would have killed the Duke a hundred times. Since I can only do it once, this will have to do. Two wrongs don't make a right, Kyera whispered. Perhaps not, Xander said. But in this case, they make justice. Where to now, old man? Solon held up the assembled key. Two pieces connected to make the central portion of the key, and the other two attached at the top to make a handle to turn. North, to the mountains and the demon's fang. Chapter 30 The late afternoon shadows stretched long when Xander reined in his horse outside a small stone temple, not much more than a shrine, really. Behind the temple was a long shed that appeared to serve as a stable. Solon had led the group north from the Duke's burned lodge for the last week, over forest trails, then into the stony hills below the mountains. The door to the temple opened, and a priest so wrinkled the loose folds of skin flapped under his chin when he moved, stepped out to greet them. At the rate their priests were aging, the next one would be a skeleton. Solon dismounted, walked over to the older man, and bowed. Brother Solon, the time has come at last. Yes, with the bright shield's blessing, the order's long vigil will at last come to an end. Xander, Gabriel, and Kyera dismounted. Kyera gathered their reins. I'll tend the horses. She led the beasts toward the shed while Xander, Gabriel, and the priests went inside. The inside of the temple was as pitiful as the outside. There were two small rooms, the smaller of which held a simple wood stove for cooking and heat. The bigger room held a small table, one chair, and a sleeping pallet. It didn't seem like the old man got much company. Curious, Sander pulled his hood up. Like the church back in the city, he saw no shadow doors in the temple. How can I aid you, brother? The shrine keeper asked. We need fresh supplies, and if you can watch over our mounts, we would be grateful. Of course. It is my honor to serve in our Lord's great endeavor. Xander watched the priests with a jaundiced eye. In his experience, men that relied over much on gods tended to not last long in the real world. Xander stepped outside for a breath of cool mountain air before they were packed in like cattle for the night. The sun had slipped behind the mountains, leaving the temple in deep shadows, which suited Xander fine. He liked the dark. You seem ill at ease. Gabriel had followed him out. What's on your mind, little brother? Xander allowed himself a faint smile. He seldom had anyone worry about him. I grow weary of listening to the priest drone on about how great their god is. He couldn't solve their demon problem for them. Instead, they manipulate us into doing it. Nobody manipulated us. We both volunteered, remember? They took you by the nose down a path they call noble, and they tell me they're the only ones that can lead me to the revenge I seek. Xander paced in the dark. They give us both what we want in the form of an enemy they can't defeat themselves. Convenient for them. Do you want to back out? Gabriel asked. No, damn it. I'd like to see a little gratitude. They treat you like the noble hero, but I'm nothing more than a spear to point at their enemies. They don't even trust me out of their sight for five minutes. 
Xander bent down and picked up a stone the size of a robin's egg. That's not true. Gabriel stepped in front of Xander so he had to stop. Solon's a good man who's had to bear a heavy burden. He's eager to put it to rest. I'm sure he appreciates everything you've done. You think so? Xander whipped the stone into the dark and was rewarded with a squeal of pain. Kyera flickered into view. How? Don't try spying on someone who can sense your life force. Go tell those old men if they want to spy on me, they should have the nerve to do it themselves. She drew herself up. No one sent me. I thought someone should keep an eye on you, that's all. I don't need a nanny. Run along so I can talk to my brother in peace. Kyera gathered the scraps of her dignity and retreated into the shrine. When she'd gone, Gabriel said, Was that necessary? Xander ignored the question. No one minds using me when they need someone killed, but a little trust is too much to ask. Given your line of work, is it so strange? I'm judged harshly because I'm an assassin. Fine, I accept that. But how are my clients judged? The truth is they aren't. If they can afford to hire me, then they're too rich or well-connected to worry about the law. Gabriel shook his head. You equate contract killing with justice? Sometimes. Can you stand there and tell me Duke Carradine would face justice anywhere but the end of my sword? Gabriel offered nothing but silence. There's your answer. When people can't get justice, they settle for revenge. That's where I come in. So everyone you killed deserved it? The disbelief was clear in Gabriel's tone. Sanders stepped away from his brother. Someone thought so. If I hadn't killed them, someone else would have. I don't judge my clients or my marks. I just do the job. Gabriel smiled a soft, sad smile. The pity in his gaze set Xander's teeth on edge. You just do your job. You make it sound so matter of fact. But you kill people for a living. Xander threw his hands up. You kill people for king and country. Does that make it okay? I kill when I have to. I prefer to take prisoners and let the law decide. Disgusted at his brother's hypocrisy, Xander shook his head. You prefer the blood be on someone else's hands. You brought them in alive. If some other fellow in a black hood should put a rope around their neck or cut their head off, it's not your fault. At least I take responsibility for what I do. Xander spun on his heel and left Gabriel staring after him in the deepening darkness. After a meager breakfast of bread and oatmeal, Gabriel, Xander, Solon, and Kyera left the shrine, each burdened by a pack loaded with preserved food, water skins, and weapons, lots of weapons in his brother's case. Before they went to sleep, Solon had said it would take a day and a half to reach the demon's prison, so they'd have to plan on spending one night out in the mountains each way. Thank you, brother, for all your help. Solon bowed to the ancient shrine keeper and Gabriel and Kyera followed his example. May the bright shield guide you, brother, the keeper said. Xander stood a little ways apart, tapping his foot. Are we ready? Solon nodded and they started up the mountain along a path carved out Gabriel knew not how long ago. The one bit of luck they had was summer still held the area in a tenacious grip, so they didn't have any snow or ice to deal with. That was a blessing, given how steep and narrow a path they had to take. After plodding along at Solon's pace for a couple hours, Xander said, I'm going to scout ahead. Before anyone could argue, he was gone around a sharp bend and out of sight. Gabriel shook his head at his brother's impetuousness. Who knew what waited for them in these mountains? Good riddance, Kyra said. Gabriel looked back over his shoulder at her. No offense. He smiled. I know my brother can be difficult. How's your shoulder? She rubbed the spot where Xander hit her with the stone. It's sore, but I'll live. He didn't have to do that, you know. I'm just glad he used a rock instead of a dagger. Kyera paled. Do you think he might have? I wouldn't try spying on him again if I were you. I hope he's careful. Solon huffed and puffed, but kept a steady pace. It would be a shame if we had to turn back. We can do the job without him, Kyra said. 
Solon patted her shoulder. If that were true, we would have done so. Don't worry about Xander. Gabriel turned back to focus on an especially narrow section of trail. Of all of us, he's the most capable of dealing with anything he finds. The three of them trudged on into the afternoon before they caught up to Xander. They found him seated on a boulder, basking in the sun like a black cat. He stretched and hopped down off the boulder. We have a problem. What sort of problem? Solon asked. That's an interesting question, and to be honest, I'm not certain myself. About a mile from here, the trail drops into a canyon about 300 yards wide, and twice that long. The walls are near vertical. Some odd-looking creatures have set up a crude camp at the far end of the valley and built a gate across the exit. I have no idea how they survive, as I've only seen snowbirds and a few scrawny goats since we entered the mountains. What do they look like? Gabriel asked. They're ugly. Maybe five feet tall with red skin stretched tight by thick cords of muscle. They all carried weapons of one sort or another and wore only loincloths. Their eyes glow with a dull crimson light. Sounds like something called up from hell, Gabriel said. You're not far wrong. Solon looked up at the darkening sky and tapped his chin. I've read about such creatures. They're called corrupted souls. They were humans who were sacrificed in an unholy ritual that swapped their souls for demonic essence. They usually serve as guards for demon-worshipping cults and are controlled by the warlock that performed the ritual. How do we deal with them? Gabriel asked. They're no stronger than any other demon, Solon said. In fact, their human bodies make them weaker. Perhaps we could sneak around them. Xander shook his head. No way they'll leave that gate unguarded. And besides, those glowing red eyes scream night vision. They'll need to be dealt with, Solon said. I hate to risk a confrontation, but I see no other options. How many are there? A couple dozen at least, Xander said. Long odds, even with our weapons, Gabriel said. I reluctantly agree. Xander said. If they were normal men, I could take them one at a time in the dark. But if they have night vision, it's too risky even for me. We need to deal with the warlock controlling them, Solon frowned. During the creation of a corrupted soul, a portion of the creature's demonic essence is captured in a small artifact. That's what the warlock uses to control them. Even if the warlock is down there, how do you expect to sneak past those things to get to him? Gabriel asked. Sounds like a job for an assassin, Xander said, a sarcastic grin twisting his lips. If we live through this, old man, I'm sending your church a bill. Solon smiled. We're not a rich order, so don't get your expectations too high. The artifact is likely a piece of jewelry. Thank you. That's very helpful. Solon held his hands out to the side. If I could tell you more, I would. Fine. There's a little side path half a mile from the camp. We can rest there until dark. It got dark faster than Xander expected, and after a few hours rest he slipped through the night. He breathed the bitter air and sighed. This was how he liked to work. Just him and a mark. No one to slow him down or get in his way. What do you know about these corrupted souls? Pitiful creatures, so far beneath a demon lord of my stature, I hardly noticed them. You're as much help as the priest. Can you tell me anything useful? They're a little different from a weak demon, adequate to deal with mere humans, but no match for us. Sander smiled in the dark. Very little was a match for them. He approached within a couple hundred yards of the dark camp. The creature's glowing eyes marked them as they patrolled the area. Xander crouched behind a boulder and took out the vial Grandfather had given him so long ago. The bottle was half empty, but he still had plenty for this job. He spread a thin film on the mask's lens and the night lit up. With his night vision working, Xander studied the camp. The corrupted souls wandered the narrow valley. If there was any purpose to the paths, Xander couldn't figure it out. The only ones that did seem to have purpose were a pair standing beside the door to the largest hut. 
That had to be the warlock's place. He pulled up the hood of his cloak and stepped into the shadow realm. Xander drifted closer to the hut, constantly checking the portals as he went. He frowned and circled the hut. No portals existed inside. It's warded by demon magic. Damn it. Xander stepped out of the shadows behind the hut. There were no corrupted souls around. Xander slipped the blade of his sword into the wall of the hut. The devourer sliced the stone like paper. He cut a neat circle, stepped back, and kicked it in. Xander stepped through the hole and dodged right, just managing to avoid a fireball in the face. You dare violate my sanctum, human? The warlock stood in the center of the hut, his body wreathed in flames, his face elongated into an inhuman leer. You're even uglier than your slaves. Xander leapt aside when the warlock hurled another fireball at him. He expected any moment to have a small army of corrupted souls attempting to carve him into dog meat. He needed to close with the warlock fast. The devourer sensed his need and a jolt of power flooded him. Xander lunged forward as the warlock raised a flame-shrouded hand to hurl another fireball. He cut a line across the warlock's chest, but the former human dodged the worst of the blow. The warlock screamed something in a language Xander didn't recognize. He's calling for the guards. Damn it. Xander renewed his attack. The warlock dodged his first slash, but Xander reversed his momentum and thrust through the warlock's chest. A rush of power filled him. He had no time to enjoy it as the two corrupted souls outside the hut stepped inside. The monsters raised axes with blades more suited to giants than stunted demons and charged. How does he control these things? Xander leapt away from an overhead chop that shook the hut when it hit the ground. The two monsters didn't concern him over much. It was the twenty or so outside that did. The ring on his right hand. Xander spun away from a side-to-side -side slash, reversed himself, and bisected one of the guards. That bought him a second to glance down at the warlock's right hand. Three rings sparked on three fingers. He somersaulted under an attack from the second guard. The crunching steps of the approaching corrupted souls caught his attention. He needed to hurry. The remaining guard's axe swept over his head and Xander lashed out, severing the monster's arms at the elbows and sending its weapon flying. He drew back and rammed the devourer through its chest. Xander ripped his sword free and slid over beside the dead warlock. He hacked off the corpse's hand. The first of the corrupted soul's heads appeared in the doorway. Xander pointed the hand and all three rings at it. Stop! The monster didn't even slow. Why didn't it work? The corrupted soul shouldered its way into the room. You have to command it in abyssal, the language of demons. I don't speak abyssal. Xander lunged forward and cut the first monster in half to make a crude barricade. I speak abyssal. The next creature in line yanked at the corpse of its dead brother. How do I get them to stop? A short guttural sound appeared in Xander's mind. The corrupted souls ripped the final chunk of the dead one clear and rushed inside. Xander repeated the sound, and the monster stopped in mid-stride. Xander took a deep breath and sighed. How do I get them to line up outside the hut? A long string of sounds filled his mind. Xander shook his head. You're going to have to walk me through that one a little slower. Just repeat after me. The devourer made each sound and Xander copied it. He must have gotten it right as the monsters stepped back out of the hut. Xander gave them a couple minutes, then went outside. The corrupted souls stood in a neat line in front of the hut. They stood still as statues and stared straight ahead. Is that all of them? Yes. How blindly obedient are these things? They'll do exactly what you say. No questions, no hesitation. Xander shook his head. How could anything that stupid be of any real use? How do I tell them not to move? The devourer provided the proper abyssal translation, and Xander repeated it. The creatures stiffened, awaiting his next order. Too bad for them there wasn't going to be a next order. He took a wide stance behind the first monster and swung. Its head fell to the side and the body crumpled. Xander dodged back, guard raised. 
nothing. The stupid thing stood without flinching. Like a butcher, Xander dispatched the remaining seventeen corrupted souls. Each death gave him a jolt of power, but no satisfaction. Killing these things was no different than cutting out a log blocking the road. The last one crumpled to the ground. A fine meal. Xander spat to one side. The slaughter left a bad taste in his mouth. Let's get the others. You killed them all? The sun had risen twenty minutes ago, and Kyera walked behind Xander, along with Soland and his brother, through the empty camp. Xander sighed, ready for another morality lecture. Good. Xander glanced back, eyebrow raised. Did we finally find something I have your approval to kill? Those creatures were an abomination. They have no place in our world. How much further to Drago's prison? Gabriel changed the subject. Xander assumed to forestall another argument between him and the druid. Solon pointed to a jagged peak that came to an unnatural point. The demon's fang. We'll reach the base and the door to the prison in a couple hours. They trudged through the silent camp. Now that they were so close to the end, Xander wondered what his life would be like, assuming he survived. Revenge had been his driving force for so long. Once he claimed it, he didn't know what would happen to him. They reached the crude gate at the far end of the canyon, and Xander hacked the bar in half, sending it crashing to the ground. Gabriel grabbed the right side and Xander the left, and together they wrenched the gate open. They found a narrow pass with near-vertical walls behind it. This would be a great place for an ambush, Gabriel said. There's nothing alive nearby, Xander stated. There was literally nothing alive nearby. Even the little snowbirds that had followed them off and on for the whole trip were nowhere to be found. Xander drew his sword and led the way through. Behind him, the sound of steel on leather said Gabriel had followed his example. They continued down the narrow pass for over an hour before it widened out into a short landing that led to a deep ravine. A narrow stone bridge was the only way across, and on the other side was a wider landing and a blank stone wall. The little group crossed the bridge and Solon said, We're here. Xander looked at the stone wall, then back the way they'd come. Where? Solon pointed to a tiny shield inscribed in the stone. He removed an amulet from under his robe and touched it to the mark. An eight-foot section of the wall shimmered and vanished. Wow, Gabriel said. How'd you know that was there? After Drago was imprisoned, priests of the Order created that illusion to hide the prison. Unfortunately, the demon's magic was more than adequate to allow them to see past it. The illusion is sufficient to keep ordinary people from stumbling into the prison. I imagine that small army of corrupted souls helped too, Xander said. They are a new addition, perhaps a decade old. Their task was most likely to keep us from reaching Drago. That didn't work out very well, Xander grinned. Let's get on with it. They went through the gap deeper into the mountain. Light that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere illuminated the path. Human hands had smoothed the path and walls. Xander frowned as they continued on. Everything looked altered in some way. Nothing about this place is natural, Kyra said as though reading his mind. Over the years, evil men, demons, and their servants have visited this place seeking Drago's wisdom and power. They have attempted to turn this into a shrine of sorts. What sort of wisdom could you hope to gain from a creature like Drago? Gabriel asked. Dark wisdom, Solon said. The secrets of demons and their kin... More than one warlock was made in this place. Can't be much of a prison if he can accomplish so much, Xander said. It's primarily a prison for his body. His magic is such that he can act in limited ways within a few feet of the door, Solon said. Where is the prison anyway? Gabriel asked. All we've seen so far is stone walls. They rounded a sharp corner and Solon made a grand sweeping gesture. Does that answer your question? Straight ahead of them, the path ended and what could only be called a temple had been carved into the stone wall. Pillars flanked a massive set of double doors wide enough to allow two elephants to pass side by side. 
Surrounding the pillars, all manner of carved demons leered down at the little group. Wow, Xander said. When you build a prison, you go all out. We didn't build this. The doors appeared in front of a cave, sealing Drago inside. Solon waved a hand at the elaborate facade. All of this was added later by his followers as a monument to their devotion. Lunatics, Xander muttered as they approached the doors. They stopped a few feet from the doors and Solon retrieved the key from his satchel. Wait, Gabriel said. What's to keep Drago from walking out when we open the door? Solon patted him on the shoulder. The doors must open all the way for Drago to leave. We're only going to open them enough for the two of you to slip inside. Two of us? Xander's grip tightened on his sword. He smelled a rat. What about you two? This is where we part ways. Kyera and I have no weapons that could harm Drago and would only get in your way. We will remain here and seal the door behind you. If you fail, we will take the key and keep it safe until the one meant to kill Drago appears. You don't think we can do it? Gabriel sounded hurt and bewildered. Xander shook his head at his brother's naivety. Solon laid a reassuring hand on Gabriel's shoulder. I have great faith in the two of you, but I would be remiss in my duties if I made no plans for failure. With humanity's future on the line, I can take no chances. If you lock the door behind us, how the hell do we get out after we kill this guy? Xander asked. When you kill Drago, the doors will vanish and the key will crumble to dust, their purpose fulfilled. Gabriel stepped over beside Kyera. You'll take care of Solon? She nodded. I'll keep us both invisible the whole way back to Lord's Way if I have to. He put his hands on her shoulders. If we don't make it back, it's been an honor to know you. Xander rolled his eyes. You coming or do I have to kill this demon on my own? Gabriel laughed, shrugged out of his pack and drew his sword. He joined Xander and Solon by the door. Are you prepared? Solon asked. I am, Gabriel said. Xander nodded once. So be it. Solon placed the key in the lock and the door swung inward. When they had opened enough, Gabriel and Xander slipped through. Solon touched the doors and spoke a word in an unfamiliar language. The doors swung closed with a rather final-sounding boom. If Drago didn't know we were here, he does now, Xander said. I imagine he's been aware of us for some time. Yeah, killing someone's servants tends to get their attention. They continued deeper into the sorcerer's prison. Unlike the highly worked exterior, the inside was just a crude, rough-hewn tunnel. The only light came from Gabriel's sword, which glowed cool and bright. Xander was tempted to have him dim the light, but figured at this point stealth was a waste of time, and the light was bound to help them more than hurt them. Where is he? Xander asked. I can't tell. Drago's throwing off so much power it feels like he's everywhere. Xander shook his head. That wasn't the sort of encouragement he'd hoped for. The tunnel exited into a huge domed chamber. A gangrenous green light that seemed to come from everywhere at once lit the room. Seated on a stone throne at the far end of the cavern was what appeared to be a man about thirty. He doesn't look much like a demon, Gabriel said. Problem is, demons can look like whatever they want. Let's go kill him. This light is making me nauseous. It's not the light. The demon's presence is making you ill. Xander stalked across the cavern, Gabriel on his left. Ten feet from the throne, he hit an invisible wall. Damn it! He slammed the devourer into it to no effect. I erected the barrier so we might speak. Drago spoke in a rich baritone. Up close, Drago was a small man, thin with a hawkish face, not someone you'd give a second look if you met him on the street. Xander and Gabriel exchanged glances. I don't see that we have anything to discuss, Gabriel said. On the contrary, 
You two are obviously the latest demon slayer sent by the Bright Shield's minions to kill me. All the others have failed, and if you wish to throw your lives away, I'm happy to oblige. But I believe we can come to an arrangement. I don't believe you. Gabriel had a white-knuckled grip on his sword. Solon never mentioned other groups. Drago laughed. Do you imagine he'd tell you you were walking to your death? Look behind the throne and discover the truth. They split up. Xander circled right and Gabriel went left. Neither took his eyes off Drago. The sorcerer wore an amused little smile. Behind the throne, they found a pile of scrap metal. Xander frowned and caught his brother's eye. Together, they moved closer. The pile was made up of bent weapons and mangled armor. Gabriel gasped, and Xander understood why. Here and there were markings sacred to the Bright Shield's church. Two of the swords could have been twins to the one Gabriel carried. Drago had gotten to his feet and looked down at them. That's what remains of the fools that have challenged me over the centuries. The church is kind enough to send fresh entertainment every couple centuries. You may find the swords familiar. No. Gabriel groaned and turned away from the pile. Xander watched Gabriel's reaction, his anger growing by the minute. His determination to kill Drago hadn't diminished, but it seemed the old man had lied to them. If we live through this, I'm going to have a long talk with your pet priest. I can't believe he lied to me. Will you listen to me now? Drago asked. I will. Xander couldn't kill him if he couldn't get close. But if he played along, he might get a chance. We can't make a deal with him. Even if Solon misled us, he's still better than a demon. My brother has a point. If we help, what's to keep you from turning on us? I can't believe you're considering this. Gabriel grabbed Xander's shoulder and spun him away from Drago. He wants to destroy our world. Not destroy, conquer, Drago said. Free me, and I'll make you a prince. You can rule a continent. With that sword, you're more than a match for most demons. Think of it. You'd have the power of life and death over millions. Would your father allow that? The offer was obviously for Xander. He ignored the warning squeeze Gabriel gave his arm. My father is overlord of scores of planets. He hardly cares for minor details as long as his wishes are carried out. He's telling the truth about that, if nothing else. Though if his father only controls scores of planets, he's come down in the universe. When he helped imprison me, he ruled over one hundred. We don't have the key, so I'm not sure how we can help, Xander said. I'm not certain you can help me, but you are different from all the others they have sent against me. You carry a weapon of great demonic power. If you combine your power with mine, we may be able to sunder the door. What kind of weapons did the others have? Like his. Drago made a dismissive gesture toward a silently fuming Gabriel. Weak toys infused with a fraction of the Bright Shield's power. They gain strength by drawing on the life force and willpower of their wielders. Pitiful things compared to that. He pointed at the Devourer. Xander felt the Demon Sword's pleasure at the compliment. I won't be a part of this, Gabriel said. I'll fight you alone if I must. And you'll die alone. Drago showed not the slightest concern with Gabriel's threat. He turned his attention back to Xander. Do we have a deal? Give me a moment to talk to my brother. Drago nodded and Xander dragged Gabriel a short distance away. There's nothing to discuss. I won't make a bargain that will damn the whole world. Doesn't it bother you that we've been used? The old man has done nothing but lie to us. Are you willing to die for him? This isn't about Solon. It's about doing what's right. He sounded so earnest Xander wanted to slap him. The problem is we can't beat him. He's too strong. If we play along, maybe he'll lower his guard so we have a chance. Xander almost laughed at the relieved smile on his brother's face. I can play along for a little while. Gabriel sheathed his sword. 
Now Xander felt relieved. Maybe he could get them out of this alive. They turned back toward Drago. Xander hung back a little, and when Gabriel was a couple steps ahead of him, brought his sword hilt crashing down on his brother's head. Gabriel went down like a felled tree. Xander looked up at Drago. He never would have gone along. But if you give me my brother's life, I will. If he lives, he'll be nothing but trouble. He can live as a prisoner in whatever fortress I rule from. But he will live or no deal. Drago narrowed his eyes and stared at Xander as though peering into his soul. Whatever he found must have convinced him of Xander's determination because he nodded once. So be it. Follow me. The sorcerer stepped down from his throne and walked toward the door. Xander followed a step behind. He hated to imagine what Drago saw in him that convinced the half-demon of his willingness to go along, but he was glad it was there. Do you really plan to free him? No. Xander managed to keep his reply silent. He didn't dare speak out loud. Even mumbling would give him away. You plan some subterfuge. The demon sword seemed eager to hear more, but Xander wasn't certain the devourer could fully shield their mental conversation. Just hold back as much power as you can and still make it look good. You hope to weaken him. Xander remained silent when they reached the door and Draco turned his full attention on him. I must gather power. This wretched prison drains me. Watch and strike when I do. I'll be ready. Chapter 31 Gabriel came to his senses. Everything seemed blurry. He rubbed his eyes, trying to regain focus. Gabriel couldn't believe Xander hit him. Betrayed by his brother, that hurt worse than the headache. He scrambled to his feet. After a couple steps, he found his balance. Good. Gabriel took a couple tentative steps, but his confidence grew fast. A thunderous crash shook the cavern, staggering him. They were trying to break down the barrier. He had to hurry. Gabriel's sword flared to life the moment it cleared his scabbard. It gave him faith to pick up speed and hurry down the tunnel. The farther he went, the worse the shaking grew. At the end of the tunnel, Xander and Drago stood side by side. The sorcerer held his hands against the door. Greenish-black flames streamed from around his fingers, making the stone tremble. Beside him, Xander had the tip of his sword against the door. Pure black flames ran down the blade in waves, pounding the stone. Cracks opened where the flames overlapped. The door wouldn't hold out much longer. Gabriel clenched his teeth and ran at Drago. Maybe he could strike before the sorcerer knew he was there. It wasn't the most honorable decision, but under the circumstances he felt justified. Gabriel raised his sword and the light grew brighter. He swung the holy weapon with all his might at Drago's collarbone. The blow should have nearly bisected him, but instead it bounced off a shimmering energy field. Drago turned to face him. Gods of light, help me. I'm dead. The sorcerer's eyes flashed and a cocoon of sickly green flames surrounded Gabriel. He screamed when the flames seared his arms. The cocoon shrank. He screamed again as the flames drew ever closer, roasting his whole body. We had a deal. At the sound of his brother's screams, Sander stepped away from the door and between Drago and Gabriel. You agreed not to harm him. Your brother struck me. I can't allow that to pass. No harm was done. Leave him trapped. Gabriel's obviously no threat to you. No one may attack me and live. Drago turned his attention to Gabriel. Xander clenched his teeth. So much for the plan. He lunged, driving the tip of the devourer into Drago's chest, all his hate and rage behind it. The blade met resistance when he hit Drago's shield. Then dark fire blazed and they blasted through. Xander smiled at the look of surprise on Drago's face when the devourer burst through his chest. You dare attack me? Drago spoke as though three feet of steel through his chest were a minor inconvenience. The devourer came to life. 
Black fire blazed and Drago howled in real pain as his essence flowed into the sword. What's the matter? Not so all-powerful now, are you? Drago wrapped his hands around the devourer's blade. The half-demon's blood flowed, but so did green flames. They rushed forth to battle the devourer's black fire. The flames surged back and forth as the demons fought for dominance. Xander grimaced as his hand smoldered on the demon sword's hilt. He snarled and leaned in, driving Drago up against the enchanted door, the devourer's tip dug into the stone. Green fire flared stronger, but Xander ignored the pain. He'd burned once. A few more scars wouldn't matter. Slowly, inexorably, like the tide going out, the devourer's black flames pushed back Drago's green. Every moment the sword remained buried in Draco's chest, it drained his essence, weakening the sorcerer and strengthening the devourer. Draco's fire flickered and faded. Behind him, Gabriel grunted when he fell to the floor. Spare me, Draco said. I'll give you anything. All I wanted was my brother's life, and you refused to give it. Now you die. We may have no choice but to spare him. His life force is too great even for me to consume all in one shot. No, he dies now. I want him obliterated so that nothing remains. The overflow of power must go somewhere. Pour it into me if you must. Just don't stop until Drago is gone. It will hurt a lot. You may not survive, and if you do, I don't know what that much power will do to you. Pain and I are old lovers. The rest I'll deal with as I must. Now do it! The first wave of pain struck with shocking intensity. Xander hadn't imagined anything hurting as bad as when his face burned, but that was a slap in the face compared with this. Xander moaned and grit his teeth. He took comfort that Drago's screams now held a note of real fear. The half-demon was dying, and he knew it. Through the haze of pain, Xander thought that at least he wouldn't die alone. Gabriel watched through a green haze as Xander ran the sorcerer through. His hands hurt and had blistered where the flames had seared them. But with Drago distracted, the cocoon stopped shrinking and the heat diminished. After a few moments, Drago's muffled screams reached him. It sounded like Xander was winning. The cocoon vanished. Gabriel grunted when he hit the cave floor. He recovered his sword. He had to help his brother if possible. Gabriel took two steps, then stopped. The power was too intense. The bright sword couldn't protect him from magic that strong. He sighed and moved back to a safe distance. It seemed his destiny was to be his brother's witness. He hoped he wasn't witnessing Xander's end. The battle raged while Gabriel looked on. Xander leaned into Drago, keeping him pinned to the door. For his part, the half-demon seemed to shrink into himself, withering like a drying plum. Gabriel's eyes widened in horror when, for no reason he could determine, black fire engulfed his brother. It burst from his eyes and ears. Xander's back arched and he opened his mouth to scream, but only black flames came out. In an instant, flames engulfed both figures. Almost as soon as it appeared, the black fire vanished. Xander fell to his knees, then forward on his face. His clothes burned to tatters and his mask consumed, so nothing remained. Where Drago stood, a scattering of ash swirled in the air. Xander's black sword lay on the cavern floor a few feet away. Gabriel knelt beside his brother and put his head on Xander's chest. He let out a breath. His heart still beat, slow and steady. Xander had survived, thank the gods. A bright light almost blinded him. Gabriel raised his sword, ready to protect his brother or die trying. He lowered his weapon when he saw Solon and Kyera racing through the now empty doorway and into the cave. You couldn't call it a prison anymore since it had no inmate. You did it, Gabriel. The bright shield be praised. I did nothing. He sheathed his sword and scooped up his brother's limp body. He did. Xander saved my life. All our lives. 
is he? Solon asked. He's alive, though how he survived I have no idea. Gabriel looked over at Xander's sword and wondered if it wouldn't be better to leave it where it lay. He doubted Xander would thank him for leaving it behind, yet he thought his brother might be better off without it. The choice was taken out of his hands when the sword floated up on its own and slid into the mostly intact sheath at Xander's waist. Gabriel shared a look with Solon and Kyera. Kyera said, That sword and your brother give me chills. Try to balance that with the fact that he saved the world. Let us leave this evil place before someone comes to investigate their master's death. Solon led the way down the path. What happened? Xander opened his eyes. He was on the floor of the little temple. His whole body felt odd. Tingly was the only word that described it. Gabriel? I'm here, brother. How are you? Xander thought for a moment. Considering he expected to be dead, he felt pretty good. He ached and tingled everywhere, but nothing hurt. I'm all right. He turned toward Gabriel. His brother flinched away when he looked at him. What, more scars? It's your eyes. Gabriel handed him a polished plate. The light was dim, but sufficient. Xander gasped. Black flames swirled in the pits of his eyes. What happened? You killed Drago, but something changed you. You've been unconscious for three days. I carried you out of the mountains, and we decided to rest a while at the temple. Got anything to eat? Xander wasn't hungry, but he wanted to talk to the devourer alone. I'll get you something. Gabriel left him to go to the kitchen. What happened to me? You absorbed some of Drago's demonic essence. It changed you and no doubt gave you some of his powers. What's the catch? Time will tell. At the least, did you not notice how your brother reacted to the sight of you? Imagine how strangers will react. I didn't blend in before. That isn't my style. All I could find was soup. Gabriel brought a steaming bowl and handed it to him. Xander took a sip to be polite. Not bad. What happens now? Gabriel asked. Xander cocked his head. What do you mean? We've both got lives to return to. You haven't forgotten that cute blonde. I'm sure she's eager to see you. Of course I haven't forgotten Amanda. But what will happen with us? We just found each other. Are we going to part ways already? Xander smiled. Would you like to come south and join the guild? That's not what I had in mind. Gabriel sat in a hard chair beside Xander. I thought you might stay here. Make an honest life for yourself. Xander laughed. It sounded harsh and bitter even in his own ears. Look at me. What kind of life can I make? The only things I'm good at are killing and stealing. Xander, my place is with the guild. The sooner I get back, the more comfortable I'll be. If you like, I will come visit more often. Gabriel smiled. As long as it's not on business. They laughed together. For that moment, they were just brothers. Family reunited in body and spirit. Epilogue Gabriel and Amanda stood arm in arm before the altar in the Church of the Bright Shield. Family and friends filled the little church to the brim. Solon stood before them, arms raised. Gabriel had made his peace with Solon not long after they got back to Lord's Way. The priest claimed he knew nothing about any other attempts to slay Drago, and Gabriel chose to believe him. When he'd checked in with Griff, he learned Commander Erickson had collapsed in a seizure about the same time Xander had killed the demon serpent at the Duke's Lodge. No great loss. In the bright shield's name, Solon said, and before all these good people, I pronounce you husband and wife. They embraced, and Gabriel felt a warmth he hadn't experienced in a long time. The only thing missing was Xander, his brother had gone south almost the moment they returned to the city. That was six months ago. He hoped Xander was well and safe. He deserved that, at least. He had saved the world, after all. Uncle Duncan stood up. 
Everyone is invited to my estate for the greatest party the city has seen in a decade. The assembly roared its approval and everyone filed out of the church. Gabriel and Amanda followed behind, hand in hand, at a more sedate pace. You're thinking about him, aren't you? Amanda stopped just inside the doors of the church. Gabriel nodded. As much as I wish he was here, what I really hope is that he's okay. I'm sure he is. If I know one thing about your brother, it's that he knows how to take care of himself. Xander levitated a foot off the floor of his new meditation chamber. He sat in the lotus position and greenish-black flames flickered around his body. He'd reached the mountain four months ago and had been delighted to find Grandfather alive and well after the infusion of energy he'd gotten. He'd received a warm welcome and after a day of rest had been trying to figure out how to use the powers he'd stolen from Drago. With the Devourer's help, he'd learned a great deal. He'd also learned food would no longer sustain him. He needed pure human life energy to survive. He didn't need a lot. One life a month seemed to be plenty. Lucky for him, the guild always had someone that needed killing. He took jobs that the junior members usually handled. The meditation chamber door creaked. He opened one eye. Kaylin stood in the doorway, one hand on her hip. He smiled. When he'd stopped to collect her on his way home, she'd been surprised at his appearance, but not overly put off. When they'd arrived at the mountain, a couple other members had complained about her. One glare from his now-burning eyes ended the complaints in a hurry. He hadn't assigned her to spying in the city yet. He found having her nearby too pleasant. Yes? You're late for Gabriel's wedding. That's tomorrow, Xander said. This is tomorrow. You've been in here for 27 hours. He frowned. It wasn't like him to lose track of time so badly. Xander levitated higher and unfolded his legs. They ached, so she must be right about how long he'd been there. Did I get them something? Of course. She took a rosewood coffer out from behind her back. He grinned. She was very good. Xander held out a hand and the devourer leapt into his grasp from the far side of the room. He sheathed the sword, took the coffer, and bent down to kiss Kaelin. I'd better get going. See you later. Xander stepped into a shadow door and called on his new powers to transport him at the speed of thought to Duncan's mansion. He stepped out of the shadows at the corner of the building and turned invisible. Xander made his way through the house to the great hall. The wedding party was going full swing. He scanned the room and spotted Gabriel standing alone, looking glum. Depressed on his wedding day, Xander shook his head. His brother was hopeless. Xander weaved his way through the crowd and appeared by Gabriel's side. Why are you moping? Gabriel jumped, then brightened. Xander, what are you doing here? I could hardly miss your wedding day now, could I? What kind of brother do you take me for? Xander handed him the coffer. Congratulations. Gabriel opened the coffer, and Xander saw his gifts for the first time. A black pearl necklace for Amanda, and a gold ring with the bright shield's emblem for Gabriel. Perfect. He didn't know how Kaelin did it. They're wonderful, Xander. Thank you. Amanda's going to love the necklace. Speaking of my new sister, where is she? I figured you two would be inseparable today. She's mingling. I needed a few minutes alone. Xander rolled his eyes. What's the problem? Everything's great. No one has even tried to kill us this month yet. I guess I'm missing mother and father more than usual today. I miss them too. Xander surprised himself by admitting it out loud. At least we have each other now. Gabriel nodded. How did you find out about my wedding? I didn't know where to send your invitation. I have many sources in Lord's Way, one of whom is assigned to keep watch on you. That reminds me, do you know a tavern called the Blind Pirate? Sure, we roused that dump once a week. Why? On the sign out front is a parrot. Its head pops off and inside is a hollow chamber. If you need to get a hold of me, you can leave a message there. My man will find it. I'll remember, Gabriel smiled. 
Did you want to talk to Amanda? I can find her. Sander shook his head. No, I think I make her nervous. I expect you have that effect on a lot of people. Yeah, the fire in Xander's eyes flared. I'd best be on my way. No doubt your guests would be horrified to find me here. No doubt. Their gazes met, and they laughed. The two brothers shared a fierce embrace. Don't be a stranger. Remember the drop. If you need me, I'll be there. Xander vanished. Gabriel went to find his wife, happier than he'd been in years. I hope you enjoyed part two of Death and Honor. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any uploads. And thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.